Okay, so thank you very much for joining us. My name is John Fillimore. I'm the Executive Director of the John Curtin Institute of Public Policy at Curtin University. And on behalf of the JCIPP, which is our acronym, and Curtin University, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this very special event at this very special venue. Um, so please turn off your mobile phones or turn them to silent. That's my first instruction, because uh, you don't want to be the one who's you know, just asking a really good question when the phone goes off. So just turn your phones to silent or turn them off. Of course, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and on behalf of everyone here, pay our respects to traditional owners and the elders past and present. As many of you know, uh, JCIPP runs a Curtain Corner webinar series on Friday evenings. I know many of you are regular viewers of those presentations, and if you're not already, you'll be on our mailing list, so you will be in the future. Uh, we moved online when COVID hit, and we stayed there, uh, but I suspect several of you missed the chance to meet in person, and so it is really great that we can do so today. Um, I did mention this great venue. I'll just tell you a little bit about it, the building where we're meeting. It's not quite 300 years old, but it does ba date back to 1909 when it was built to house the old Perth Technical College. Um, and Perth Technical College first opened actually next door in 1900 in 139 St George's Terrace, which is also now a Curtin building, uh, where the Perth Boys School was located. And eventually the Perth Tech College morphed into the WA Institute of Technology, and that eventually morphed into Curtin University of Technology and now Curtin University. So uh, it's great that Curtin's been able to come back full circle to its roots by taking over the building here. And I've already spoken to some people who are attending today who said they used to teach in this building. Um, so, and also study in this building. So it's great to have you back on familiar turf. Um, you'll find the toilets out in the corridor here. Um, there's a little, you'll see them just next to the kitchen um, on the, uh, as, as you head towards the exit on the other side of the corridor there. Uh, morning tea, lunch and afternoon tea, as you know, is in the salon room where you, most of you have already been next door near the back of the room. And uh, if there is a fire alarm, I'm pretty sure we go down the stairs and congregate in Brookfield Place out there. So before I introduce our facilitator and MC today, I would like to thank um, the Mancal Economic Education Foundation for their generous support of today's event. And I was going to personally thank Ron Manners AO, but I don't know if he's here. Oh, he is here. Hi, Ron. <laughs> Snuck in at the back. So I um, so would like to thank Ron Manners AO and his, for his generous support of today's event. Uh, Ron had the initial idea, and it's wonderful to see it come to fruition this morning. Uh, please note we are filming and recording the event uh, and we should upload proceedings to our website in a week or so and I think we'll also send a, a link to the Mancal website and they'll also be able to upload it there too. Um, so please, when we do have Q&A, questions and answers, uh, please use the microphone if you ask a question of our speakers. It's not one of these things, oh, I don't need the microphone, I'll get a big voice. You do need to use the microphone, partly for the people here, but also partly for when we do the, um, do the recording. I'm going to now introduce my, uh, our, your facilitator for the day's event and the MC, my colleague, Professor Alan Fenner, who just seems to have done a runner for a second. I have no idea why. I cannot believe it's stage fright because Alan never gets stage fright. He usually likes to hog the stage. So, uh, but I can say that because he's not actually in the room, but he'll be, I think, coming back in in a second. Um, must be something going on out there. Alan, there he is. I just said you, I thought, said you'd, you'd, you'd nicked off. What's going on? Yeah, you know, Alan is Professor of Politics at the JCIPP. Uh, he's worked there for the past, I think, 18 years, I calculated last night. Uh, he specialises in Australian and comparative federalism and public policy. He's also written on the Australian welfare state and economic policy and he's got several books to his credit and his most recent co-author was Professor Sarah Murray from UWA is The Constitution of Western Australia and Exploration, published by Springer. And this is the first book length examination of the WA Constitution and we'll be holding an event to celebrate its release in the coming months. So please keep a look out for that. He also co-edited a book this year on climate governance and federalism, published by Cambridge University Press and other books of note, uh, Interrogating Public Policy Theory, um, co-authored with Linda Bottrell and Comparative Federalism, a systematic inquiry, uh, co-authored with Thomas Huglin, and also the leading politics textbook in Australia called Australian Government and Politics. So Alan's going to make a few introductory comments before introducing our speakers, and then we'll really get stuck into the event. So once again, thank you. It's fantastic to have you all here, and I'll introduce you now to Alan. Over to you. Thanks, John. Well, welcome, everyone. Fa fabulous to see the crowd here. Uh, we're all here to celebrate the 300th birthday of the, of the boy from Kirk Cowdy in the Kingdom of Fife in Scotland. 
And it struck me that surely he must be, it, certainly Cowdy's most famous son, but um, perhaps Fife's most famous export. But then I realised that um, just up the road is the legendary St Andrews Golf Course, where they'd been playing golf for 200 years by the time Adam Smith was born. So uh, it's a good part of the world, obviously. Um, those of you who know a little bit about golf will know that that's a Lynx course. I won't try and draw too many links between golf and Adam Smith. Suffice it to say, I think we could regard the wealth of nations as genuinely a hole in one. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I just thought we had to have a lighter start for the day. Um, though my friend Donald Trump tells me that holes in one are actually fairly easy to come by. Now, I, um, I'll just say a few general sort of introductory things apropos of Adam Smith before the real experts step in and step up. Uh, and, uh, by, and by the end of the day, we will be thoroughly well informed on the question. And I really just wanted to say two things about, about Adam Smith to help set the scene a little bit. And one is, I've never written a book on Adam Smith, uh, but Adam Smith frequently appears in my writing, not on federalism, but on anything, any time I write on public policy, Adam Smith is always there. And I think that is testimony to the significance broadly, not just to economics, but much more broadly to questions of public policy and so on, of the fundamental ideas that can be traced back to Adam Smith. And there's two ways in which it's interesting, I, when I reflect on it, he appears in anything I write or teach in public policy. So he always appears twice. One is, first of all, the mo perhaps most obviously, is any discussion of how we rationalise and understand the role of government in society. And there's got to be a sort of a, a beginning point for that discussion. And for me, it always works best that it's Adam Smith. And it's Adam Smith because you begin with, with the, the fundamental proposition um, of the invisible hand, which leads to the default position of what, to use a term that Adam Smith never used, uh, uh, is often referred to as laissez-faire or leaving the market to do its thing. Uh, but then, secondly, it, that leads inexorably to Adam Smith's discussion of the duties of the sovereign, that there is an important role for government in any market. The market cannot manage without the government, in it, and he identifies three duties of the sovereign. And the third of those is the one of particular relevance to any contemporary teaching about public policy, which is the provision of public goods of one form or another, fairly limited range in Adam Smith's time, though he was a big and controversial champion of uh, public, general public education, which was a rather radical idea in its time. And that, of course, then leads step by step to modern theories of market failure and, and a more expansive understanding of the rationale for the role of government in society. So that's one way in which Adam Smith always appears in anything I write or teach about public policy. And then the second is in in a completely different chapter in any book I write on this subject, which is ideologies. And Adam Smith then pops up as being an anchor point for liberalism. Uh, and an anchor point for liberalism in a way that other ideologies, competing ideologies, don't really have, particularly because given that ideology is primarily and very much driven by normative propositions, i.e. propositions that cannot be proven wrong or right, the relevance of Adam Smith becomes immediately evident because there you have in liberalism a proposition that is non-normative. It's a factual proposition that if you want to generate wealth, this is the optimal way to achieve it. And so the centrality of, of Adam Smith's ideas to liberal ideology uh, is, is also something that, that can't be avoided. So I just mentioned those two things just to highlight the the ongoing relevance of somebody who is now 300 years old to any teaching of these big, broad questions about politics and government and society and economy. Now, a second point rises from the observation that re this is, and I'll reiterate, the 300th birthday. In other words, he's old. He's older than you and me, even. And a lot's changed in that time. In, <clears throat> now, great thinkers generate ideas that transcend time and place.
But at the same time, we always have to acknowledge that they speak from and to a specific time and place. And that applies to Adam Smith as much as to anyone else. And, I, and this has to be kept in mind. Adam Smith wouldn't have written a book remotely resembling The Wealth of Nations in 1876 that he wrote in 1776. Changes had been so extensive. Adam Smith wrote, published The Wealth of Nations not 300 years ago, but in 1776, just on the cusp of Britain's Industrial Revolution that completely transformed the world, the single biggest event in human history. And so conditions, circumstances, questions, challenges, problems were all very different from that period prior to the Industrial Revolution to everything that follows from the Industrial Revolution. As I said, it is almost impossible to conceive of the same book being written a century later. It is a book of its time and place. It doesn't mean it doesn't have ideas of ongoing relevance and importance, but it is still a book of its time and place. Interestingly enough, if we jump forward another century to 1976, its relevance becomes renewed, I'd say, but renewed in particular in the context of ideological conflicts and competition, where Adam Smith is recruited for an ideological agenda that relates to political changes that have in turn been generated by the economic changes of the Industrial Revolution. So he is very much like thinkers typically recruited for an ideological cause in that in that, uh, in the politics of policy making sent from the 1970s onwards. So the final question there really is, and I'm hoping we have a definitive answer to this by the end after our experts have spoken, what specifically is the relevance of a long dead white male who helped found economics born 300 years ago? So I will, I will leave my, our experts with that question. Now, just two other things before I do hand it, hand it over to them. First thing I'd say is that I, 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 I'm pleased to say that, um, that Ron Manners has, has insisted that to keep this as authentic as possible, the menu for today's conference will be built around the traditional food served in the Adam Smith household. So morning tea is going to be uh, an oatmeal porridge. Um, <laughs> It won't, be, um, it won't be sweetened because mercantilist policies in the day made it very difficult to import sugar. So it will just be plain oatmeal porridge for morning tea. But you will be pleased to know lunch will be haggis. So uh, we've found an excellent supplier in Perth, so there'll be a big haggis lunch. And then afternoon tea will be some lovely, some lovely salted herring. So, so we'll all look forward to that. But before we can get there, let me just finally get off the podium and hand you over to our legitimate experts, our lineup of distinguished speakers, uh, of whom we have four main speakers plus an extra. So uh, we'll begin with Tony Aspro Morgus. Tony, are you somewhere in the room? Can you make yourself known to the crowd at large? Maybe you could stand up, Tony. I know, but they, <laughs> we want to know that you're the same person who appears on the stage. From the University of Sydney, thanks very much, Tony. And then secondly, William Coleman, uh, retired from the Australian National University. Thank you very much, William. And then we have Lisa Hill. Lisa, could you please stand up? Lisa, where are you? Lisa, she's not here. She'll be appearing by video. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll have that before, those three speakers before lunch. Then after lunch, Michael McClure. And Michael is here, excellent, great, thanks, Michael. And then at the end, our panel will be run, so Michael, sorry, from the uh, University of Western Australia. Uh, and, and then finally, our panel will be run by Dr. Rico Stevens from the University of Notre Dame, Australia in Fremantle. Please show yourself, Rico. Great, excellent. So on that, no more silly jokes, and I will hand you over to Tony. Thanks, Alan. And uh, yeah, and thanks for the extra time. Mm -hmm. 
I was going to start by saying it's a pleasure to be here, but uh, I have to qualify that now that I've heard the menu for the day. <laughs> just, a, just slightly qualify it. Well, <clears throat> to begin at the beginning, we don't actually know Adam Smith's birth date, only his baptism date, which is recorded as the 5th of June, 1723. Translated from the old-style Julian calendar of that time in Britain into our calendar is the 16th of June, 1723. And in fact, the Sydney presentation of uh, this talk I'm giving now was given on that date uh, about uh, 10 days ago. The presumption is that his birth date is close to this, possibly very close, because baptism expeditiously followed birth in those times due to high infant mortality combined with belief in hell. Let me now turn to more substantive matters. The birth that really matters here for us today, and one of the two principal reasons for marking this tercentenary, is the birth of economic science itself in the course of the 17th and 18th centuries. Smith is often characterised as the founder of economics, or political economy as it was then called, which is certainly an overstatement. But just as certainly, he was a pivotal figure in the formation of the discipline and in bringing it to a certain level of maturity. The second principal reason for marking this tercentenary, which Alan also commented on, is that Smith is also a key figure in the intellectual history of liberalism. The intertwining of these two distinct dimensions of the retrospective image of Smith is itself symptomatic of the proneness of social science in general to ideological influence. As a consequence, some of the retrospective perceptions of Smith are mere distortions and parodies created in the service of latter-day ideological purposes and conflicts. And against this, uh, I hope to recover, at least in some degree, the genuine thought and voice of the historical Adam Smith. Well, first, uh, a few uh, uh, biographical facts just to sketch out the life. As uh, Alan also mentioned, Smith was born in Kirkcaldy, Scotland, to a moderately well-off family, although his father died uh, five months before he was born. At the age of 14, he attended the University of Glasgow, and then from 1740, by way of scholarship, Balliol College, Oxford, for six years. Smith studied philosophy and European literature. Following then some years freelance lecturing in Edinburgh, primarily on rhetoric and belles lettres. Belles lettres is a, a university discipline which has disappeared. It was essentially uh, literary, the study of literary aesthetics. Also uh, lectured on the history of philosophy and jurisprudence, then in 1751, he was appointed Professor of Logic at Glasgow. The following year, he shifted to the Chair of Moral Philosophy. And then in 1764, aged merely 40, he resigned his professorship to take up the position of travelling tutor to a young Scottish aristocrat, the Duke of Beclerc. That was the end of his uh, university career. As a consequence as well, of, from uh, this uh, job of uh, tutoring the young Scottish aristocrat, he acquired a life pension from the family of 300 pounds per annum. In that tutoring role, Smith then spent nearly three years in France. There, partly via the assistance of his friend David Hume, he met a wide range of intellectuals, including Voltaire in Geneva, and importantly for Smith's economic thought, Francois Canet, the leading figure of the French physiocratic school, as well as Anne Robert Jacques Turgot. After returning from France in late 1766, Smith exploited the financial independence provided by his pension to spend six years in Kirkcaldy drafting and redrafting the Wealth of Nations, hereafter WN. The last three years prior to its publication, was spent in London partly to facilitate completion of empirical aspects of the book. 
During this period, he was also made a fellow of the Royal Society. The Wealth of Nations was published on 9th of March, 1776, the same year as the death of his closest intellectual friend, Hume, and of course, the year of the American Declaration of Independence. The latter political conflict figures a little in the book. In 1778, Smith also wrote a memorandum on the Anglo-American conflict for uh, Alexander Wedderburn, who was the uh, British Prime Minister Lord North's uh, Solicitor General. In February 1778, Smith was appointed a Commissioner of Customs in Edinburgh, a post he held until 1790, which is the year he died, adding a salary of 600 pounds to his private per annum, to his private pension of 300 pounds per annum. The apparent irony of the political economist who so vigorously and systematically railed against European policies of trade restriction in the wealth of nations, entering into the governance of part of that system has been a source of amusement or bemusement, although I think a clearer understanding of Smith's policy views much diminishes the paradox. And I'm going to come back to this issue a bit later. He also, in these latter years, provided advice to the British policymakers on removal of restrictions on Anglo-Irish trade and the consequences of the loss of the North American colonies. In the last dec decade of his life, he undertook as well significant revisions of WN and even more so of his first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Smith died from a chronic bowel obstruction in Edinburgh on 17 July 1790. According to one account, his last words to his friends were, I believe we must adjourn this meeting to a, some other place. <laughs> it is the case that the character and personality of the man remains rather opaque to us. In his Oxford Dictionary of National Biography entry on Smith, Donald Winch, in seeking to sum him up, notes the elusiveness, even reclusiveness, of his character, partly due to the slight extant correspondence and an absence of autobiographical reflections. One can say that the most interesting things that happened to and with Smith happened between his ears. But he was not an unsociable man. While it is the case that we have limited access to the interior of the man, there are surviving anecdotes which suggest a by no means colourless character. On one occasion, when Samuel Johnson, the founder of the Oxford English Dictionary, apparently made a disparaging comment about Smith's friend, the somewhat notorious David Hume, Smith is said to have turned on Johnson and called him a son of a bitch. According to a further anecdote, on another occasion, over supper with a small group in 1789, Smith was moved to loudly defend one of his intellectual heroes, Voltaire. The talk then turned to French writers, in particular Voltaire and Turgot. It was on this occasion that Smith would not hear of some clever but superficial author being called by Samuel Rogers a Voltaire. Smith banged the table and declared energetically, sir, there is only one Voltaire. Regarding Turgot, he was described to Rogers by Smith as an excellent, absolutely honest and well-intended person who was not well-versed in human nature with all its selfishness, stupidity and prejudice. Turgot had been for a short time a finance minister of France and had the temerity to try to implement some reforms of the French economy and, of course, as a result, lost his job. And I think these uh, comments on Turgot are probably an allusion uh, to, to those events. Let me now turn uh, to Smith's writings and just sketch uh, the broad character of the body of work that he left behind. 
because it's far larger and far more expansive than the, just the wealth of nations. The corpus of extant Smith writings is actually quite modest, partly explained by his making a considered decision to have most of his unpublished manuscripts destroyed upon his death. 16 volumes of manuscripts being consigned to the flames during his last days. A sin against intellectual history, destroying one's archive like that. For scholars like me, I mean, not for Adam Smith. He made the right decision. The first of his two books, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, was published in 1759 with five further revised editions during Smith's lifetime. The 1796th edition in particular involving substantial editions. It was also translated into French and German quite quickly. Hence, when The Wealth of Nations appeared in 1776, it was the work of a person with already a high intellectual reputation in Europe. There were also four further revised editions during Smith's lifetime of the, wealth, of the Wealth of Nations, with the 1784 third edition, in particular, involving significant changes. And it also went uh, into German and French quite quickly. Smith had most of his manuscript writings destroyed at the time of his death, but not all of them. The exceptions consist of six essays which were subsequently published together in 1795 under the title Essays on Philosophical Subjects. The first three of these essays <coughs> concern the history of science, with the first of these concerning the history of astronomy, much the largest. It has figured prominently in interpretations of Smith's thought as a whole, his conception of the character and progress of astronomy being understood as implying his view of the nature of science in general. The remaining three essays primarily concern aesthetics. After Smith's death, we have the discovery of a, a series of documents which greatly enhance our understanding of his thinking. From the end of the 19th century, the corpus of extant Smith texts was importantly augmented by the discovery of three sets of student lecture notes, all large documents. In 1958, a set of student notes from Smith's 1762-63 lectures on rhetoric and belles lettres were discovered. This is a highly detailed transcription of 30 lectures, averaging almost seven pages in modern print per lecture. I should say at this point, the only way of understanding these documents is that they must have been taken down in, in shorthand. They are immaculate. They are written in almost entirely in perfect English and then trans, uh, translated into English uh, subsequently. The character and significance of language is a central motif of these lectures, as it is, of course, of the latter essays on aesthetics. I should say that the, the, uh, the, the nature and significance of language is, a, is an ongoing, continuous motif in the Smith's thinking and, and writing throughout his, his life. In relation to Smith's economics, it is the further two sets of subsequently discovered lecture notes which are of particular interest. They are fairly parallel texts on jurisprudence that's the title, together amounting to over 550 pages in modern print, resulting from two equivalent courses of lectures given in 1762-63 and 1763-64. The latter set of notes happening to coincide with Smith's last uh, teaching session at Glasgow before he retired from academic life at the age of 40. These documents contain quite a substantial quantity of economic analysis, enabling some comparison between the state of Smith's economic thinking at that time, in the early 1760s, and in 1776, with his years in France notably intervening between these dates. More on this later as well. 
Strictly speaking, of course, all three sets of lecture notes are not Smith writings, but there are considerable grounds for supposing their veracity. I want to add one final reflection on the scale uh, before I turn to the economics. I want to add one final reflection on the scale of Smith's intellectual ambition. In a prefatory note to the sixth edition of the Theory of Moral Sentiments, which appeared shortly before his death in 1790, Smith draws attention to a promise he had made in the last paragraph of the book, in all five previous editions, to publish, quote, an account of the general principles of law and government and of the different revolutions which they had undergone in the different on earth is that Okay, this is where I should be. Smith draws attention to a promise he had made in the last paragraph of the book in all five previous editions to publish an account of the general principles of law and government and of the different revolutions which they had undergone in the different ages and periods of society covering both justice, or jurisprudence, and political economy. The wealth of nations had fulfilled the latter part of that promise, but Smith admits to little hope now of completing the former. The lecture notes on jurisprudence give us some idea of what such a work might have looked like. Smith also uh, writes in a letter of 1785 I have two other great works upon the anvil. The one is a sort of philosophical history of all the different branches of literature, of philosophy, poetry, and eloquence. The other is a sort of theory and history of law and government. Elements of all this are preserved in essays on philosophical subjects and in the lecture notes on rhetoric and belles lettres and on jurisprudence. In the same letter, Smith admits the unlikelihood of these plans being brought to completion. Here is the point I want to make. In this wide-ranging, even comprehensive ambition, one sees Smith's vision for achieving that unified social science to which the 18th century aspired. Indeed, a good part of the fascination in recent decades with the whole corpus of Smith's writings and their interrelations is perhaps due to our seeing in the comprehensiveness of Smith's treatment of the human condition, something latter-day social science has lost as a result of disciplinary and subdisciplinary disciplinary specialisation. There is an irony here, since Smith is famous for his division of labour doctrine, and himself explicitly applies this principle, facilitating labour productivity growth also to science, not just to production in the ordinary sense. The irony is compounded by the fact that his own intellectual labours did not prove productive enough to succeed in achieving a projected outcome, the pursuit of which amounted to a refusal himself to acquiesce in intellectual specialisation. Let me turn now to the political economy. Um, as you will have seen from the program, I have been given <laughs> two slots today. The, the, two, the two papers were not designed initially for one audience, and so there is a little bit of intersection. So on, on the invisible hand, of course, which is what the theme, uh, the more focused theme of that second presentation this afternoon is. So I'm gonna jump a little bit in this political economy, so it'll be a bit shorter than it should be for proper balance, 
uh, so as not to uh, uh, duplicate and to save time for question and answer uh, time in this session. So turning to the political economy, it is commonly suggested that Smith's most notable achievement in the wealth of nations was to demonstrate that commodity demands and supplies can be coordinated spontaneously, so to speak, by way of competition acting through price flexibility in a decentralised economy, this being in turn identified with his invisible hand doctrine. Against this common view, it is a striking fact that Smith prefaces the book, The Wealth of Nations, with an with a introduction and plan of the work, a summary statement of a little over a thousand words, Smith's version of an executive summary that does not even once refer to markets or prices. That is astonishing. Not even once does he refer to markets or prices in that over 1,000 word summary of what he claims the book to be about. The central theme of the book is rather the conditions and causes of economic development understood as economic growth with qualitative or structural change involving rising output per worker and rising living standards, consumption per capita, extending to the mass of society's members. That is what the book is about, in, in my view, in one, in one overly long sentence. <laughs> the wealth referred to in the title is the flow of annual national product, with Smith's focus the dynamics of the national product over time, interrelated with the distribution of aggregate income, particularly between wages and profits, and the allocation of the national product between consumption and capital accumulation. The proximate causes of economic growth or development are capital accumulation, with human capital explicitly included, and increasing division of labour, labour specialisation. These two factors, in turn, are derivative from underlying propensities of human nature, of which the desire of bettering our condition is the most important. The division of labour doctrine, second only to the invisible hand, is the doctrine most famously associated with Smith, is enunciated in the opening chapters of the book. Labour specialisation, the source of labour productivity growth, is limited or enabled by the extent of the market. It is a concept of ongoing technical change in a growing economy. Well, let me go to the question of capital and then I'll jump across uh, the invisible hand to, to the question of policy. With respect to the theory of growth with structural change, capital and the accumulation of capital are the necessary prerequisite for ongoing expansion of division of labour and the associated technical progress or innovation. Capital is also central to Smith's theory of commodity prices and the functional distribution of income between wages, profits and rents. The price theory is built around the concept of natural prices, cost plus prices incorporating normal rates of return to capital, labour and land. The natural price of a commodity is the analogue in Smith's thought of what we would call the long run, long run equilibrium supply price. When actual market prices deviate from natural prices, due to supply-demand imbalances, it is the mobility of capital between different activities which is the key expression of competition, acting to return actual prices to equality with natural or equilibrium prices and restore supply-demand balance. In another aspect, the pressure of competition also induces innovation. 
There is a question as to how original Smith's economics is. I leave that question aside except to highlight one crucial intellectual debt. I mentioned earlier the 1760 Smith lecture notes, which enable comparison between his economic thinking at that time and in, in the Wealth of Nations 15 or so years later. And I noted that his years in France intervened between those dates. In contrast to the centrality of capital in WN, Smith's economics of the 1760s contains lectures, contains virtually no reference to any role for capital. If one were to attempt the thought experiment of removing capital theory from the, from the wealth of nations to see what would be left, in truth, one would be left with rubble. As I've indicated, the role of capital is vital to the economics of WN. The mobility of capital in search of the highest possible returns is the systematic force governing the formation of prices and functional income distribution, a dynamic already made clear by Turgot. And the accumulation of capital, along with technical progress, is the driver of economic development and economic growth, a theory developed at least in a primitive way by Francois Quenet. Well, this is where I jump across the invisible hand. and turn to Smith's policy views. Oh, thanks for that. I don't know why computers hate me so much. I've done nothing to them. So, can someone tell me where the rest of the slides are? There are 31 slides and that's number 20. Sorry. Uh, I'm just trying to see, maybe they put it into the next bit. Sorry, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to see if it's in the next bit. I don't trust anybody. I've got a plunger right. that has the file. If you want. No. Sorry, I don't know why it's not there. Tony, you can probably just keep on talking and then don't worry about the slides. Do you want me to get my... No, just keep on talking. The slides don't. The slides are sure? Yeah, the slides won't matter. Just leave it there. Okay. Free fall, The uh, The slides are not for my benefit. Uh, and some of these quotes are quite elaborate, and I think it's most useful for people to be able to see them. But can I also say that uh, at the Sydney presentation, the written document, uh, I have a written document here which has precise citations in it as well. And that document was provided to every registrant at the end of the session by email. So that would be useful if that could happen here as well. As to Smith's policy views, one could say, fundamentally, his policy is liberal capitalism. And beyond that, no policy, so to speak. But this would be a considerable overstatement. It is certainly his view that liberal capitalism, acting through human nature, expressed in particular in individuals' desire for material self-betterment and within a properly constituted framework of law securing life, liberty, and property, property rights, will suffice to deliver prosperity that will flow down to all. That liberal temper is nicely captured in his prescriptive definition of political economy. This would have been useful for you to see, but let me try to handle it orally. Quote, political economy 
considered as a branch of the science of a statesman or legislator, proposes two distinct objects. First, to provide a plentiful revenue or subsistence for the people, or more properly, to enable them to provide such a revenue or subsistence for themselves. And secondly, to supply the state or commonwealth with a revenue sufficient for the public services. It proposes to enrich both the people and the sovereign." Unquote. <clears throat> Notice the two asymmetries here. In relation to the people versus the state, plenty for the former, but just sufficiency for the latter. And rather than providing for the people, enabling them to provide for themselves, whereas the state is implicitly treated as unable to so self-provide. To put the latter point bluntly, for Smith, private sector economic activity produces and consumes, and capital accumulation is an expression of production exceeding consumption, whereas public sector activity just consumes. But this is an overstatement even of Smith's view. He allows that the state undertakes some productive activity. And of course, he also fully understands that the political and legal infrastructure of the state for the protection of life, liberty and property is an essential precondition for private economic activity. More broadly, there are two important caveats to Smith's economic liberalism. First, Smith explicitly allows for a considerable number of exceptions to strict economic liberalism in WN, including sumptuary laws, restriction of paper money and credit, product quality validation, legal prohibition of wage payments in kind rather than money, laws obliging private owners to cultivate their land at pain of forfeiture. So much for the sacredness of property. At the, at the pain of forfeiture. Infant industry protection, preventative public health policies, and allowance that government can successfully run commercial enterprise. Postal services being Smith's favourite example. No privatisation of the post for Adam Smith. Smith even makes some mild recommendations in favour of progressive taxation. And in the final book five, uh, which Alan also uh, referenced, he examines the three legitimate roles or duties of government in enforcement of justice, external defence and public works. The latter, the public works in particular, involving transport infrastructure and education. Second, there is in Adam Smith a deep and pervasive moderateness and caution concerning the implementation of theory in practice. And in this respect, he is far from being a laissez-faire ideological zealot. A good example of this moderateness is his advocacy for abolishing Britain's monopoly of the American colony trade, but only gradually. In short, Smith is not a shock therapy kind of a guy. This aspect of the man also points to why his serving as Commissioner of Customs, earlier mentioned, is not really paradoxical or hypocritical. In text added only to the sixth edition of the Theory of Moral Sentiments, the last edition he undertook, Smith made a long and substantial passage of argument explicitly attacking a character type he calls the man of system. This is a big quote, which again, it would be good for you to be able to see backwards and forwards. Quote, this is, his, this is his description of the man of system. Quote, wise in his own conceit, often so enamored with the supposed beauty of his own ideal plan of government, that he cannot suffer the smallest deviation from any part of it. He goes on to establish it completely in all its parts without any regard either to the great interests or the strong prejudices which may oppose it. He seems to imagine that
that he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as the hand arranges the different pieces upon a chessboard. Some general, even systematical idea of the perfection of policy and law may no doubt be necessary for directing the views of the statesman, but to insist upon establishing and upon establishing all at once and in spite of all opposition, everything which that idea may seem to require <coughs> must often be the highest degree of arrogance." Unquote. This moderateness concerning policy implementation of theory is bolstered by a certain confidence that human nature will still be working away for the good, even under defective policy regimes. This is also an extensive quote. This is a friendly criticism of his friend Canet. Canet, Smith characterises Canet as saying, either we have perfect free trade or we're going to have complete disaster, as if these are the, are the two only possible states of the world. And, and, and Smith uh, criticises him in a friendly way here because Canet was a, a, a physician. In fact, he was the physician uh, to Louis XIV's mistress. And so, so he says to, to Canet, I'm just giving you the context and then I'll, I'll read the, the, the smaller part of the text. He says, uh, he says you know, the human body, you know, people with not such good diets, but they still function pretty well. <laughs> they don't have a perfect uh, diet, but you know, they still uh, carry on pretty well. So then he goes on. In the political body, the natural effort which every man is continually making to better his own condition is a principle of preservation, capable of preventing and correcting, in many respects, the bad effects of a political economy in some degree, both partial and oppressive. So here, political economy is being used in the sense of policy regime, yeah? So this is the diet, right? So the diet's not so good, but uh, th things can still go okay. Such a political economy, though it no doubt retards more or less, is not always capable of stopping altogether the natural progress of a nation towards wealth and prosperity, and still less of making it go backwards. If a nation could not prosper without the enjoyment of perfect liberty and perfect justice, there is not in the world a nation which could ever have prospered." Unquote. It would have been good at this point for me to address the question of the relation, or at least some of the relations, between Smith's economics and his wider thought. Given the time constraint, I have been compelled to sacrifice this aspect. Probably the most important and enduring question in relation to this issue is the consistency or otherwise between the moral philosophy of the theory of moral sentiments and the economics of the wealth of nations. I think they are consistent. For Smith in the theory of moral sentiments, an adequate account of human society must be able to account for the evident fact that the human being is a self-regarding animal at the same time as it is an intrinsically social and sociable being. In a way, the theory of moral sentiments in our language is more an exercise in social psychology. <laughs> How is it? What is it in the human being that enables selfishness to be reconciled with sociability? That, this is the, sort of, that the problematic is an empirical one, if you like, not, a, not so much a normative one, but although it's got normative content as well, of course. To this slight comment, I only add that Smith's definition of political economy, quoted earlier, presents it as a branch of a larger science, and that larger science is characterised as a science for the legislator, making clear that it is emphatically a policy science. I also earlier pointed to Smith's remarkably large intellectual ambition as pointing to the aspiration for a unified social science. This 18th century thing, I think you, know, you can see this uh, also in that, the prefatory quote that I used from William Robertson, uh, the epigraph, See, Robertson, when he writes to Smith about the book, which he's had for a month, 
Robertson's had the book for a month. He calls it part, a part of political science, yeah? This is not just Adam Smith's view, I think. Okay, so the final thing uh, that I want to do is to say something about Adam Smith and our problems uh, today. For my part, the overall character, orientation and scope of Smith's economics are very attractive as a model for doing economics. This goes in particular to its aim to explain the dynamics of the economic system as a whole with the substantive content focused on functional income distribution, economic growth and structural change, and with a strong historical consciousness, open to the role of the contingencies of specific histories of peoples in shaping economic evolution and to the interplay of socio-political and economic forces, a kind of institutionalist temper, one could say. When Tamar Piketty's 2014 book had the good fortune to be the book in the right place at the right time, I noted in a review essay that if one were to suggest an appropriate epigraph for the book, a worthy candidate would be the title of book one of the Wealth of Nations. Quote, of the causes of improvement in the productive powers of labour and of the order according to which its produce is naturally distributed among the different ranks of the people, unquote. Piketty's book revived the great macro-historical issues of classical economics, in particular, the long-run dynamics of growth, distribution, and, and the interrelations between the two. Beyond that endorsement of the overall character of Smith's economics, I, would conc I conclude my written text with reflections on two issues that I take to be our most crucial economic problems, but this is a normative matter, so reasonable people can disagree <laughs> as to what our most pressing problems are. But the, the two I nominate are <coughs> uh, <coughs> environmental crisis and uh, economic inequality. On the question of environmental crisis, Adam Smith is, as always, moderate, but a moderate uh, technology optimist. So <clears throat> the prospect of uh, capitalism, liberal capitalism, delivering economic growth and distributing the, the benefits of growth widely to the entire population involves a kind of a contest between more binding natural scarcities, natural resource scarcities as the human economy expands versus human ingenuity expressed in technical progress or innovation in enabling labour productivity growth. And the question is uh, where the balance of forces between these two will lie. And I think Smith is uh, a moderate technology optimist in thinking that rising standards of life are going to be possible in an expanding economy. But Smith was also of the view that ultimately economic societies would reach a maximum feasible scale, thereby arriving at an end point stationary state, a zero growth economy, perhaps even negative growth. For Smith, this appears as a, as a distant prospect. In fact, the only example of a stationary state that he offered, China, is attributed to bad policy, not to binding natural resource constraints. But the human economy of Smith's world was relatively small in terms of the human footprint on the natural environment. It was not entirely impossible in that world for human production and consumption to exhaust natural resources or to generate waste and pollution beyond the capacity of non-human nature to absorb without damage. It was not entirely impossible, but these were possibilities that did not loom large in the overall scheme of things. That is not so for our world. In contrast to the archetypal scarce natural resource of classical economics, good quality land, 
With respect to that most pressing of our contemporary environmental crises, climate change, the scarce natural resource is the finite capacity of the atmosphere for absorbing greenhouse gas emissions. Smith's stationary state doctrine is a repudiation of the astonishing idea that the human economy could expand indefinitely without limit. An end would come even if, in 1776, far off <coughs> into the future. And then uh, finally to, to the second of these two problems, in my view, our most pressing problems, economic inequality. The widely distributed rising living standards that Smith expected competitive liberal capitalism to deliver is entirely consistent with rising inequality in the personal distribution of income. It's precisely innovation which gives the degree of freedom to enable rising absolute standards of living with rising inequality at the same time, yeah, simple. Smith's account of the dynamics of a competitive capitalist economy provides no determinate outcome with respect to the course of income inequality. It is a contingent matter. But Smith's recourse to a trickle-down defence of liberal capitalism suggests that he had a hunch that in practice income inequality would likely rise, which could be partly justified by a rising absolute uh, standard of living that would supposedly occur for the lowest paid workers. Broadly speaking, for Smith, arresting or ameliorating any such rising income inequality would not be a legitimate objective of government. And he is against labour unions. Consistently, he's against employer unions and collusion as well. Nevertheless, there are points at which Smith opens the door at least a little to policy intervention related to distribution. I mentioned earlier his endorsing a prohibition of wage payment in kind and some mild recommendations for progressive income, for progressive taxation. In respect to the payment of wages, here is the relevant uh, quotation. This is from the Wealth of Nations. Whenever the, leg quote, Whenever the legislature attempts to regulate the differences between masters and their workmen, its councillors are always the masters. When the regulation, therefore, is in favour of the workman, it is always just and equitable. But it is sometimes otherwise when in favour of the masters. Thus the law which obliges the masters in several different trades to pay their workmen in money and not in goods is quite just and equitable. Now here's my question of uh, this great icon of economic liberalism. Why should not workers and employers be free to choose a labour contract for payment in kind if they wish? Smith's approach to the theory of wages in terms of the balance of bargaining power around the labour contract provides the key. Quote, it is not difficult to foresee which of the two parties, workers and employers, that's me in square brackets, workers and employers, must, upon all ordinary occasions, have the advantage in dispute and force the other into a compliance with their terms." Unquote. So, at least with respect to the labour contract, not free to choose, but more likely a forced compliance. From that vantage point, Smith's willingness to endorse a prohibition on payment of wages in kind is evidently the expression of a willingness to constrain that balance as an imbalance of bargaining power so as to limit the power of employers. Here he has conferred some legitimacy upon the regulation of unequal economic and political power that informs functional and personal income distribution. Well, uh, I, I want to stop because I want to give time for uh, Q&A, but I will, I will just add one final little bit, and maybe you will have the written text to look at the detail more later. 
Some time ago, in a review of a book on Smith, the full details are in the written text, I noted the author's somewhat triumphalist comment in the concluding chapter, telling that the course of capitalism in relation to living standards had vindicated Adam Smith. And I commented, <clears throat> but the capitalism we've had over much of the 19th and 20th centuries is not exactly the capitalism recommended by Smith. There is the little matter of the rise and persistence, at least for much of that long period, of labour unionism. It is a question whether living standards would have risen as they have in the history of capitalism, in the absence of that, as well as other institutional elements pertaining to public sector activity and labour law and regulation with which Smith might or might not have agreed. Thank you for your attention. Tony, that was fabulous. You know, when we discussed whether we should delete some of these slides, I said, no, we'll be absolutely fine. <laughs> so we'll open it up to questions. Do we have some microphones? So <clears throat> the, qu the questions were, the first question was on uh, the nature of the money specie, whether it was uh, a fiat or, uh, or a commodity currency. And the second question was on the question of limiting the quantity of credit and the nature of monetary policy. Is that a fair summary? Perfect. Okay. Uh, so on the first, uh, it's, a little, it's a little bit tricky, right? So, I mean, the short answer would be it, it's a commodity currency, right? <laughs> But of course, there are private banks issuing, issuing bits of paper which have liquidity. I mean, they can be exchanged, right? People are prepared to accept them as a form of payment. So you're in a sort of a bit of a... It's always a... You know, there's, a, there's always that old joke with the, with the monetarists versus the Keynesians. Say, oh, you yeah, know, they've got 300 definitions of what money is, right? And, and uh, there's a reason for that. Liquidity is a spectrum. It's not, it's not like this is liquidity and this is illiquidity. There's actually degrees of liquidity because all liquidity means is how widely acceptable is this thing as a means of payment, right? That's what liquidity is. Uh, so I, I would say the short answer is a commodity currency, but with private banks issuing paper of varying quality and credibility and, and so on. Um, the whole question of monetary policy is, uh, and banking policy then, right? So banking policy and monetary policy must be closely connected. Uh, Smith is not highly regarded for his monetary analysis, fairly or otherwise. Uh, it's not an area I've taken a lot of interest in personally, so I don't want to uh, really say too much. Um, I facetiously said in, at, at a conference in Europe last year that Smith's uh, attitude to banking is, uh, if bankers behave well, all will be well. I said, well, how about that? <laughs> so, if bankers behave well, all will be well. Yeah, that's right. Good point. Uh, so, yeah, it's like he has this idea that, that, uh, that as long as bankers vet credit issuance so as they only provide credit to genuine productive capital, there's no problem about issuing currency, right? 
You don't have to worry about limiting currency as long as bankers behave, right? Well, will they behave? <laughs> That's the question. So you can think about it as saying, what are the institutional arrangements that might best be conducive to making bankers who issue private credit behave? Yeah. Another question. We've got a bit of time, so jump up, fire away. Right at the back there. How's that? Tony, I, I know that Adam Smith's often misquoted in the, by people who want to defend tariffs. And it seems to be when they when they analyse that, that is, the people use, by misquoting him, insert the word domestic in front of uh, protecting industry. He used, and when you analyse his writings, he doesn't use that word at all. So it's a little bit of a fraudulent usage. He certainly doesn't defend, he doesn't defend tariffs in, in his, his writings, but I wondered if you, in your, in your experience, had come across that, uh, that the fact that he is often misquoted for the wrong reasons. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, thanks, Ron. Um, I'm, I'm not directly familiar right now in my head with that tariff thing. I mentioned that he, he provides some defence of infant industry protection, but hey, it's very marginal. I, I couldn't give you the detail right now, but if if you email me, I, I will send you the relevant text. But he's, you know, it's clear he's not in favour of, of protection. Like, let, let's be clear about this. But but he does provide a little bit of concession on some infant industry possibilities. And of course, um, patents are a form of protection as well, right? Uh, defended in terms of uh, intellectual property. And the other thing I mentioned, uh, which is sort of relevant to your question, your comment, is um, uh, this thing about the, you know, he's, he, he wants to abolish the, the British monopoly on the colony trade before everything falls apart, right? The American colony trade. But uh, see, there's that gradualism thing where he says, look, you know, people, you've set up a policy regime, people have invested their capital under these rules, you can't just blow it up overnight. This is not fair, right? So there's this idea that, that you, should, you should dismantle this protection, but, but you shouldn't just uh, blow the place up, right? So it's, I suppose you could say this is an expression of the idea that, that the policymakers need to show some consistency of purpose, like capricious uh, changes to, to uh, the rules of the game are not reasonable. People should have some moderate certainty about the rules. And so. We should get rid of this uh, restriction on trade, but yeah. pe people have made decisions under the rules you set. You, you should let them get out a little bit uh, slowly, <laughs> not just throw them on the on the heap overnight. So, yeah. So I don't know about that tariff stuff, but um, specifically off the top of my head, Ron. But um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of distortion of Adam Smith, but we have definitive texts now. So people who want to quote Adam Smith should give you chapter and verse then we can all go and, and have a look ourselves and see if it really is there, yeah? Any other questions? Right here, and then at the back. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try and be as quick as possible. Um, I'm Thanks, Tony. That was very interesting. I, I just have a, a query about your initial framing where you had the reference to um, the traditional view of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations emphasising um, prices and markets, and these are not extensive, are not included in the um, introductory discussions, whereas you've emphasised other things like the progressive dynamics and development of capitalism. When, when I tend to read it, I tend to read all of those things together. That is, I don't see the first proposition as necessarily inconsistent with his emphasis on um, the dynamics of development, mainly because of his discussion of the extent of the market, the fact that that's prominent in the linking of the idea of the division of labour. So, so I'm just suggesting that maybe there's not such a difference between those perspectives that you're presenting. Um, I think this might be a little bit more uh, fully dealt with in <coughs> the Invisible Hand Revisited paper that, that I'll present this afternoon. 
Uh, and I, I will say there that uh, the, the decentralised coordination of demand and supply via price flexibility and the competition with open capital markets and no, you know, ba no barriers to entry or, or limited barriers to entry is important. <laughs> But it's not, it's not some sacred icon important for its own sake. It's important <coughs> by, by the way it contributes to the, to the development of the economy. And, and is it, what is the economy for, Adam Smith says? It is, it is to enable people to live better, not the rich, to enable a mass of people to live comfortably. Adam Smith is contemptuous of the luxury consumption of the rich. He talks about it. Google Adam Smith texts with the word trinket or bauble. He thinks that the, they are childish. Their consumption is childish. Yeah? He's interested in extending material comfort to the, the, the bulk of the people. The price system's purpose is to serve that, right? So it's not about saying uh, you know, this, this rather than that, but saying what, what is the architectonic of all this, right? So instead of this nonsense about, oh, look at the glory of the market, look what miracles it does spontaneously without any guiding hand, right? Um, this is uh, rubbish, right? What is important is about how the market mechanism serves the, the process of economic development and the, the material consumption of the bulk of people. Next, uh, question right back. Uh, thanks for that, Tony. I'm just wondering, what, if anything, do we know about Smith's view on the politics of the day, on the big events that were happening around him? Uh, not so much from an economic perspective, but from a political perspective. Did he have sympathy with the 13 colonies? Uh, does, he, does he do any, any, is any of his writing reflective of, I guess, a broader political philosophy? Uh, I'm not the one to ask, because it's not really a focus of my interest, but uh, you have the good fortune, I think, um, uh, if, if a Q and A is feasible with Lisa uh, via uh, Lisa Hill knows heaps, 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 heaps about this stuff. You, you, you should store your question. I mean, I could, I could, I could, I could ramble on for three minutes, but consider it stored. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, and she, she specifically has, a, has a, a, an essay on Smith's advice about the colonies and what the British government should do. So she knows a lot about that. Uh, Tony, uh, Doug Hall, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, my background's complex science, particularly biology. Um, and when I came to economics and discovered Smith, he struck me and you've touched on this, I think, in a number of parts, very much as somebody struggling with a complex system. Um, and I think that has led to, you know, so many different positions because he's struggling. Um, but I, what I particularly like in your comments about his comment, your comments about his comments on how to deal with the American economy, I think is critical because the complex systems, time is critical. And so much in politics and, and some views of economics, time is almost non-existent, so hence the revolutionary concept. So the fact that he's an evolutionist, to me, is inherent in his struggling with a complex system. Um, and yeah, so I just wondered if you, you had a similar view. And but just one other thing, um, you touched on the last, one of your last quotes about what I think is the input value, theory of value. Um, which of course was picked up by Ricardo and, and, and Marx and dominates left policy. And of course the marginal revolution in the 1870s had a different view which is a subjective theory of value. And it seems that this tension between these two views of value um, are one of the prime drivers of politics in general. And you often see this in debates between representatives of the union movement and representatives of industry groups. And they're really just taking those two, two positions. Um, so again, do you have a view on, on that uh, difference of uh, opinion and um, you know, how do we resolve it if it's resolvable at all? Thanks. So on the first thing, uh, yeah, uh, perhaps rather than evolution, evolution's fine, I think that's a fair word, but. I guess what I would say is Adam Smith always speaks in, a, in an historical voice. <laughs> he always wants to talk the history of things to understand them. Yeah? So 
Uh, that's probably even evident enough from the, my few quotes um, how much he frames everything in, in, in historical narrative terms. Uh, so, yeah, I think dynamic, evolutionary, uh, biological metaphor has value there, I think. Um, on the theory of value, uh, the objective theory of value and the subjective theory of value as between classical economists and the marginalists from the late 19th century forward. You know, people get obsessed with the theory of prices on this issue, but it's really... The secret is the theory of distribution. If you want to understand why the theory of prices is so radically different in classical economics versus marginalism, the secret lies in the difference in the theory of distribution. So, so it's like, don't get distracted by price theory. Look, look at the role that the theory of distribution is playing. This is the only Band-Aid I could get at the Intercontinental. He apologised that he couldn't find a tan one. Um, yeah, don't get distracted by the price theory. Go, go to the theory of distribution. Um, I'm with the classical economists on that. So distribution is a social and political thing. That is, that is where the explanation for distribution lies. In marginalism, it becomes a private thing. It's in the psychology of the consumer, right, is the, is the key to the theory of prices. This is why political economy becomes economics. That's the deep reason why political economy becomes economics. I think we had a question at the back, did we not? Right at the back and then on here, or two there. Yeah. And then we'll run over the so Perhaps the following on from the gentleman over here, um, does Smith in his very last um, edition of The Wealth of Nations is he influenced at all by the events in France given his closeness to the to the French? Uh, I, I can't remember the precise year of the last edition of The Wealth of Nations during his life, but if you're alluding to that marvellous quote about the man of system, uh, that's from the theory of moral sentiments. So, so that's, that, that's the, that sixth edition is 1790, right? So people have speculated, as perhaps is, is implied by your question, is the man of system about the French Revolution? Uh, I think the timing is too tight. But there are plenty of men of system before Robespierre, right? I mean, maybe the man of system is Cromwell. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Dave. We have two questions here. Do we have a... Thanks, Eva. Yes, hi. Just, Just one you. moment. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, hi. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It was very... Um, Interesting. So my question probably would be, um, you said that Adam Smith is a critic of the monopoly and during his time, um, wealth is measured through commodity. So I was wondering, what, how do you describe his relationship with the government, um, given that it looks like he has a support with the aristocrat as well. So I was just thinking, how would you describe his probably affair with the government, knowing that at, um, he's also into um, acknowledging that the government has a, uh, um, when it, a responsibility when it comes to education and welfare of the people as well. So when you say his relationship with government, you mean specifically with actual British governments of the time? Yes. Yeah, this I cannot help you with, I'm sorry. It's not a matter I've paid any attention to, with apologies. But again, you might try that on Lisa Hill. She's a pol politics professor, so she knows lots about this stuff. Thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned his moral sentiments and his idea that humans have, like, they're driven by self-interest and they're self-regarding, but they're also very sociable. How, does he address, like, the tension between these two? Well, I think it's. I think the whole point of, of in a way, the whole point of the theory of moral sentiments is to resolve this. Yeah. So the the opening sentence of the the very first sentence of the theory of moral sentiments, it goes it starts like this: How selfish soever man may be, there are evidently some principles in his nature 
Now, I, I can't quote the rest verbatim, but it goes something like this. That directing to the well-being of others, though he gained nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it, right? So, so, so there's your point of departure, right? And it goes to the psychology of, of uh, empathy or the, the famous word he uses is sympathy, uh, um, but probably empathy. Uh, in, in our use of words, sympathy is a bit uh, too uh, limp-wristed, I think. It's, it's more uh, empathy, I think, better captures what he has in mind uh, than, than sympathy. But perhaps uh, Michael McClure will be talking about these things later today as well. So it's a big thing, yeah, but uh, how, how this gets reconciled in human psychology. Thanks very much, Tony. I think we might have to draw to a close for morning tea there. I had several wonderful questions to ask, but you've precluded me from doing so. Uh, so we, we've only got sh sh a 15 minute schedule for, for morning tea, so make a dash for that porridge while it's warm, <laughs> uh, and we'll see you back here then. But before we go, let's thank Tony again for a brilliant introduction. <laughs> We will, with great pleasure, move to the next presentation by William Coleman, a noted authority on all aspects of economics and indeed Australian history as well. Uh, so again, the aim is we'll leave uh, 10 minutes or so at the end for questions and discussion. So please welcome William Coleman. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alan. It is indeed a, a great pleasure to be part of this worthy initiative of the John Curtin Institute of Public Policy and the Mankell Economics Foundation. Adam Smith on Australia. That may seem like an unlikely topic. Thanks to the electronic circuit engine, we may state with perfect confidence that Adam Smith never, either in the wealth of nations or any other of his leading works, passed a single remark about the geography, inhabitants, or society of Australia. But nevertheless, I feel licensed to launch on the topic by observing that at one point in his life, Smith almost had a profound influence, namely by affecting the choice of the command of the endeavour. At a critical point in the preparation of the expedition of the endeavour, Smith weighed in to have not James Cook, but a certain Alexander Dalrymple placed on the bridge. Dalrymple, born in Edinburgh of a Scottish noble family, was not bereft of qualifications to captain the, the, uh, the endeavour. Between 1759 and 1764, he had voyaged the Philippines and Borneo in an attempt to discover a new route to China. Uh, by way of New Guinea. Having done so, he returned to London and published an account of the discoveries made in the South Pacific Ocean prior to 1764, where he revealed himself to be a visionary of the existence in the Pacific of an as yet undiscovered terra incognita. Of its unexplored extents, he declared, not only many large islands swarm with people, it is more than probable that another continent will be found there, extending about 30 degrees south of the pole. Shortly thereafter, his vivid speculations intersected <coughs> with the enterprises of a more sober science. For the Royal Society had rightly judged that the South Pacific would be an especially suitable place to observe the transit of Venus across the face of the sun and proposed to the king that a naval expedition be sent to the South Seas to observe it. To Dalrymple's mind, an opportunity to be the Christopher Columbus of his terra incognita had suddenly materialised. And his most important contact in the pursuit of that opportunity would be Adam Smith. For Dalrymple's family was part of Scotland's intellectual elite. His older brother, Lord Hales, had collected a library of great reputation at the family seat, New Hales House, 
which was also a regular gathering place of all the great and the good of the Scottish Enlightenment. Hales and Adam Smith were in fact fellow members of the Scotland's select society. And Smith in turn was linked to a person central to the expedition of the endeavour. For the King had entrusted his wish for an expedition to William Petty Fitzmaurice, the Earl of Shelburne, then Secretary of State for the Southern Department, which was the 18th century equivalent of the later colonial office. Shelbourne was a great admirer of Smith. He'd entrusted his education of his son and his younger brother to Adam Smith. You might even say he'd entrusted his own. He later declared, I owe to Mr. Smith the difference between light and darkness. Smith finally was evidently very ready to press Dalrymple's case on Shelburne. In a letter to Shelburne of the 12th of February, 1766, Smith deposed of his fellow Scott and his geographical theories, whether this continent exists or not may be uncertain, but supposing that it does exist, I am very certain you will never find a man fitter for discovering it or more determined to hazard everything to discover it. Strong words. But to the Royal Navy, it was unendurable that any of its ships be directed by any other than an officer of the Navy. And on the 3rd of April, 1768, Dalrymple's hopes were decisively extinguished. The endeavour departed, with Cook on the quarter deck, a copy of the account of the discoveries made in the South Pacific in the hold, but no Dalrymple. So, there was no intersection between Smith and Australia in the matter of events. On the face of it, neither was there in his writings. As I have noted, despite Smith's interest in exploration, particularly that of Taurus and Kiros, despite owning a copy of William Dampier's Voyage to New Holland, despite the rage for Cook on the endeavour's return from its voyage, and despite later the planned colony of Botany Bay being all the talk of London town, despite even the raw possibility of Smith including some reference to the resulting Sydney Cove settlement in the final edition of The Wealth of Nations, which came out in 1789, Smith passes no word on Australia. And yet I believe, I contend, that Smith had a great deal to say about the first generation of settlement at Sydney implicitly. Why do I say this? Because he had a great deal to say about mercantilism, the policy regimen which aimed to extinguish from economic life any competition from foreign sources. Mercantilism was Smith's great foe in policy, and mercantilism had the infant settlement of Sydney Cove firmly, firmly in its grip for the first 30 years. It did so by several means. Firstly, the Navigation Acts. In summary, these acts ordained that British colonies could only import from Great Britain, indeed could only export to Great Britain. In other words, foreigners could neither supply what the colonies wanted, nor demand what the colonies had to supply. And this was reinforced by a ban on non-British merchant ships conducting any part of the trade of British colonies. And these injunctions apply to New South Wales no less than in any other British colony. Thus, on the 20, 20th of July, 1806, Governor King sternly advised the colonist of Sydney Cove, that every British subject is forbidden from entering into any mercantile contract with the subjects of foreign powers on pain of being sent from the colony. In 1816, the Colonial Office reminded Governor Macquarie that the trade of foreign vessels with a British colony is directly at variance with the navigation laws. And in the same year, an American schooner in Sydney Harbour was confiscated as a lawful prize under the Navigation Acts. It's not difficult to see that this prohibition of foreign supply to the Sydney Cove settlement would raise prices. And we can easily have a little market supply and demand sketch of the market for imports in New South Wales. We can think of a supply schedule from Britain, a demand schedule for imports into New South Wales from New South Wales, of course. We can add a supply schedule from the rest of the world, and if indeed there's no navigation acts and there's free trade with the rest of the world, the price in New South Wales, we might think, would be the same as the price in the rest of the world. There are some imports from Britain, some imports for the rest of the world. Of course, if you abolish that 
purple line, if you abolish, if you prohibit supply from the rest of the world, then price in New South Wales will be elevated above the price in the rest of the world. In fact, Smith did not embrace with, with much conviction this seemingly obvious conclusion about the impact of the navigation laws on the cost of living in British colonies. In The Wealth of Nations, he spoke rather dismissively of the, quote, little enhancement in price which these laws had on the price of imports in the North American colonies. I think I can see why. Any enhancement in price, any such enhancement, would, after all, be to the benefit of British exporters. And Smith was determined to show that these navigation laws would harm not only the colonies, but also Britain itself. But if Smith was unexpectedly forbearing regarding the navigation laws, he was very hot to censure a second shaft of mercantilist policy regime. That is, a characteristic institution of mercantilism, the exclusive company, that is to say, the legal monopoly created by the state with the purpose of engrossing to it the business of some sector of the economy. The supreme example of the East India Company, of, of this, the exclusive company, was the East India Company. By a royal charter, confirmed by successive acts of parliament, the East India Company had been granted a monopoly over the trade of Great Britain with any portion of the world located between the Cape of Good Hope and the Straits of Magellan. New South Wales was evidently squarely within the company's zone of monopoly. New South Wales could import from and export to um, Great Britain and indeed to her empire or indeed any part of the Indo-Pacific only with the consent of the East India Company and on the terms of the East India Company. And the East India Company did not overlook its rights. It has been speculated that the company kiboshed the plan of 1783 to settle New Holland with American loyalists on the account of its potential threats such a set settlement would pose to the company's trade monopoly. It is a fact that in 1790, the company's directors, its court, as it was known, in London, instructed a survey to be made of the most eligible passage of ships <coughs> using the eastern route, as it called it, to China. Accordingly, in February of 1793, Captain John Hay set, sailed south from Bombay, eastward across the Southern Ocean, until he reached the Don Tricasto Estuary in Tasmania, where he sailed up river as far as New Norfolk, naming as he went Mount Direction, Risdon Cove, Cornelian Bay, various other landmarks of um, the Durant River, which he also named. After six weeks there, he ventured into the Tasman Sea, sailing north until he reached the northwestern coast of New Guinea, where he hoisted the British flag at Doray Bay with a 21-gun <coughs> salute, took possession of what he called New Albion on behalf of the King, Thus, Australia may have been on the edge of the map of the company, so it may have been the ultimate fall, but it was definitely on the company's map. Neither did the law look askance at the company's presumptions with respect to Australia. On the contrary, it affirmed it. William Eden, a familiar of Smith and Britain's trade envoy to France, was also a prison reformer and very interested in transportation as a substitute for convict hulks in the Thames. In his History of New Holland of 1787, brought out amid the active discussion of the plans for Botany Bay, he affirmed that New South Wales could never, on account of the East India Company's charter, possess any commerce of its own. In full sympathy with this, Governor Phillips' instructions forbade outright the construction of any ships within New South Wales in case the new colony did seek to possess a commerce of its own. The significance for this talk of the company's universally acknowledged claim to New South Wales trade was that the company's was one of Smith's bait noir, one of his black beasts. The East India Company to Smith was an absurdity, a nuisance to every respect. Its presence in Asia and its absence from America explained while Asian trade plotted along while American trade exploded. The company transformed dearth into famine and made India a place of want, famine, and mortality. 
It sounds pretty bad, doesn't it, for New South Wales? Why was Smith so hostile to the company? Well, because it was a monopoly. And the benefits of competition was one of the leading ever-present themes of Smith's political eco economy. In terms of um, modern analysis, we can easily see that again in terms of our little supply and demand model of New South Wales, if the supply, if we've managed to keep out supply from the rest of the world, the Navigation Acts, if we add monopoly, if we allow um, supply of imports from Britain to be monopolised by the East India Company, we can see the price will no longer be the familiar supply and demand price at the intersection of those two schedules, but price will be deliberately driven up to what I've pictured there, the price in New South Wales. But to Smith, the company, the East India Company, was worse than simply being a monopoly. It was also a joint stock company. In today's language, the East India Company was a publicly listed company, a company with many owners or shareholders, as we call them. To Smith, as a general proposition, to have many owners of any company is to have no owner in control. So to who does own a joint stock company or a um, publicly listed company, as we would call them? Well, management, or in Smith's language, the servants of the company. And predictably, they exercised their control to benefit themselves. So the company maximised not profits, but managerial incomes. So if we think, if we look at our diagram, and we take advantage of the fact that the supply curve is also the marginal cost curve, we can see what orthodox theory would predict would be the profits of, of the monopoly company. I've shaded it in in that brown colour. But if a management is in control, what we won't have that level of profits. Profits won't be maximised. Rather, costs will be padded out. The company's board the Court of Governors, would obviously not, would obviously refuse anything which they knew to be cost padding, which they knew to be cost padding, excuse me. But what would the court in London know about the true cost of undertakings in India? Consequently, profusion, I'm quoting Smith here, profusion therefore must always prevail more or less in the management of the affairs of any joint stock company, says Smith. Figure six, which I'll go on to, um, illustrates a relatively restrained form of cost padding. The, the actual cost of the marginal unit <coughs> is represented to the board or the court to be also the cost of all inframarginal units. The red shaded area is successfully transferred from owners to, to managers. Though output and price are not actually altered but the analysis is incomplete. Managers here to be solding, holding back a bit. For if managers in this figure are exaggerating the cost of the inframarginal units, they are still truthfully reporting the cost of the marginal unit. Why not exaggerate the cost of all units? You would not want to overdo it, of course, as any exaggeration of cost or marginal cost will induce the court, the board, to reduce output. Ooh, there's some sort of optimal degree of exaggeration on the management's part, as far as cost padding goes. And for this particular diagram, it can be demonstrated that that's the optimal degree of misrepresentation <laughs> of marginal costs. Um, you can see that profits are very badly hit. And as Smith observes, the profusion of the company's own servants sold and allows the dividend of the company to exceed the ordinary rate of profit despite it being a monopoly, and very frequently makes it fall a good deal short of that rate, as it would here. But of course, for New South Wales, the stinging implication is that price is even higher than under the ordinary monopoly price, and quantity is even lower than under the ordinary monopoly price. As Smith observes, the consumer pays not only for all the extraordinary profits which the company makes on, 
on goods in consequence of the monopoly, but for all the extraordinary waste and abuse inseparable from the affairs of a great company managed in this way. So given this double whammy, not, a, not only monopoly but also cost padding, um, it looks bad for the uh, inhabitants of New South Wales. And Smith would well expect smuggling as a response to this squeeze. In the Wealth of Nations, he pressed that in the face of the East Indian Company's monopoly on imports of tea into Great Britain, the majority of tea, the great bulk of tea consumed in Britain, was actually smuggled in. So Smith would not be surprised that the nooks and crannies of conduct transports in New South Wales were crammed with smuggled goods in an attempt to defy the East India Company's monopoly and to take advantage of the high prices in the colony. But Smith would have further pressed that this smuggling going on was not going to be simply restricted to criminal types, you know, convicts. For the smuggler, he wrote, is frequently incapable of violating those laws of natural justice and would have been in every respect an excellent citizen had not the laws of his country made that a crime which nature never meant to be so. Smith was then um, very ready to observe that frequently it was the respectable servants or management of the East India Company, so well placed and so well empowered, which assumed the role of the smuggler in the East India Company's zone of control. The servants, he observed, naturally endeavour to establish the same monopoly in favour of their own private trade as of the public trade of the company. What Smith is saying is the company's servants seek to monopolise the smuggling and in doing so, restrict the amount of smuggling so as to drive up the profits of smuggling. <laughs> so if we think of smuggling in a competitive situation, when all can smuggle, profits from smuggling fall to zero, and the price in New South Wales will be the price of the rest of the world. However, we can also think of, of smuggling being controlled okay, by the, by the servants of the company. And therefore, they, they reduce the amount of smuggling in order to maximise smuggler profits, indicated here. Now, when the price is higher, then they still believe the company's ordinary monopoly price, you'll obviously observe. Now, in the New South Wales case, it wasn't so much the servants of the company which were assuming that role, rather it was the servants of the Crown namely the New South Wales Corps, okay? The situation of figure nine is very reminiscent of New South Wales under the New South Wales Corps between 1793 and 1811, which ran the smuggling in New South Wales to the cost of the company, to the benefit of themselves, but also to the benefit of the, new, of the people of New South Wales. My final remarks <coughs> refer to the fact that there is a third and Final dimension of early New South Wales' peculiar and beleaguered existence, which Smith had implicitly much to say on. One which belonged to the same historical epoch as mercantilism and is tied up with it. Transportation and convictism. Mercantilism and convictism are connate phenomenon in that they are both grounded in the appearance, use and abuse of colonies. But the analytical kinship of convictism of most significance to Smith was its close kinship analytically, to slavery. The various evils of slavery was almost a preoccupation of Smith. And one of its several evils, to Smith's mind, was that it was economically inefficient. It was inefficient because it constituted a de facto 100% marginal tax rate on effort of the slave, 100% marginal tax rate on any innovations in the productive process of the slave, and 100% marginal tax rate on investment by the slave in their own human capital, particularly their health and their skills. These inefficiencies of slavery were so considerable that they overwhelmed any benefits from the low pay in slaves. I believe, he says, that the work done by free men comes cheaper in the end 
than that performed by slaves. It is found to do so even in Boston, New York and Philadelphia, where the wages of common labour are so high. These criticisms of the inefficiency of slavery obviously extend to any species of forced labour, including convict labour. So Smith would not be surprised by the high consumption of rum in New South Wales, so destructive of human capital. If you're a convict, what's the reward for appearing to work refreshed and sober rather than spent and hung over? The inferiority of the industrious of convicts to free labour, Smith himself had observed. The Portuguese Jews, he wrote, having been banished to Brazil, introduced by their example some sort of industry among the transported felons by whom that colony was originally peopled and taught the felons the cultivation of sugarcane. In the face of this, Smith would not be surprised by the emergence, toleration, and encouragement of a free labour system of convict labour. Thus, an old city town, the practice soon emerged that in the afternoon, not the morning, but in the afternoon, most convicts would work on their own account for wages for a private sector employer with no supervision beyond that. The early days of the Botany Bay colony were one of economic frustration and hardship. With some force, E.O.G. Shan's Economic History of Australia depicts that dismal scene. I might underline, underline Shan's eloquence with a single quantitative observation. At the opening of 1792, after four years of settlement, the Botany Bay or Sydney Cove settlement comprised of 2,870 persons, but just six horses. Fortunately, the newly instituted New South Wales course, Corps was soon to import horses in violation of the East India Company's monopoly. And at least the breeding of horses not forbidden, unlike the construction of ships. In the light of the encumbrances of mercantilism and forced labour which shackled the settlement, Sydney Smith would not be surprised at the difficulty of the Sydney Cove settlement. I venture a rational inference from the pages of Wealth of Nations would be to predict its early economic plight. So while Adam Smith made no explicit remark touching on Australia, I argue that the Wealth of Nations is insightful and explanatory of the struggle of the first generation of European settlement in Australia. And we should not be surprised. First generation New South Wales was not only a fragment of the British Empire, it was also a fragment of 18th century Britain. And the 18th century Britain and her empire was Smith's principal subject. No other economist of the first rate speaks quite so directly to specific, or specifically to Australian experience in that first generation of settlement as Smith does. We are close to him. Thanks for your attention. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Could you? Um, I, I, thank you for your question. The age of mercantilism really came to an end uh, by about 1830. So the East India Company's monopoly on trade in New South Wales was uh, substantially reduced in 1822 and finally came to a complete end about 1832. So really by the time Western Australia um, um, and Vic Victoria, South Australia being settled, they were no longer under the purview, fortunately, of the East India Company. So that is, that is why its reference is New South Wales. Right, anyone else? Thanks so much, William. That was awesome. Um, really enjoyed it. I just had a quick question. Um, when Adam Smith was really critical of monopolies and how they cost society um, so much inefficiency overall, um, <laughs> is, is there any 
like does he give any kind of uh, discussion or I'm just wondering points wise uh, to like R&D and like how that can come from monopolies like did he see any good side of it or Adam not Smith really? is a very many sided author but I'm not sure and I can be corrected by fellow Smithians here if he ever actually put in a good word for monopoly. Yes, it is true that later students of, of R&D, particularly under Schumpeter and Influence and otherwise, have thought that, hey, a monopoly um, has, has almost a de facto patent on whatever it discovers because, you know, there aren't any other companies to steal their ideas in the first place. And maybe monopoly isn't such a bad thing for innovation. I don't notice that specific idea in um, Smith. Um, so I, I think the simple answer is, is uh, no. His ideas of innovation um, were very individual ideas. And let's face it, it was pre-R&D days, mm -hmm. right? There was no such thing as the invention factory. It was just the small boy operating a steam engine noting that you could save some movement by tying one bit to another bit, this sort of thing. It was from the factory floor. That was in where innovation came. There was another question there, wasn't there? Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, William. Also, really enjoyed it. My question uh, is about uh, your observation on Smith on slavery, and I wondered, um, can you perhaps speculate what Smith might have thought about a basic wage today? The basic wage. Well, the basic wage I take to be a minimum wage, a sort of legislated minimum wage. Um, Look, it's hard to say because there, there were um, there were things called poor laws, um, which sometimes prescribed minimum wages for agricultural labourers. But Smith wasn't particularly fond of the poor laws in general, because it because they usually required the poor labourer to stay in the county of their birth. And he thought this was um, just disallowing the movement of people um, and, and obstructive. I'm not sure whether Smith had anything particular to say about a minimum wage law um, in the abstract. Sorry, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of an empty vessel on that too. Um, I'm interested in the critique that he had of the uh, publicly listed company that you, yeah. you, you discussed. And I was just, I, I, I guess I'm just trying to, you, you know, which with the benefit of hindsight today, you would say, well, he was wrong. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. was, that was actually a very successful model. It's yeah. Yeah. generated all sorts yeah. of things. Yeah. But then I was thinking, well, maybe in his mind, was it tied up very directly with the monopoly issue? And the, you know, you use the East India Company as your example. Uh, or if not, what was his, Concern. Well, it was some degree tied up with it. He thought that a joint stock company was so disastrous, it had to have a legal monopoly in order to survive, right? No joint stock company could survive in a genuine competitive environment. Now, as you, you've observed, that seems to be, again, very pre-industrial um, outlook, right? in the 19th century, the joint stock company, first in the United States, later in Britain, Britain and the world, became a hugely um, su successful entity. But hey, let's be fair to Smith. I mean, what he's talking about is separation of management from control, you know, very familiar theme to any student of industry economics. And the abuse, if you like, or the misuse of um, the company uh, by management to, um, you know, feather their own nests. I mean, I think that's a very familiar trope, right? in any study of, of corporate life. So Smith might have got the wrong end of it in one way, but in another way, I think he was, he was onto something. Thanks, William, that was really interesting. Can I pose a devil's advocates question? That is the requirement to have a shipping monopoly um, may have been inspired by economies of scale. That is, there's such a small amount of trade from any parts of the world with Australia 
that, that unless there's the appropriate scale that can be provided, you won't have, Britain will be out of the service. So the monopoly may well have been designed to service scale. You can look at it in terms of what Smith thought, but you also just look in terms of pure economics, and in pure economics I can't understand. I mean, if, if um, having uh, uh, big ships, oh, the only possible, if a big ship is more economic than a small ship, well, big ships will capture the market. Now, you could come back and say, oh, but that's a kind of monopoly, isn't it? Maybe you could have an argument um, like that. Um, but um, if, there's, yeah, uh, if there's any cost advantage in being big, won't competition produce bigness? Yes. Tony? Well, is there anyone else? Because I've talked enough. That's fine. Well, I was just going to say, on, on respect to the Navigation Act, there is this element where they could twist uh, Smith to their favour, which is Navigation Act is one of his exceptions to liberty because uh, um, you have to ensure you have a, dom a domestic ship shipping fleet in case of war, right? So th this creates, a, you, you can upend economic liberty for the sake of the higher uh, uh, P political or defence um, thing. So. Yeah, that's right. He, one reason why he was easy on the Navigation Acts is because it encouraged, uh, it was helped defence. Yeah. Questions at the back. Back row here. Um, just in terms of applying his theories to modern times, what do you think Smith would do with our current challenges for Aboriginal people in Australia in terms of what you've talked about in terms of slavery and human rights abuses? Gosh, you know, that's a really hard question. That's, that's a really hard question. The only thing I would, only thing I can offer, now, offer up on that is Smith's discussion of the impact of the discovery by de Gama, Rango and Cape Hope and Columbus across the, across the Atlantic, the implications of that for the existing inhabitants of the New World. And you can find that, well, I, I can't give, certainly in the Wealth of Nations. And of course, he's very fascinated by the creation of a global market, right? All the wants and needs of the world can, that we can help each other by supplying it across the oceans, isn't that great? And yet, He's surprisingly hesitant about saying, well, therefore, it's a good thing. Why is that? Because he's concerned about the impact of the discovery, of these discoveries on the inhabitants of the, of the new world, you know, the indigenous inhabitants of the new world. And he speaks of the great cruelty and suffering. And then it's as if he can't make up his mind. Was it really worthwhile for them? And then he says, well, look, it's not so much that the discoveries directly caused their suffering. It was, that was sort of an incidental implication. Knowledge itself will, in the end, bring them back up too. That's what he's saying. He's a real enlightenment believer. Knowledge itself will bring the indigenous inhabitants of the new world right up the top two eventually. So ultimately, he's optimistic about the power of knowledge. I think that's the one thing I can say in response to that question. Our last question. One over here. Over here. Um, your thesis about uh, profits and uh, management uh, padding and things of that sort uh, appear to be a little bit flawed to me um, in the sense that that money just doesn't disappear. That money that's made by management leads to, one, uh, if it's padding, possibly employment. Uh, secondly, build up of capital by the owners of, of whatever that business is. They have to invest that somewhere. Um, why, um, I mean, one could be critical of that, but um, surely that was another feedback in the process. Well, um, all I can say is there's reality in these models. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, I think, a reasonable, half reasonable model. Um, the model, you'll notice, um, as I observed, leaves the profits of, of the owners of the East India Company um, actually reduced, right? It's, it's, it's managers, if you like, quasi-salaries, which get padded. Uh, um, the profits of the owners are reduced. That would discourage 
uh, investment. It doesn't encourage employment by raising costs. It's discouraged, well, it certainly discouraged output. Employment might be a more ambiguous thing. And of course, it's harmed consumers. So I think it's pretty bad news all around, except for management. <laughs> Draw that to close, we'll be ready for our next online presentation. But please thank William Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, for joining us. Wave if you can hear me. Good. Yeah, I can hear you. Excellent. So we're going to let you start right away, everyone. Professor Lisa Hill from the University of Adelaide uh, and a one of the leading um, Smith experts in Adelaide, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> mm. Well, that damn with faint praise. Is that Alan Bannon talking? I can't see anybody. I've got my, my screen shared. You, you, can't, Alan? you can't see anything. Is that what you said? No, I can't see anything. I can only see my screen at this point. Okay. Okay. So far away. All right. Thanks. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, it's my pleasure to join you and to talk about Adam Smith. Here's my book. And um, I'm talking about Adam Smith's conception of welfare and happiness today, uh, which he significantly sort of uh, reformed um, in terms of how happiness or how welfare was conceived in, in his time. And um, also with the complications around how we would get welfare. Um, and he, he had a lot to say and he was extremely influential in um, modernising the science of the legislator. So... Um, he wanted to, to say, uh, say to his reader, look, how, how can we modernise the way we govern commercial populations? What is the best way to manage them? And what goals should we now be pursuing? And he thought the goals that the state had been pursuing at the time were the wrong ones. So he asked himself the questions, what were the chief tasks before the state? And, and why should these be the chief tasks? What had to change in order for the state to succeed? What was wrong with how things were going? How should success now be achieved and measured? And what role did the system of natural liberty play in this success? And then what was the role of the state? Now, for most people, the answer would be that the, the system of natural liberty can do most of the work. In fact, it's not doing as much work as you might think. And what happens when you start to look at how Smith solves these problems and answers these questions is you start to get a kind of a um, conflicting picture. Uh, my questions when I'm looking at the way Adam Smith's asking and, and answering new questions are these. How radical or reformist was he in approaching all, all of these questions he was asking? Because some um, scholars in the literature think that he was quite radical and they say that he wasn't even committed to the commercial system. So I ask myself these questions as I go along. Was he still committed to the commercial system? How libertarian really was he? Uh, some people think he's far more interventionist and redistributionist than I think he was. And I'm also asking and trying to solve the riddle of whether the apparent contradictions around the respective roles of the system of natural liberty and the formal state can be reconciled. And I, I attempt a kind of a reconciliation towards the end of this talk. So he wanted to reconstruct the science of public management. So what he had to do first was reject the standard accounts that were afloat in his time, mainly the classical ones and the neoclassical ones, also the Machiavellian and Hobbesian ones. They, were, they weren't working because they only understood things from the perspective of elites and he wanted a more bottom-up um, science. And also they confined, confined their attention to things that he think thought were worthless, military conquest, perpetuating the power and extending the glory of the state. Um, and, and all of this without much regard to the human and financial cost. He also thought they were too virtue-focused, especially the neoclassical um, approaches. You know, who cares if the public are virtuous uh, and who cares if the rulers are virtuous? Better that they be competent and impartial. And, of course, impartiality <laughs> did become a virtue, but it wasn't a classical virtue. They didn't have to be beneficent. They just had to be competent. And he constantly complained of the way the British state was managed and also about the imperial project, which he thought was pointless and wasteful and um, it impoverished the people because of the taxation it required. It corrupted the government, it destabilised the economy and it brought a lot of suffering on its victims. And so he thought that the way British elites were pursuing national greatness was the opposite of welfare enhancement. 
and a lot had to change. So I think he broke quite important ground in how, how and why statecraft needed a major overhaul. So here I'm trying to explore the goals and peculiarities of his method and how he redefined this concept of welfare and the whole idea of how we should think of a state as being successful. What is a successful state? And I understand this by looking at his solutions to the pressing problems of his day, alleviation of poverty, food insecurity, social and economic inequality, smuggling and the declining levels of education. These are the problems he thought uh, the state should be focused on and these are the problems he was focused on. <laughs> and what's interesting about these cases is that they were all issues that tested the limits of Smith's faith in both the market and the state. He seems to shift around a lot in a quite confusing way about who's going to solve this problem. And some of what he said has even led some people to misread Smith as either a radical left thinker or a cold-hearted ultra-right thinker. And I think both of those are misreadings for, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. But as we work through the solutions he comes up with, we see him sort of switching back and forth between um, collective and individual level solutions or, or state solutions and market solutions. So I'm addressing that tension here. And the limits of his faith in the market are a focus as well. The question is how good is natural liberty at delivering the welfare that Smith wants? But first of all, he had to redefine success and, and he redefined it in the direction of welfare, not the national aggrandizement. So we should think about what the state should be doing in a whole different way it's not glory, it's basic standards of living. The wealth of nations consists not in public virtue, gold stockpiles, a favourable balance of trade or the extent of conquered territories as, as the elites in his time were defining it, but in more human and material terms, as the people themselves experience it and would define it, as the people on the ground, the average person. So the, the wise legislator's got to ask her, him or herself a whole new set of questions. Do the people enjoy sufficient freedom, security, and stability. Are they tolerably well fed, clothed and lodged? Is the population growing or declining? Uh, thinkers in his time in the Scottish Enlightenment were starting to measure national success by the, the size of the population. Had infant mortality rates risen to unconscionable levels? Was infanticide becoming a bit too common? And Smith really had a real uh, abhorrence about infanticide, thinking, you know, something's really wrong here if people are, are killing their own children. And this is a sign that the market's, uh, that the, that the society's going backwards. Also, were the people being paid enough? So I'll talk a little bit about um, minimum wage in a minute uh, around the question that was raised in the last session. Um, and could they live with dignity? Meaning it's not enough to have enough to eat. You have to have enough that you can hold your head in public and not be ashamed. You have to have a pair of shoes, for example, so that you're not ashamed to go out. And, and so he's very alert to our, our social needs for recognition and acceptance. And then he asked this question, which economists weren't really that interested in or anybody wasn't that interested in, were the people happy? And he thought, he said, look, this is a perfectly legitimate question for political economists to be posing. And he always came back to that question when he assessed any public policy. This imbues himself with a quite surprisingly utilitarian flavour uh, because we have, you know, we traditionally think of Smith as kind of a liber libertarian or a liberal, but he's quite utilitarian. So, And this introduces a lot of confusions. So anyway, his idea of happiness uh, isn't a kind of a moral or virtue-focused sense. It's, it's quite ma material, worldly, on the ground. And if we don't have enough to eat and a roof over our head and... Uh, enough for a little bit of for some chocolate or something nice or a hot chocolate in a cafe, you know, what's the point of living? And if we want to have a, a flourishing and a happy society, we've just got to have these basic things in our life because we were made as human beings to experience the natural joy of prosperity and we actually were given self-regarding drives by the divine architecture with that purpose in mind to experience the natural joy of prosperity and to survive and to prosper and also to perpetuate ourselves as a, as a species who's very interested in reproduction and population levels. So how is this happiness going to be achieved? What is this science of the legislator for which Smith's quite um, famous? Well, in his time and up until that time for millennia, uh, in political science, people were always coming up with these 
the idealized models. There was always a taxonomy, like the famous Aristotelian taxonomy, or Platonic theories about what the state should be doing, and, and they were all ideal models. He said, look, these are great. Perfecting these models is nice. It's, it's, it's a noble enterprise. Uh, but in the end, it doesn't matter, and it's probably a bad idea to be tr trying to be too perfect because all constitutions of government are only as good as their tendency to promote the happiness of those who live under them. In fact, this is their sole end and use. If they're not delivering the happiness of those who live under them, then you should rethink the model you're using. So policy must always be made in context and in terms of conditions on the ground. How is it affecting people down there? And also these models should take account of the rise of modern trade and manufacture, as um, Fania Oz Salzberger has pointed out perceptively. You know, a lot of these models, almost all of them, weren't taking account of the fact that we're talking about a commercial society now, we're talking about a mass society now. So he wanted to produce a political science for modern times that embodied, of course, universal principles that you could safely adopt, but also they should have principles of expediency that a government could use to regulate the social order but more importantly, to ensure that the advantages of living in political union together were as distributed as evenly as possible throughout the whole society. You don't want you don't want a lot of wealth inequalities. You don't you want you don't want just some people experiencing freedom or comfort. You should have it distributed as evenly as is possible throughout the society. So, it sounds a lot like the great school for the greatest number because it is. But this also, as I've mentioned, introduces a lot of um, tensions in his thought. And I think overall his main thought is this. Maximising liberty will promote liberty and welfare. Natural liberty is a real thing and he really believes in it. He thinks it's a system of natural laws that's floating around there like the laws of uh, gravity. But sometimes in order to maximise welfare, you're going to have to think outside the natural liberty box. It was all about positive results, not just liberal pr principles. And he talked tough about liberty, and I'll, I'll give some examples when he talks tough about liberty, but then as soon as it's not delivering uh, what he wants, these observable, measurable, positive ends, he will just um, turn his back on liberty and, and seek another solution. So liberty wasn't the be all and end all for Smith. It was a means to an end. And this sometimes gives his approach a bit of an ad hoc appearance. He'll say, look, let's let the system of natural liberty solve this problem. And they'll turn around, there's another one who goes, oh, we, we need a state solution. He seems to be making it up as he goes along. Um, in a way, he has. He is. He's saying you have to be practical, you have to be flexible. Uh, but I'll, I'll explain how the, that kind of made-up look can be reconciled towards the end. So back to this idea of the welfare of the people. The state has two urgent objects uh, that, it, uh, that it has to perform. It has to, and this is, and political economy has to explain to the state how it's got to do it. First of all, it's got to enrich and provide for the people, but more properly he means to enable them to provide such a revenue or subsistence for themselves, meaning you've got to provide the conditions that enables people to look after themselves take away all impediments that are preventing them from being independent. Second, you've also got to supply the Commonwealth with, a, with enough uh, revenue for the public services. So that's an important function. There have to be public services. Now, the indicators he used to test how well states were, were succeeding or achieving the, these objects were all welfare-focused, not glory-focused. Was there enough food supply? Was the population growing? Productivity and employment levels were important. General living conditions, education standards, wage levels, child mortality rates, and even the ability to live with social dignity. These were all the indicators he used. He wanted a society that could deliver human flourishing, that promoted happiness and guarded against misery. It sounds so utilitarian. It actually also sounds highly Epicurean, and it is. It's a kind of weird fusion between liberal values and and Epicurean values and utilitarian values. He was very concerned about begging independency. He hated dependency and he valued independence very highly, he thought it was the, the, the greatest quality, character um, quality in a person. And it was the state's job to make sure that people enjoy high levels of independence and personal and economic mobility. Anything that got in the way 
of their personal and economic mobility was probably something caused by a state or else inappropriate actions of monopolies and they should be removed. Most people are perfectly capable of looking after themselves if only they were given the freedom to get on with it. Although um, I think he was quite blind to the needs of those with unchosen dependencies. He just seems to miss that point. But we can see his point about dependence and he certainly did care about the poor. Um, But the sort of mixed messages he sends has has led to readings of Smith as either a left-leaning Smith or an ultra-right-leaning Smith. So, for example, on the ultra-right side, it's been said that Smith is indifferent to the poor and is prepared to let the market do its worst with little constraint. And I think his attitude was a bit more complicated than that. He did have great faith in markets to assist the poor most of the time, but he wasn't indifferent to them and he did not believe the market got the job done all the time. And he, he sort of sometimes failed quite spectacularly. Others, however, have described his political economy as radical and even revolutionary in its attitude to commerce and the poor, meaning that he wanted to move past commerce, that he hated commerce, and he wanted to uh, eradicate poverty and inequality. Um, that wasn't. That's not true either. His politics could never be described as radical in that ideological sense. Uh, he was quite critical of many aspects of commercialism and class privilege, but his critique was far from revolutionary. Neither of those things should be transcended. He loved commercialism. He thought it was the answer to a lot of things that were wrong in the world. And class privilege, even though it annoyed him, it had functions, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the thing about commercialism that he liked was its capacity to provide for the poor. So he tried to help the poor by exerting influence on successive reform movements for taxation, uh, food security, mass education, higher wages and labour laws. And he was uh, you know, a violent critic of many entrenched but welfare negating practices such as the poor laws, the settlement laws. Uh, as was mentioned in the last presentation, it was impeding people's movement uh, to, to seek work. And they were pushed back to their parishes and then made dependent on parishes and it was just a terrible system, he thought. He also had a religious interference in politics, political corruption. He, he wrote a lot about political corruption, how much he hated it. He disliked the archaic laws controlling inheritance and workers' rights and the extravagant public debt was something he never stopped complaining about. And these were all violations of the system of natural liberty. And so uh, one example of uh, of violations of the natural liberty are suppressed wages. So I'll talk about that for a little bit. So he called, he was was the um, most prominent high wage advocate of, of his time probably. To those who objected to his call for high wages, and many did, he responded that no society can be flourishing and happy, of which the greater part of the members are poor and miserable. By definition, he said, national opulence is the opulence of the whole people, not the few. And quite right. He sort of said, the the workers are the ones producing the wealth. This is not really equitable. And he was contradicting the utility of poverty doctrine, which was a mercantilist doctrine that basically... Uh, reason that if you give workers starvation wages, they'll work harder, they'll be more industrious. And there were also moralists that said if you gave workers enough to buy, uh, to have more more than enough to eat, they'll spend the money on alcohol and luxuries and this would corrupt them. Smith thought this was very silly. Uh, it's not very probable, he said, that men in general should work better than when they're, when they're ill-fed than when they're well-fed. And he also said that if you have really low wages, this will drive people to begging and a life of crime. And that's that's terrible. But where there are fair wages, a life of crime will be irrational. Nobody will be so mad as to expose himself upon the highway when he can make better bread in an honest and industrious manner. It's pretty hard to disagree with Smith there. And apart from these utility and public order considerations, this utility of poverty doctrine also constituted an obnoxious violation of the system of natural liberty. So this is why he's disagreeing with it. It's interfering with uh, with what he called the natural wage. And he doesn't say a lot about it, but he says enough. He defined the natural wage as a subsistence wage for both the worker and his family in order to ensure that the race of workmen lasted beyond the first generation. So we know it's a natural wage because... It's, it's natural that, the, 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 that we should have la- adequate labour supply to meet uh, demand. So, and if you don't f- 
pay people enough to feed their family and the, the family dies of starvation or people commit infanticide, there's your sign that you're not paying them enough. So that's how we worked out what the natural wage was. Some people have thought uh, his sympathy for the poor extended to uh, advocating a right for them to organise, and uh, he doesn't. But He looks like he's saying that, but he's really not if you read it carefully. What he's criticising is the unequal bargaining power of workers and employers. So he's saying that the natural wage has been suppressed by the ability of the employers to combine or organise, but the inability of workers to, to meet that organisation. He says, whenever workers push for high wages, it's not difficult to see who's going to win. The employers will, or masters will win because they're fewer in number and then they can buy more easily. But worse than that, the state always supports them, partly because they're able to hide that, that they've been combining, um, but also because the state always punishes workers when they try and organise, it never punishes the employers. He says, that's unfair. The state's supposed to... Um, dispense justice impartially. Um, some people have thought that Smith's saying that the, this asymmetry should be corrected through legislation or else by allowing workers to unionise. No, he's not saying that. He's only saying that the law should be dealt impartially. That is, both should be prosecuted. And he's so averse to the idea of combinations that he says some kind of weird things. Uh, first of all, he says there should not be a regulation that obliges all of those in the same trade to record their names and addresses on a public register. So there shouldn't be sort of uh, industry organisations because this would allow others in the industry a direction where to find every other man of it, thereby enabling them to assemble and combine. And he goes even further in what I think is really kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. He says that industries should also not have to provide for their poor, their sick, their widows and their orphans because this would give them some common interest to manage. They, they'd all have each other's names and addresses. This would give them a uh, means to assemble, which he says is an invitation to conspire against the public. So this is this is Smith in this in a very high natural liberty mood where he's saying, look, just let the market operate. There can be no combinations. There can be no organising by anyone. But he still cared about the average person, even though we've just seen him in a particularly callous mood. He really cares about the average person. I would say that his concern with food security uh, is his main reason uh, for advocating free trade. And he said the unlimited and unrestrained freedom of the corn trade was the only way to prevent a famine and to remediate a famine. That's how powerfully he believed in the system of natural liberty. If people are going hungry, we can remedy that problem if we just take away uh, all restrictions and the state doesn't try and interfere to correct the situation. And he said the task of political economy is to find ways of improving the per capita consumption of the labouring classes. And, of course, he says the mercantilists are very wrong in conceiving non-consumables like gold as a source of wealth. I mean, a lot of it's common sense, but it's, it's quite amazing how uncommonsensical uh, economic thinking could be in that time. He says it's the, it's the consumptibility of a thing that makes it useful. And opulence consists not in money, uh, or military might, but in the abundance of the necessaries and conveniences of life, as well as their cheapness, of course. There should be plenty to eat and it should be affordable. So we can get welfare by expanding liberty, says Smith. And so within the Smithian system, there's generally only this restrained night watchman state. And that restrained, and, and after that state's there, the market's assumed to deliver welfare. And um, he had such deep faith, and now I'm just trying to create that sense of tension between his faith in the market and then uh, the contradictions about that faith. But in, in this mood here, he has such faith in the market that he tolerated illegal and even immoral practices such as smuggling and the selling of dirty degrees on the grounds that they were simply rational reactions to egregious legal restrictions on this system of natural liberty. The smuggler has not violated the more sacred laws of natural justice, which is free trade. They're probably quite a good person, but the state has made a crime which nature never meant it to be so. They're just trying to make a dollar. They're just trying to trade. And then I think uh, he goes too far here and draws quite a long bow when he says, um, I can see his point with smuggling with degree selling, you know, I'm not so sure. 
He said, degree selling is just something the poor universities rationalistic in, rationalistically engage in so as to turn the penny in a market improperly and, and unnaturally oligopolised by Oxford and Cambridge. <laughs> so that's the more familiar Smith, the natural liberty Smith, but the story's actually more complicated in which we start to work through these welfare problems um, that I foreshadowed at the beginning of the paper. Uh, we start to see him kind of wavering about how much of that welfare can be delivered by uh, the market. And we see that his consequentialist tendencies start to show and he's prepared to trespass on liberty when a good consequence um, is not being delivered by the market. So first of all, we see that his consequentialism wins with the, um, the three famous exceptions to the system of natural liberty, and I won't go through them too much, uh, well at all, but I'll just mention them because everyone's familiar with them. The state needs to provide defence, it needs to, to provide justice and police, and it needs to provide infrastructure. These are collective action problems that the state needs to address. What I find interesting is that Smith never explains why the system of natural liberty leaves these quite large and inconvenient gaps in this what he otherwise posits as a self-ordering human verse, self-ordering human um, universe. And instead of explaining, he simply fills these gaps with his own constructive remedy, such as his fourth function, which is often left off the menu of Smith's main functions. And this is his recommendation that we establish a publicly funded education system to arrest declining literacy levels that have been brought on uh, by sending out children at an early age to work. This only happens in the commercial age. It doesn't happen in previous stages of economic development. And now I've got people to turn a penny that they're sending their kids, instead of sending them to school, they send them straight up <laughs> the chimneys and straight into the factories. He said, this is terrible. You've got now an illiterate population. And actually at one point I did check to see if literal, literacy levels had declined as Smith had thought, and they had um, during this period. But this illiterate population is, is not very adaptive for a commercialising economy. People should be able to read and write and, and, and add up. Uh, but it's also it's quite an unproductive and morally under, underdeveloped population. And it's disorderly. It's very disorderly. School is where we learn manners and how to behave ourselves, you think. So um, we've got a problem here. So we should have a publicly funded school system. Now, this scheme sits uncomfortably with the system of natural liberty because it's both strictly compulsory and publicly funded. This is really doesn't sound like the Smith we were just talking about. And it has these other illiberal aspects to it, this scheme. It embodies an admission that commercial progress isn't always positive, that markets and negative liberty sometimes fail to equilibrate the system, that there are these collective action problems that require the attentions of a coordinating and coercive state. And probably most importantly, it's a significant form of redistribution because it's available only to the children of the poor. Smith actually says, well, the rich have got lots of money, let them send their kids to eat and what do I care? But the poor, the rich should pay for the, basically subsidise the education of the poor. And there's lots of other examples of constructivist interventions that's, that Smith puts into his system, such as temporary monopolies in the case of inventions, navigation acts that were mentioned before. There's a whole list, and Jacob Vine has made a list, and other people have made lists at various times. But you might put in a temporary monopoly for someone that's just written a, a, an important book so somebody won't plagiarise it. And Smith says these are all justified by reference to their good effects, their utility, their necessity, their tendency to facilitate commerce in general. But what I find curious is he never shows any willingness to speculate on why the economic system is failing to fully self-equilibrate. At other times he seems so confident that the system of natural liberty will work and then, then he'll suggest an extraordinary measure without explaining why suddenly we need this. And also he doesn't seem particularly embarrassed about that on one hand it kind of bugs me on the other hand I think good on you you are Adam Smith after all <laughs> and so so then I started to think about this question how much redistribution is there in Smith when he's trying to deal with the problems of social inequality and poverty now I've seen some people claim that he's so concerned with the poor and moral egalitarianism that he advances a distributive theory of justice based in turn on a mooted right to subsistence well, first of all, there's no right to subsistence in Smith. That's, that's not true. And I don't think he is that concerned with distributive justice anyway, uh, in principle, 
even though he does do some redistribution. So what I mean to say by that is he rejects the theory of distributive justice uh, but still turns around and does it. Mm -hmm. Now, he's usually on the side of workers, producers and consumers, so I can see why people might think there might be redistribution there. And he does want to create a policy framework that results in this equitable distribution of benefits throughout the entire society. But this does not equate to equal redistribution. It is not substantive equality that Smith wants. He is a true liberal in this way. It's formal equality or equality of opportunity that he's after. We just remove all systems of preference and restraint and we don't adopt a distributive theory of justice. He, he says quite explicitly, I am not a distributive justice guy. I'm a commutative justice guy, which means I'm just in favour of justice that uh, enforces positive laws about um, theft, honouring contracts, that sort of thing. So he's very natural liberty in that respect, or so it seems. So, so now you're probably sitting there thinking, Lisa, your paper's very confusing, back and forth, back and forth. This is the uh, impression I'm trying to create because I'm presenting the Smith to you that's back and forth. In general... And in principle, he says, I'm not for redistribution, but there are exceptions in his system where he says the, the rich should pay proportionally more tax than the poor, with the explicit proviso that they get excess be redistributed. So here we see consequences trumping that natural liberty. I've given already the example of public education. This is other example where you have a high road toll on carriages of luxury. He's really annoyed by people poncing around in their luxurious cab, you know, carts and, and wagons. Um, I mean, sorry, they're, they're, they're luxury uh, carriages. It's clogging up the major in infrastructure of the society and, and they should be taxed for it. Um, and th he also says there, there should be a tax on house rents. If you've got a big house, you should pay more tax. And then he says, this isn't very reasonable, is it? And I think, oh, he's going to give us an explanation while we're going to tax the rich for their big houses. But he doesn't give us an explanation. He just says, look, I'm not being very unreasonable, am I, that they should um, pay more because they've got a bigger house? That's not an explanation. He just, just saying something's reasonable is not actually a substantive explanation. Anyway, although there's some redistribution, and not a lot, but there is some, Smith did not want to eradicate inequality, as has been claimed, as well as um, lots of other things about the so-called left Smith. And one of them is that he wanted to eradicate inequality. He did not. He gives that impression because he's, he finds the um, indolent rich very annoying. He loves the middle classes, the bustling middle classes and the workers, and he finds the indolent rich very annoying. He thinks that they're parasites, pests of society, a fish who devours up all the lesser ones. And he says all these things about them, and then he says, look, oh, I know they're annoying, but they have their uses because they serve a number of vital system functions. So we need social stratification, especially in a commercial society. We need them first because the consumption habits of the ultra-rich provide employment for multitudes of workers, so that's a trickle-down effect, which is only a small aspect of wealth in Smith's model. Second, their conspicuous consumption provides a powerful incentive to the productive efforts of the lower aspirational classes who look up to them. They don't really resent them, they look up to them and they aspire to be them. So we need someone to model that ultra-rich conspicuous consumption so the workers will strive to get a little bit of that conspicuous consumption. Third, the indolent rich are a mainstay of social order. They're a very important part of, of um, civil society, especially in these mass commercial societies of strangers. Smith doesn't want the police running around all the time um, ordering people and policing people. This is why classes are so handy. They're already there and people already respect the upper classes. They respect the class system. They'll do what anybody in the higher, in, in the level above them tells them to do. And this actually creates um, order and forestalls confusion and misrule. If you don't have that regular subordination, you'll have a very unruly population. And it's already there, intimately and in, in, implicated throughout the social structure. You don't need that in barbarous and poor societies, but you do need it in a mass society. So he doesn't want to eradicate inequality. His main goal, as Dennis Rasmussen has pointed out, is only to eradicate abs uh, relative poverty. I'm uh, sorry, absolute poverty. 
Absolute poverty has to go. People have to have enough to eat. They have to have some shoes. They have to have shelter. But relative poverty is actually a good thing. It is adaptive. So natural liberty wins again. Confused? Yes, it's confusing. How come he can change his mind back and forth? I think we can't expect Smith to change. We have to change our uh, way of thinking about Smith. And we should think of him not so much as a hardline economic liberal, as a pragmatic, consequentialist or strategic liberal. It's not liberty but the good life and how to achieve it for the greatest number. Uh, that was his ultimate commitment. In general, he did think the liberal approach was the best one, that, 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 a, that a, uh, a small state was the best way to get there, but only in general. Hence his inconsistent commitment to negative liberty. At times his defence of liberty seems really perverse, for example, defending the selling of dirty degrees or not allowing for any state intervention during a famine. But there are other times when liberty is surrendered without even a second thought to the demands of um, utility. And he offers us no clear or even vague rule for when the state should interfere or whether it should not interfere. You can't predict when this is going to happen. You might say, well, whenever there's a collective action problem, but that's not an answer. Why is the collective action problem there in the first place is the question, and he never answers that. So that's the million-dollar question. Why in his discussions of how government should behave did he so often stray from his advertised commitment to natural liberty? And is his system too contradictory to, to be coherent? And I'll just reflect on maybe it not being incoherent in the last couple of minutes. I think it's possible to conceptually reconcile the need for an active coordinating state operating alongside the system of natural liberty if we bear the following four things in mind, some of which are log logical reconstructions, from, from Smith's general system, but most of which are from things he actually explicitly says. First, all the state interventions approved by Smith are either straightforward collective action problems we might expect in an advanced society or else solutions to negative externalities that are created by commercial progress. In other words, they are all natural problems in a sense and signs that the economy <coughs> is heading in the right direction. We would naturally expect this to happen and that they all stand in need of a coordinating and even coercive state is equally natural for the following reason. Because the organised state is not an artificial phenomenon. It is a natural phenomenon. It emerged spontaneously. It's part of the spontaneous order system that Smith writes so much about. So, so his theory of markets does not just apply to the economic realm. It applies to every aspect of human existence. And the state emerged spontaneously as societies became more prosperous and property started to need to be secured. And then people more, we needed justice and police of property. And we needed lots of the state to do lots of other stuff as well. The more the society becomes uh, prosperous, the more the state has to step in. And that happens naturally and even independent of the consideration of that necessity. He means you don't have to think about it. You don't have to rationalistically set up the state it just evolves spontaneously. It's an emergent phenomenon. So as societies become more complex, they're going to become more collective action problems to emerge for the state to manage. And thirdly, and, and relatedly to that point, Smith himself says that in advanced societies, which themselves are natural, it's commercial progress is natural because commerce and, uh, and uh, progress um, is a product of natural urges, natural progressive urges. These commercial societies are really complicated and expensive to manage. He says, look, there's so many expenses in a civilised country. You need your, the new, in the previous stages, you need your armies, your fleets, your fortified palaces, your public buildings, your judges, your officers. It, all this stuff we need now, and the state has to provide it, and if they're neglected, disorder will ensue, so we must have them. So expect that to happen. And fourth, Smith's aversion to the oversized intrusive state was not absolute. They have to, it has to be appreciated in the context of the way the English state was constituted and managed in his time. And in his time, it was managed very, very poorly. And it was full of corruption. He thought it was a shambles. But a reformed, naturalised version might be something different. When he's objecting to any profusion of government, I think he's referring to an 18th century state that was very bloated 
and oversized uh, because it was full of corruption. It was full of people on pensions and sinecures. Some of these sinecures went on after people died and the family inherited them. There were all these people who were parasitical on the state and on the public purse that weren't actually doing anything. So he saw that the, st the bigger the state, the greater the quantity of corruption. And when he's talking about reducing the size of the state, he's talking about reducing the degree of corruption, the potential for corruption. The large state is the size and cause of corruption. So in his time, I think corruption rather than big government per se was his chief target when he limits the reach and functions of the state. But as societies advanced, a state could still be healthy and extensive as so long as there was a development-induced um, justification for each addition to its functions and size. So to conclude, I think the moral of Smith's story and, and my story here today is that he was committed to both commercialism and liberty with the important proviso that, look, liberty's great, it works, until it doesn't, and that's okay too. So judicious state intervention was sometimes both a necessary and predictable aspect of the system of natural liberty. Now I better stop. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Lisa. That was magnificent. And particularly to broaden out the discussion a bit from focusing on essential features to the complexity and richness of ideas that are in, in, almost inevitably at odds with one another at various points and so on. I hope you're standing by to take some questions if we happen to have some. Uh, so I, I will go around the room. And we'll take one back here. Hi, Lisa. Uh, thank you for your talk. That was really enjoyable and insightful. Uh, my question is, uh, just out of general interest, uh, how much did Adam Smith's ideas uh, influence the writing of the US um, Declaration of Independence and their idea of the pursuit of, of life, liberty, and happiness in their state? Can the person talking put up their hand? I can't see who's talking. Oh, sorry. Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, I haven't done a lot of work on that aspect of Smith's thought, but he uh, he's said to have been prof uh, profoundly influenced uh, the Founding Fathers. He was quite friendly with Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin was always popping over to England and, and Scotland, and then we know they met. But uh, they, they worshipped Smith. They adored him. So he would have had uh, quite a strong influence on them. And as you know, Smith's a really important thinker in America, far more than in Britain, I would say, now, today. Thank you. William, did you have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, Lisa, I enjoyed the talk very much, but I, I do believe you misrepresented Smith on Hammond. I don't hmm. believe he ever opposed state intervention with respect to famine because, and this is really respect important, what? intervention with respect to famine because in the world of famine, he only contends that there will be no famine under a system of natural liberty. End of story. Under a system of natural liberty, no famine. So how can there be any point in a state intervention in famine when under the system of natural liberty, there will be no famine? There will be births or shortages, as we would say, but there will be no famine. Yeah, I, I can't see how we're disagreeing. I think, it's a, I think it's a subtle disagreement, Lisa. Um, yeah, I'm agreeing with you. That's what Smith says. There'll be no famine uh, under a system of natural liberty. But if there is one, uh, the state shouldn't be interfe interfere. But, yeah, I don't, I don't see where, how we're disagreeing. Well, well, there's only one because of some state interference. That's what he's saying. His own state interference creates full facts. That's what he's saying. He also says the interference of private interests like monopolies. Monopolies can create famines as well. Well, that's the East India Company. That's right. Next question. Thank you very much, Lisa. Very much, very enjoyable and very interesting. Um, Smith was a Scot, assume a Presbyterian. Would you have any ideas as to the extent of his religious context, even if not his religious beliefs, and the Protestantism in which he was brought up influenced his ideas and his conclusions about society, economics, commercialism, and the relationship of the poor to society as a whole. 
Well, that's a great question. Uh, he was raised a Presbyterian, as you say. I don't think he believed in necessarily Presbyterian values. I think I think he was spiritual. I think he was a, a Stoic. I think he thought the system of natural liberty was designed by a benevolent creator. And uh, he's very, very Protestant in the way that he displaces Christian virtues uh, or traditional Christian beneficent and compassion virtues with Protestant virtues, the ones that Ben Franklin also liked, probity, punctuality, uh, frugality, uh, industry. He was very Protestant in that way. Um, in his attitude to the poor, he did not like charity. He disliked it intensely. Although I found out recently, secretly, he I wondered where his wealth or had gone to because he was quite wealthy. He'd given it secretly away to the poor. But he was he disliked charity because he thought it was undignified and that everyone should be able to earn their own living. The poor should be able to look after themselves. And so he didn't like these, uh, didn't like begging. He didn't he didn't think anyone should live off compassion. And the Christian virtues were rather um, useless virtues. He liked the Protestant. Please. Thank you very much, Lisa. Next question. Uh, Anna, um, Alan, just, I just remembered something about the Founding Fathers. I just remembered that he'd advise, I wrote a paper on it and I've forgotten about it, on American independence. And he was advising the American government, uh, the, the British government to let, secretly, to let America go. And the Americans would have known about that. He, he, he was a little unpopular. But also you can see it in the, towards the end of the Wealth of Nations, the last paragraphs of the Wealth of Nations talk about American independence. And he just thought in Britain holding on to America was mad. And that's why the, one of the reasons the Americans loved him so much. Sorry, there's another question. Uh, Lisa here. Thank you very much. Um, Tony this morning kicked off um, reminding us all that, you know, Adam Smith, like everybody, is a person in their own time and must be understood what they're saying. And I think you've alluded to that several times. So... Yeah. When he wrote Wealth of Nations, private governance was very embryonic. Um, I mean, it, I can't remember exact date, but private business were essentially illegal. Um, so many of the tools that may well provide the solutions in natural liberty and, and markets really weren't developed in his time. So it's not surprising that um, he can't find ready solutions in the market or in liberty, so he goes to the state. And that tension, I think, is is always been there and it's good. I, I missed the last sentence in your last slide, but taking Smith's clear preference, it would seem, for commercial and market solutions wherever possible, um, the state provides solutions until liberty or the market finds an alternative solution. Surely Smith would have been open to that concept because the flip side, if, if he's not open to that, and we see this all the time, that states have a propensity to just grow, grow, grow. Um, mm. Now and then we see them try and outsource or give service provision back to the private sector when there's clear evidence that that capacity is there. So do you think Smith would have been open to that, that statement that I just made about the state provides until there's clear solutions have been innovate, through innovation and so forth have been developed uh, in the non-government sector? Uh, if you're asking what is the default solution to social problems, the market is the default solution for Smith, I think, the problem solver, and then the state comes after. But the thing is, you know, you make a good point, Evan. He's just muddling through. He's he's in the middle of it, and there's so much change around him. Um, he's not sure how things are going to go. It's always like, bear with me, I'm <laughs> trying to work this through. But but if if your your question was, what's the default solution? Uh, that's always going to be the market, I think, for Smith. Is that is that your question though? Uh, yeah, that's that's, that's my, my conclusion. Yeah, I just said that yours in what you said. Um, yeah, that, okay. That doesn't preclude, of course. I mean, when there's, I mean, I don't believe it's not a market failure, but if there's perception of market failure, the state is the, the, the provider of last resort service provision until a commercial. Um, and of course, if the commercial will never deliver the solution, then the fault is going to continue to start. I get that. 
Thanks, Doug. Mm. We're going to go to a question at the back next. Just going to the uh, question that I think someone asked a bit earlier about his background and from the Presbyterian Church from Scotland. Scotland's one of the few countries that have still got free education at the university sector compared to the rest of us who've got HEX and all the rest of it. I'm just interested in your comments in relation to that about access to education and fairness. And I'm also interested in your comments around Medicare and health, because um, you talked about justice and those things, about what Smith would have thought about access to universal health care versus the American system. Well, I don't like to try and mind read Smith, and um, but <clears throat> and you know that that question would require me to insert Smith into the modern world, <clears throat> which would have given him a terrible fright, to be honest. <laughs> but um, I, I don't think he would think there should be universal health care. I, I really don't know what he would have said about contemporary problems. We do know that he thought education should be. And he was only talking about up to a kind of primary school, you know, rudimentary education. <clears throat> so it's, it's hard to say what he would have said about a university education. It kind of wasn't on the cards even in that world, in that mindset. It wasn't, a, it wasn't something you'd think about for um, working class people or perhaps even middle class people, even though he himself was <clears throat> middle class but exceptionally gifted, so he was on a scholarship. So um, I don't think he would have been for uh, free healthcare or for free tertiary education. He might have been, but it's just hard, hard to know and I wouldn't really want to speak on his behalf. But he's a free market guy, number one. We shouldn't kid ourselves. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for your talk. Um, I first come across uh, Adam Smith when I was looking at Division of Labour and I was very interested in his, the area where he was a very small section where he spoke about the detrimental mental effects of division of labour of repeating the same task over and over again. Uh, could I have a comment on that? <clears throat> well, yeah, that's how I started off with Smith, actually. I wrote my honours thesis on division of labour. Um, it, it was, of course, a groundbreaking analysis of the bad effects of the division of labour yeah. and influence marks. Uh, it was uh, along with Adam Ferguson's explanation. <clears throat> and some people have thought it made him kind of Marxoid because he was so critical of the division of labour. But actually, specialisation is the, the motor of growth and innovation. It's just a bad side effect. You're always going to get these negative externalities of commercial progress. And this is just, just another one of them. This isn't enough to kill the system or to turn Smith off it. You just apply remedies. And, and, and free public education is one of the remedies for uh, division of labour. So is his idea that we should have lots of religious sects, not one, but lots of li little re religious organisations to kind of, um, as kind of uh, morality and, and order kind of institutions for the working poor. But, yeah, he, he does say some pretty negative things about the division of labour, but in the end he's committed to specialisation in a way that, it was the opposite of how Marx ran with it, wasn't it? To him, that it was a real deal breaker, but not a deal breaker for Smith. Thanks, Lisa. Question back there. Oh. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wondered about the conclusions, or if there are any conclusions that you could draw from Smith and his preference for a specific political system. So you mentioned that he shouldn't be taken as any kind of radical egalitarian. It's it, radical egalitarian but he did seem to favour groups being at least more equalised within a political union. And given that in the lead up for Smith's life, there was the oscillation between sort of parliament and monarchy. How do you, uh, how do you divide those between the two? There'd been a, been a uh, beheaded monarch at some point, but at the mm -hmm. same time, um, the stuff about the wealth, yeah, the elites, because of their wealth, they generate income that sort of creates jobs, presumably, for poorer people, which is kind of the sort of uh, tourist industry justification for the English monarchy these days. Did uh, Smith have a particular view about monarchy versus republicanism or the balance between parliament and the monarchy, or was he just flat out not interested in that at all? 
Thanks. That's a great question. There is a chapter in my book about that. <clears throat> he was not a Republican. And uh, in the 18th century, the word democracy uh, was a kind of a dirty word. It was equated with uh, mob rule. A, a person that was sort of democratically inclined would be a mixed monarchist. So most people in that time um, didn't advocate the universal suffrage, and Smith certainly didn't, but he, he did advocate a mixed monarchy. Um, so he was, but he was Whiggish, and that was a typical Whig position, so it was more left than right in that way. Uh, but he was not a, he was kind of a Democrat, but not a very enthusiastic one. The other thing to remember about Smith is he's very conservative. And this isn't because he doesn't think about things and he likes tradition. Uh, he doesn't particularly like tradition, but he hates any kind of radical, uh, sudden change because he's a spontaneous sort of theorist. Everything has to be emergent and has to be evolving in, in an evolutionary and emergent way. And so if you had a, suddenly had a revolution, that would be a terrible thing. And at that time, of course, the French Revolution was the thing that terrified most people in England, that the idea that you could over, have so much radical social change all at once. But very few people were, um, you know, strongly Republican. You would still be on leftish and, and be a mixed monarchist. So in answer to your question, he was a mixed monarchist with a pretty big democratic component in there, but it shouldn't be dominating things. It was okay for the for the lords to be there and it was okay for the monarchists to be there too, balancing each other out. Does that answer your question? I can answer the thumbs up. Yeah. Question here. Hi Lisa, thanks for that. Um, Adam Smith was very strong on natural liberty based on natural laws. And so if we think about population, I'll take it to today's, um, any species normally um, grows until, you know, it um, can no longer grow due to its environment. But that's not the case with the human population now. So, you know, in many ways we've gone against natural law because of our you know, medical science and, and our social systems. So would that mean that a lot of his doctrine would not apply today? Would what mean that a lot of the doctrine would not apply today? I'm not quite clear on the question. Yeah, we've gone against Can you take the mic back, yep. Alan? Laws. Sorry, I need this. I'm, I'm not sure what the question is. The, yeah. the, the, the sound's very bad, Alan, by the way. I can't quite hear. Yeah, because... A uh, population explosion has gone against natural laws because... Oh, population explosion, is that what you're talking about? Oh, yes, <laughs> and, and that has a lot to do with, you know, world hunger, the happiness of people. But we, we haven't confined ourselves to natural laws because, you know, uh, medical science and other things have allowed us to grow beyond that. Yes, no, I, I see your question. I didn't hear population in there. That's exactly what they would say. Uh, the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers who are spontaneous sort of thinkers, Adam Ferguson would say the same thing. If you've got a population explosion, something's gone wrong. Uh, but but um, they didn't really think you could have a, a population explosion because they preempted Malthus in that idea that a people populates up to its resources. Uh, and so... This idea of an explosion couldn't happen. Uh, so, but if it, I suppose if it did happen, they would say, "What the hell has happened here?" They, their problem was more that a declining population, a population in a, an expanding economy, should be growing. And if it's not growing, what's the problem? And why are we having infanticide? Their problem was uh, suppression of the population levels. Thanks, Lisa. We have a question from the gentleman standing over there. Uh, that mic's not working. That's working now. Um, yeah, John Fillmore here. Um, you talked at the very beginning about Smith's views on you know, the inefficiency of, colon of, of having colonies effectively in houses, not just bad for the American colony, or I assume also India, but also for the English. Of course, over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a lot of uh, analysts who argue that, you know, the West got rich 
from colonisation um, and from colonialism. So did Smith uh, maybe concede that sometimes that the you know the the, the home country you know, England actually did benefit from colonisation or, or not? No, he just sort of said with these colonies, it's constant war, even at a low level, because to keep these these people um, in obedience. You're having to set up forts, armies, they're constantly having uprisings. Plus the colonial um, project was all about mercantilism and monopolies and monopolising trade routes. Everything about it's wrong. And when you're colonising somebody, you're breaking a million different laws of the natural system of natural liberty. Everyone should be free to get on with their own beeswax. You should not be trying to control trade, control individual people, control how they... Uh, deploy their labour, anything like that. Um, so he, he actually thought it was costing Britain more money than it made Britain. Um, one thing that I find disturbing, though, it's an interesting question here, that he he kind of pretended that the slave slavery problem wasn't there. He talks about slavery as something terrible, but never once does he recommend abolition, and he never liked to talk about... Uh, well, I think he didn't like to talk about it because the reparation payments were going to be so high. He knew that. And I think that's why he didn't call for abolition, and I think that was an embarrassing oversight on his part. Do you think I've answered your question, or did you want to...? Um, we can probably discuss it later on this afternoon because uh, William talked a little bit about, um, not so much, but about the, the, the pluses and minuses, costs and benefits of um, having colonies. Uh, and it just, you know, it seems that Smith was certainly uh, emphasised costs, not just for the colonised, but also for those, the, the colonialised, the colonisers as well. So it just seems uh, interesting because now we often say that, you know, the West uh, often did benefit um, from the, that time. So... It's an empirical Not question as much. It's an empirical question as much as it is a uh, moral question. Yes, and an empirical on an empirical count, we there were no benefits, and on the moral grounds, and it's he was an economic cosmopolitan, so he just didn't believe in it. It, it, it was really maladaptive because he didn't just want wealth of nation; he wanted wealth of nations. Money should be moving around freely between nations, not just within Britain. So everything was wrong with it on every level for Smith. Lisa, thank you very much for your presentation, for taking all those questions, and we'll wind it up there. And please give Lisa a very generous thank you for that. <laughs> Fellow Smithians, I'm sure you will agree with me that we've had some great presentations so far. Um, no pressure on the following presenters at all to live up to that standard. Uh, I'm sure they will. Um, one thing I, it really dawned on me as we approach the next presentation is that we, there's been very little talk about the relationship between Adam Smith and other economists. I was going to schedule an evening session on um, uh, perhaps Ricardo or something, but we might, have, we might be too tired by then. But anyway, so we'll address that uh, deficiency to some extent in this upcoming presentation by Professor Michael McClure from UWA, and I shall hand over to him. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> um, I too would like to express my gratitude to the John Curtin Institute of Public Policy and Mankell Economics Education Foundation. It's a wonderful initiative, and it's a great pleasure to be here, especially so many people interested in you know, a great economist, perhaps the most celebrated economist in the history of economics. Now, I come to you primarily as a Pareto scholar. I, I teach history of economics. I'm obviously versed in the works of a Adam Smith, but my primary area of research is, is Pareto. What I thought I would do today is make a bit of a comparison between the two in part because it's the centenary of Pareto's death and that's been celebrated in parts of the world and it's also the tercentenary of Adam Smith's birth. But more importantly, because there's an obvious link that I'm curious about, which is why I started the, the research here. That is, Adam Smith is famous for um, two particularly great works, The Wealth of Nations and The Theory of Moral Sentiments. That is an economic work and a philosophical work about sentiments. 
Pareto too is famous for his work on economic theory uh, and for his work on what he calls general sociology, which is the study of sentiments. There's an overlap in topic between both of these people in that they both have works that follow economics proper and the study of sentiments. There's an intellectual reason to want to consider the two of them. For those in the audience who may not be aware of Pareto, Pareto's main contributions are, at least in the economic theory, to the introduction of, or the laying the foundation of rational choice theory. When you hear about rational choice theory, you have discussions about behaviour that's constant and, uh, and repeated under certain circumstances. These have their origins in Pareto and the ordinalist revolution in economic thought. We also are interested in Pareto in the criteria for welfare economics, with kind of the idea that there's a welfare improvement if at least one person gains and nobody loses, has its origins in the analysis of Pareto in defining what we call today the first theorem of welfare economics, and also for his contributions to applied studies, income inequality. So he's a major figure in his own right, but he's from a different era. He's writing at the beginning of the marginalist period or the neoclassical period, where Adam Smith is writing at the beginning of the classical period, at least from the English perspective. Okay, so I, given all the, that, I thought I'd start by briefly reflecting on what Pareto thought of Adam Smith's political economy. And then I want to move on to the main focus of the discussion, which is the discussion between Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments and Pareto's sociology. And in particular, within that theme, I want to emphasise the question of non-logical action, how you deal with non-logical action. This is action which falls outside the strict definition, at least proto-strict definition, of what is rational behaviour. And it's relevant to this comparison because we find in that there's quite a degree of similarity between Pareto and Smith on this particular question. What Smith discusses in his theory of moral sentiments falls within the scope of Pareto's non-logical action, his sociology. We also look at the notion of the impartial spectator, such an important role in Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments, and to look at the equivalent type role played, played in Pareto's sociology, and then to reflect on the question of the self-interest versus the general interest of society, how the two thinkers address those issues, and then to conclude. So let me start then with what did Adam Smith have to say on, sorry, Pareto have to say on Adam Smith's political economy. Overwhelmingly, it's positive. I mean, Pareto was firstly an admirer of classical economics, and within that context, he was a particular admirer of Adam Smith. And to start with that, he starts with the question of methodology, what's Smith's methodology? So. He starts by noticing that Adam Smith's definition of political economy is about developing collections of recipes that are useful for individuals, for public authorities. This is an aspect which is of interest to Prater, one class of political thinking, but it's not the part that he weights the highest. He then goes on to say, but fortunately Smith Smith's work is mostly um, aimed at identifying uniformities that present in relation to a social phenomenon. So Pareto's interest in Smith is not so much in the applications that have been discussed a lot in this conference to date, that Smith would come up with particular problems, the recipes in Pareto's language for creating things that are useful for society, and particularly in relation to public actions, but in what Smith contributed to the uniformities of social phenomena. So in other words, a, a positive science, his contribution to positive science. Importantly for Pareto at least, he sees Smith as not um, pursuing the aim of developing a doctrine akin to a moral treatise. That is, in the author's view, something would be good for the people of the nation, the, work, the nation itself, or even mankind something inspired by a metaphysical proposition on what justice is or the like. So 
Pareto sees the importance of Smith's political economy as falling in that second category. Interesting though, for the purpose of this discussion today, S Smith's work on the theory of moral sentiments has a considerable amount which falls into that third category. That is a moral treatise. It's the theory of moral sentiments for a start. So it's, it's within that scope. And that by and large is what Prato's not so interested in Smith's work. Um, Smith, Prato, when commenting on Smith, points out that Adam Smith is important as one of the originators of surplus theory. Now, surplus theory usually comes into mind to people talking about um, Karl Marx, Karl Marx's theory of surplus value. Um, but for, for Pareto, the idea of classical political economy itself is fundamentally something that's concerned with creating a surplus, a growing nation, the wealth of, the, the wealth of nations is about growing economies. And when Robertus complained that Marx didn't truly acknowledge him for this idea of surplus value. Prato chipped in and says, Engels responded correctly that at least the theory of surplus value can already be found in Adam Smith's work in its germ. That is, an interest in, in growing economies is in Adam Smith. So Smith's view on value is also quoted approvingly by Pareto. The classical tradition is important for its systematic evaluation of value theory. And the typical way of evaluating value theory from that period focuses on a labor theory of value. The question comes as whether the labor theory of value is assessed by the labor embedded in the process of production, which means it's a production theory of value that's independent of a market process. There's been no exchange yet. Or weight, labor theory of value is given in, te in terms of the amount of labour that a good could buy with the good produced. It's called a labour commanded theory of value. In that case, there is a market. That's whatever the, the market rates determining the wage. Um, Adam Smith emphasised the former in the case of a primitive society and the latter in a complex society, that you essentially have a labour commanded theory of value. And in discussing it further, he sometimes used wheat as his numeraire, the quantity of wheat that's available or the quantity of labour you can buy. These are two things that are pointed out for which Ricardo responded critically to Smith saying there's a confusion here, there's a cause of value problem um, and you've got this that's not being identified by a labour commanded approach and you end up with some confusion having the two. Well, Pareto says Smith is actually ahead of all of those who followed, including Ricardo, Smith has a sense of welfare in these comments. That is, it is the um, cost of production that's occurring and if you're using labour, what we call a labour commanded theory of value, you're having a sense of the cost of production, what must be given up to obtain something, which is, has a welfare implication. For countries that are produced, uh, that have a wage good, that are, are largely given by bread, where it's a major good for the working people, agricultural economies particularly, but beyond, the idea of using wheat as your numeraire to measure value is an indication of the benefit that's, a, a use that's a, there, that's starting to occur. So for him, for Pareto, you have a fairly clear nexus between early classical thinking, late classical thinking between Marx and Ricardo, and then the next jump to the Walrasian system of general equilibrium which is the beginning of the modern era, which comes out of Lausanne under the leadership of Leon Boras, where the interdependence between the production and exchange of all goods is considered together. So Pareto is seeing some link, some degree of continuity from Smith right through to Walras and, uh, to, to Walras and praises Smith accordingly for that. Now, if we just move on to the theory of moral sentiments and the sociology, let me start by painting the scene a bit for the theory of moral sentiments. A key point here is that it characterises people as social. That is, they have sympathy, they're able to think of sympathy for others. The dot point there is trying to illustrate it, that saying that individuals, that people, have the capacity to place themselves in the shoes of other people and they do so by considering the actions of, 
of others in the context of passions, three types of passions. Smith calls these passions respectively unsocial passions, social passions, and selfish passions. So the unsocial passions relate to examples like hatred, resentment, things that are corrosive to social cohesion, things that are corrosive to the social nature of human life. Then there's social passions, such as sentiments of generosity, humanity, mutual friendship. These are the things that foster beneficence in human action. It is a, work, a concern for others and acting for the benefit of others through this beneficence notion. In regard to social pas uh, selfish passions, Smith links this to prudence. That is the pursuit of your self-interest, is what we would tend to call it today, self-interest rather than selfishness. And that's served by this prudent nature of human behavior. So it's a quite a, uh, an affirmative view of individuals to be forward thinking and act in a, in a way that's prudent and careful of their situation. So when we're considering sympathy in the theory of moral sentiments and when we're placing ourselves in the shoes of others to consider what we're doing, we do so in reference to their social, unsocial and selfish passions. The important agent in this process to determine what's sympathetic or not is the impartial spectator. Okay, so the impartial spectator plays a crucial role in Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments. So the actions agents was also influenced in Smith's thinking by approbation, as the emotion which arises from the spectator observing the perfect coincidence between the sympathetic passion in himself and the original passion in the person principally concerned. So there's an observation of an action and there's an approving nature of that when that action is undertaken away which is approved by the impartial spectator. Now importantly I think for the question of this paper that is the subtitle or the title of the paper concerns uh, utility and action. Um, the question which relates to is how much is Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments consistent with a utility-based analysis or utilitarian type analysis. Um, and it emerges that there's a block at least to considering Adam Smith in that context because he places the impartial spectator as, as um, setting the standard of moral action in regard to two criteria. Those criteria are proprietary, the propriety of something undertaken and the merit of that good that's being undertaken. Now, if we skip to the sociology just to get some point of view from the comparison, I, I will keep the discussion of the sociology general because today we're celebrating Adam Smith, uh, not Pareto, but I need to do some framing just so that the comparison is meaningful. Um, Pareto's sociology turns on three respects, the aspects, the objective aspects, things that are directly observable and confirmable in an objective sense, the subjective aspect, what a person might be uh, intending when they act, and then the aspect of utility, which Pareto classes as a state of mind, but it's the, the, the consequence of the action on, on the state of mind of a person, whether they get the benefit from the action that they think they will get. Now, when all those things are placed together, his sociology fundamentally boils down to two theories, a theory of residues, the theory of derivations, uh, and a social equilibrium emerges based on the interactions between those. So to explain what derivations and residues are, I thought I might just give a simple example. Prato observed that in humanity, it's very common for numbers to be given some sort of status as a sacred number. So an example is the number of six. Number six is sometimes presented as a sacred number because it is the number of days that God took to create the world because the product of one, two and three is six as is the sum of one, two and three. So there's a unique mathematical relationship that's gone 
and therefore you have a relationship to explain why this is a sacred number. So his theory of derivations would say that there's some derivative aspect of humans to look for a sacred point, in this case a sacred number. That's all res residues are trying to say. There's a sentiment that's being expressed, in this case the sacredness of the number. The derivation is the reason given. So, you know, that God took six days to make the, wor the world and the mathematical properties. This is the doctrine that goes with the sentiment. And that's what he's fundamentally doing with his sociology, to see how they interact to create a theory of social equilibrium. Now, to compare the two and to appreciate my case that Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiment is fundamentally dealing with the same topic that Pareto is dealing with in his sociology, um, I'd like to start by observing that Smith's goal stated goal, own stated goal in his work, is to explain the principles of what humans actually do as a matter of fact. That is, human beings reflect morally. This is for him a fact, and he wants to understand how those reflections are undertaken, how moral judgment is attained. And this is from Sam McCord, is in trying to make the point here that it's not purely a normative proposition. Even though we're dealing with moral sentiments, he's trying to understand the reasoning that goes with those moral sentiments. Pareto too was a positivist, okay? Pareto was driven by the desire to expel metaphysics from economic and sociological thought as an analytical device uh, for people. People might be affected by metaphysical propositions, you want to study that, but the analyst is not going to be influenced by those metaphysical propositions. And from that he develops a logical experimental method. And I, I'll try and show that he's a little bit more uncompromising in Smith when he's dealing with that. But just to cut to the end, the reason reflects the difference ultimately between disciplines. One's a philosopher interested in the profundity of reasoning and action, that's Smith. The other is a positive social scientist who wants to take facts as given and analyse those facts from those given propositions. Okay, and another point of similarity is that neither is confined to logical aspects. And I found a nice quote from Mia Pier Paganelli and Fabrizio Simon. It says, Smith's agent, this is in the theory of moral sentiments in particular, is not guided by utility maximisation, but by sentiments that are not necessarily rational. And she's not su suggesting here that I think that sentiments are rational or not. The sen uh, rational is a sentiment is just a, uh, a sentiment that's held. It's the behaviour in relationship to that sentiment, whether it's rational or not. And what she's suggesting is that there's a deeper level of analysis in Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments than can be accomplished and understood properly just by studying the rational actor. Okay, that it's a, uh, there are other elements. I think in the same sense for Prado's sociology, but certainly not for his pure economics, you have the rational actor not holding. The theory of of sociology of Pareto is the study of non-logical actions, not logical actions. Um, so perhaps the most important point of the presentation is that both thinkers considered regularity and irregularity of sen sentiments in that context. So let me then illustrate that for Adam Smith by looking at this quote. So in the process of reflecting on action in the context of sentiment, Adam Smith distinguishes the efficient cause from the final cause. Okay, there's two different things in his thinking. So in every part of the unit, we observe means adjusted with the nicest artifice to the ends which they are intended to produce. So that gives you this sense that there's a rational actor model going on. There's some sort of evaluation and applying means rationally towards your end. He goes, but still, we distinguish the efficient from the final cause of their several motions and organisations. So although it appears, often appears to be a rational action, there is a final cause which is apart from that process of rational action. When, by natural principles, we are led to advance those ends which a refined and enlightened reason would recommend to us, we are very apt to impute to that reason as to their efficient cause, the sentiments and actions 
by which we undate to those ends. So it's human to try and rationalise your conduct, to say we've done X and this is why and here's the rational explanation. But in reality, there's something lying under it. In this case, he's saying that something is the wisdom of God. It's not human beings that have achieved the rationality. There's some sentimental issue that's underneath, in this case, um, something of divine inspiration. Divine inspiration or something inspired by um, enlightened reason. So this distinction between efficient and final causes appears to be related to Smith's distinction between merit and propriety, which the impartial spectator is going to make judgment on the standards of, of, of the morality or otherwise of an action. Specifically, merit is about the utility of a consequence of action is the benchmark by which the efficient cause would be considered. So merit, what's the, the benefit, the consequences of it and the merit, the effects of it, uh, the merit or otherwise. Proprietary, however, concerns the moral sentiment. So in that previous quote, the part that's informed by refined and enlightened reason as devised by the wisdom of God. And that is in, informs the final cause, that is the ultimate cause of what is going to motivate action. That the world judges by the event, that is by in terms of merit and not by design in terms of propriety, has been in all ages the complaint and is the great discouragement of virtue. So in the theory of moral sentiments, we've had a bottom line that there's something which goes below, some sentiment which goes below the traditional application of a rational actor in their, their behaviour. And when we do that sort of analysis, we tend to look at consequential things, to look at utility. And if we judge things by the merit, by the event, the merit of an event, we, un we underplay the, the depth and importance of the moral reasoning that's being undertaken. Now, the closest point of comparison of this to Pareto is actually not in his sociology. It's in his Cour d'Economie Politique. This came out in 1896-97 and was the textbook used at the University of Lausanne for teaching economics. And that distinguishes between ophelimity and utility. So ophelimity is the subjective intent, if you like, that is used for the study of rational actions. So Prato is one of the first to use the term homo o economicus. Okay, homo economicus clearly derives from John Stuart Mill. It's not named as homo economicus, but by the time you get to Mafio Pantaleone, an Italian, you're getting it named in economic thought, and Prato is taking it and then combining, combining it in his thinking, but by linking it to this notion of ophelimity. So homo economicus is what's used for study of rational actions in economics, where ophelimity is like we consider utility today, but it's just about pursuing a taste, no judgment about whether it's enhancing welfare or not, no judgments about its legitimacy or not, or not. But he also introduces ophelimity for ethics. So there's homo ethicus, there's ophelimity in theology, so there's homo theologus. And that distinguishes from utility. Now, utility is finally about, fundamentally about well-being. And when you get to this question of utility in Pareto's thinking, you can't handle it in a complete sense, in a strictly logical sense, because what is good for a person, good for them in terms of themselves, their own individual, their own well-being, is not necessarily obtained just by pursuing a taste, satisfying a taste. There's other things to consider. So economic utility is looking at material well-being that goes beyond the scope of rational analysis of homo economicus. So his point was, we don't know everything in economics. We can actually deal in theory with, with ophelimity, which gives a really rough, rough, rough approximation of what happens to real people. Real people are actually concerned with their economic utility, but we don't get a deterministic outcome if we do that. So let's just use ophelimity as an approximation to get a deterministic outcome. And then he does a similar thing with moral utility, about moral development, and the same with theology. Now, within that context, all of Smith's system can be accommodated within that arrangement. 
Um, but this broader notion of utility doesn't lend itself to theory based on rational agents, okay? And by the time Parade arrives at the sociology, he ends up abandoning entirely this notion of homo, economic, of homo ethicus and homo religiosus. In other words, that he doesn't believe that it's proved feasible to develop a study of ethics or a study of religion which is purely based on rational action alone, that it's too intertwined with the questions of well-being in a way that doesn't give a, a clear answer. He also became aware that sentiment is being used as a powerful force to persuade people. That is, you know, you try to convince other people of some arrangement um, through rhetoric, if you like, through arguments that it's going to make it appeal appeasing to them, you're trying to persuade them to change their views about the world. And this takes us within the scope of non-logic, that is, we can't take an individual as pursuing taste and, sh and doing it in a consistent way as always applying, so he's developing his sociology to an analyse that. He sets, so he sets that aside and this is what's important, I think, for a comparison with Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments. So the introduction of non-logical action in sociology brings up points of comparison with Smith which I find intriguing and similar. Now, this is a, a table which will involve a little bit of mind work, but hopefully not too much. This is from Pareto's sociology. There's a category of non-logical action there. There's, he has four, four genera. Genus two um, is one that he considers important. It's a case when um, actions have log logical ends and there's purposes pursued, but um, it's subjectively given only and there's no objective part. Now, the examples he would give here would be a theological thing. You would go to mass every Sunday. You would expend time and energy in the hope of eternal redemption of your soul. That's something beyond the objective world, but it's, it's in, in, in this category. We should, I should have mentioned that his non-logical action is not illogical in the same way that Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments is not illogical. His analysis is no suggestion that's illogical to behave with regard to moral sentiments. It's just saying that when you have sentiments at multiple levels of sen sentiments, it's hard to combine them into a single determinate model. Um, the other type of genesis too that he would talk about is metaphysical propositions. So a just society, a just act. You do it because it's the subjective view of what, what a just outcome is. Its subjective form doesn't, it, it's, the performance of the act is the means to the end. The justice being attained is the end. So the outcome is not necessarily important in an objective sense. The other category is genus four. And this is really about public policy information where you've got to align the objective outcome of what you're working on with also the subjective intent it doesn't meet the strict requirements that Pareto has for logical action, which requires complete, consistent uh, action without repeating itself. Pareto's definition of economics, uh, of logical action, um, in this stage serves to reduce the, the scope of pure theory of economics and increase the scope of sociology. Now, I won't go through this, but this will just give you a sense. This is Pareto's complete system. He's got logical actions at the front and he's got other classes of genera, but they're not important because genera one will over time reduce to genera two and genera three will reduce to genera four. Now, in his scheme, non-logical action gives the appearance of a logical means ends nexus if the end is accepted by the agent ex ante ex post. They don't know what it well is properly um, ex ante, but if they did, they would accept it. In Smith's scheme, there's an appearance of a logical means ends nexus when the end obtained is accepted by the agent ex ante and ex post as there is no irregularity of sentiment. That is, sentiment is given, action is undertaken, and that sentiment is basically accepted. Now, if we compare those things through systematically, we'll end up with the following table. Um, 
So I've just put the note there, our aptness to impute an efficient cause to actions also depends on the regularity of sentiment. That's the, from the quote earlier. So if you compare the two approaches, if there's an objective outcome, would the agent accept it? Yes, in the case of Pareto for his Genesis 4A, and yes, in the case of Smith when sentiments are regular. If there is no objective outcome, would objective actions towards subjective purpose be accepted ex post? Yes, by Pareto for Genesis 2A, and yes, by Smith. Does the agent's actions appear to display a logical means ends nexus? Yes, in both cases. Where we come to a difference is the last point. Is judgment by the agent in relation to his or her actions determined only by utility? Yes, in the case of Pareto. No, in the case of Smith, because Smith wants to have propriety also considered. So at the heart of what lies here is this question, is Adam Smith a utilitarian thinker? I mean, people have argued that he, he like Hume, is a sort of a pre um, Benthamite think in a utilitarian terms, um, but the theory of moral sentiments, this, the status of this proprietary issue would say no. If propriety is to be given a substantial weighting in the process, then we would have to say he's not. Um, that or there's no inconsistency between utility and propriety. If that's met, then he would fall into the category of being a utilitarian thinker. Now there's a second class of non-logical action. I should just go back here and say, this is the main class for Adam Smith, this regular sentiments. But Smith also considers irregular sentiments. And for Prato, non-logical action does not give the appearance of logical means ends nexus if the end is not accepted by the agent ex ante ex post. That is, if the action would be rejected if the agent knew what it was. Whereas in Smith's scheme, there is no appearance of a logical means ends nexus when the end would not be accepted by the agent ex post, which is the case when there's an irregularity of sentiments. So in this case, Smith discusses the piacular feeling to look at irregularity of sentiments. The piacular feeling example he gives is when we undertake an action and with no intent, we act, with no intention, we have killed somebody. Now we've looked at the logical relationship, we took the action, we expected an outcome and somebody died. And it may have no fault to do with our analytical reasoning or our thinking, but a consequence of that outcome was the loss of the life. And Smith's argument is that, well, this has caused people to feel, the, person, the party who actually caused the death when they're thinking in a moral sense to feel distressed by it or sad by it they would come to revise their assessment of what they were doing and they may even cause their actions to change. So the sentiment, the, the basis on which sentiment's given gets modified by this type of action. So the sentiment's no longer regular, we've acted, and that action has caused us to change the nature of the sentiment. So if you follow the same sort of analysis, we find that Smith and Pareto are fundamentally in agreement so in regard to if there is an objective outcome, would the agent accept it ex post? So no in the case of Pareto and no in the case of Smith because of the, the, the irregularity of the sentiment and, and the same for the other three. There's a perfect agreement. But again, when you come to the question of is judgment undertaken solely with reference to utility, the answer is again different between the two thinkers. For Pareto, it's yes. And for um, Smith, it's no, it's, uh, it's not going to be. That should be irregular sentiments. Um, so again, this is a major difference. Now here, we can't reconcile Smith with utilitarian thinking, okay, because it's beyond the, the scope of, of making the efficient cause look like the effective cause. There must be a difference between them because you've had to revise what you're doing. This is the minor part of Smith's theory of moral sentiments. This is the major part of, Ad, of Pareto's sociology. Fundamentally, he's interested in the case where people's sentimental views and how it relates to the objective world is always interacting and always changing so that an objective logical process is difficult to pursue. So there's a difference in emphasis between the two, but the scope of the two is fundamentally the same. Now, let me look at the impartial 
spectator, we must become the impartial spectator of our own characters and conduct. So this is the idea of development. But he sets up the idea that there is approbation, there's this impartial spectator that looks at us, similarly pl places themselves in our shoes and reasons in a way about moral sentiments. And when that reason is undertaken, comes to a conclusion. But the purpose here is, is to say that ultimately we should be our own impartial spectators. We should be looking at enlightened, careful reasoning ourselves and be able to have our own characters and conduct. Prato, in contrast, makes the following statement. Sentiments we study as objective facts strictly. So, for example, we refuse to consider whether an action be just, unjust, moral or immoral. We shall, however, examine as an objective fact that which people of a given social class in a given country at a given time meant when they said A was a just or moral act. Smith is looking at the social psychology behind the reflective processes that came to the view of what's a moral act. Prato is saying, I don't want to look behind that process. I want to observe it as an unbiased observer and note it as a social fact and undertake my analysis on that basis. Um, for Smith, the impartial spectator's role is central to the theory of moral sentiments. It's what makes it become a, a complete form of analysis. Otherwise, it's, you're not going to arrive at, a, at, a, at an end that can be given. For Pareto, however, he has an impartial spectator, but it's a very, very limited role. And it's not about internalising views and enhancing our own reasoning. It's about an external judgement. So some examples of those things are what is objective and what's subjective? Well, he says actually all knowledge is subjective. All knowledge is imperfect. It's tedious to try and talk about degrees of imperfection. When we make a statement something objective, what we mean is that an impartial spectator who has more understanding of science than most of us, a leader in our field, has judged that that is correct, and I'll call that objective. So it's contingent on the state of society, state of knowledge and all of that but it, inf it uses an external observer. Next one's about the means-ends relationship, whether it's logical or not. Again, it's an informed observer making the observation that actions are like and repeated if it's logical or not like and repeated. Okay, um, okay I, I'll, I'm conscious of the time um, and I really want to get to this last point about self-interest and the general interest of society. Can I ask, how many people in this group know of the Adam Smith problem? That's Adam Smith's problem, yes. It's a, a legacy of German scholars who uh, more than a century ago um, were concerned about the consistency of the agent in the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations. With uh, the agent of the theory of moral sentiments being more linked to benevolence and the agent of the um, wealth of nations being more linked to uh, self-interest. Okay, so the, and this, this is raised by German scholars as a as a as a problem of consistency. I think it's important to note. I, I presented this to some Smith scholars before who really emphasised that in today's speaking world there is very little acceptance of the idea that there is an Adam Smith problem. That is an argument, therefore, that there's a, a body of work. Sure, it's, it's, it's not totally analytically linked, but it's a system that you need to look at both to understand where Adam Smith's coming from. And I tend to subscribe to that point of view myself. Baganelli writes an interesting article called The Reverse Adam Smith Problem. In that, she states that actually the piece of work which consistently treats self-interest uh, without reservation is the theory of moral sentiments. You've got selfish interests in there. And where there are problems, there are corrective mechanisms that can act to correct it, provided in the theory of moral sentiments. In the Wealth of Nations, we've talked about the problem of monopoly, the rapacious spirit of monopoly. This is a, clearly a major, major, major problem for um, Adam Smith, but it's not resolved in theory of wealth of nations. So she says it's a reverse problem. One's got lot individuality uh, and general interest perfectly mapped. And that's, the, so that's the TMS, whereas the other one hasn't. We don't, however, have a Vilfredo Pareto problem mentioned in any literature. 
which is strange in the sense that you've got the same issue. One's dealing with sentiment and non-logical action and one's dealing with logical action. Part of the reason, I think, is because all the problems of self-interest are included in both Pareto's sociology and economics. That is, all the problems in Smith's wealth of nations associated with monopoly are bought into his sociology. How do you deal with it? You deal with it sociologically by looking at the nature of the non-logical action. So the economics and sociology on the question of monopoly don't, uh, they're both covered in there, whereas Smith tends to look at it on one case. Now, I'm conscious that I've gone a little over time and uh, I, I, that's the main conclusion. What I may end of the paper, the only thing I'd like to conclude by saying is there is a beautiful overlap between Smith and um, uh, and Pareto in the theory of moral sentiments and sociology in the analytical term. Not in the way they're using it, not the way they're getting to it. Pareto, by the way, did not cite the theory of moral sentiments in any of his work. There's no Italian translation where there was an Italian translation of the, th of the Wealth of Nations and he did not read English well. He would have not been able to deal with the depth of the writing of the theory of moral sentiments in English. There was a French translation, but the French translation came out first as um, the metaphysics of the soul or the theory of moral sentiments. Now, this would have sent Pareto <laughs> running. My judgment is that he had a look at it and was aware of it and wasn't informed by it. I've just come back from Lausanne where I, Pareto's library is. I went through his library searching for the theory of moral sentiments and it's not there. Um, so there's differences, they have different approaches, but for me, the intriguing thing is the overlap, it's the scope is, is quite, quite similar. Uh, and to fin finish with a caution, I've given you a view of Adam Smith through the eyes or my eyes from Pareto's eyes. Historians will tell you always to be a bit careful when you look at a th author through the eyes of a third person. So ultimately, these ideas are pluralistic. This isn't the Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments I've given to you. I've given to you a perspective on it and just keep it in that context. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Michael has rapaciously used up all his time, but me being the generous soul that I am, will indulge you with a question or two. Uh, do we have microphones still? We didn't sell them off? Okay. Doug, we had a question at the back, did we as well? Maybe not. Okay. Could you take that? So it appears though he was generally aware of it, but not specifically aware of it. So does that mean that his whole framework was created de novo? And if so, what, what were his fundamental building blocks if it wasn't Smith? For his sociology, he, he was of the view that uh, economic knowledge had improved asymptotically over time and there was a body that you could build on. In regard to sociology, he felt that there was no corpus of theory of soci sociology, that there were I much of ideas like applied sociology and important insights that were around the place, but there was no um, created theory which you could call properly general theory. So he saw himself as a pioneer in writing a general theory for the first. Second question there, now we're going to have to move on, right? Yep. I can hear you, but I'm not sure it's working. Okay. Yeah. That's all right. Is that working? Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I recently read Amartya Sen's uh, famous liberal paradox, and I'm fascinated by this um, apparent trade-off between liberty and um, Pareto efficiency in society. And um, I, so I found this really interesting because obviously Smith is a huge proponent of liberty, although apparently only as it promotes consequence. Um, and so I guess I was wondering, uh, given um, what you've just presented, does Pareto see himself as um, presenting a theory or a model to understand 
human behaviour in general as like, or is it more an ideal theory of like a hypothetical situation? Okay, great question. Sense. There's a great dispute between Leon Voras and Pareto on this question. Voras was a creator of ideals. So his general equilibrium system was about an ideal outcome which you could manipulate to any social outcome you want. For Pareto, theory was about approximating the reality in economics. Now, when he did sociology, he took that method over. He wanted to understand what is. He did not wish to say what ought to be. On the one occasion, it's one occasion he did, but it's, a, it's an exception to the general treatment of trying to understand, understand what is. Um, just on Sen, um, the impossibility of a Parisian liberal should start with none of this has anything to do with Pareto. That is, every impossibility that Sen raises on the Parisian liberal uh, would not apply to Pareto because Pareto is not a Parisian liberal so defined. Um, his welfare analysis includes cardinal an analysis and if it goes to social utility, includes interpersonal comparisons of utility and even redistribution. So um, Sen's article is interesting and important, obviously, for thinking on welfare thinking, but it's important for me, at least, that it's, even though he's talking about a Parisian liberal, it is not addressed to Pareto. Great. Thank you very Thank much, you. Michael. Thank I must say, sort of apologies to you. You got the post-lunch uh, <laughs> slot, and I'm noticing that by my calculations, 72.5% of the audience are still awake. So I think you, <laughs> you, you, did, you did very well under the circumstances. So, um, but we will move on and now recycling and reusing a presenter, which I think is very efficient. Um, and we'll come down to the most famous nub of the whole issue, which is, um, of course, the theory of the invisible hand. Thanks. Well, I was going to try and make a joke about that, but I, I ran out of it. Nice to see you back, Tony. Sure. So uh, I take it we are moving 10 minutes later than? Yeah. Okay. So uh, my focus now is uh, quite narrowly, well, it's actually quite fundamental, so it's not such a narrow topic, but specifically on the invisible hand, this was written for a separate occasion, and hence the intersection that I referred to earlier, which I will jump across here as well. So the background of it is this. In 2019, I had the honour of being invited to contribute a new entry on the invisible hand for the new Palgrave Dictionary, and they kindly gave me 10,000 words. So. Uh, effectively a, a essay length entry and showing the enormous self-restraint for which I am justly famous. <laughs> I managed to keep it to 9,000 words. And so I use this occasion to uh, revisit that, uh, that, that essay of four years ago or so and to sharpen up some points there where I was a bit more muted uh, and so what I've done here is to go to the specifics of two of the three instances where Smith actually uses the metaphor. He actually uses the phrase invisible hand. The third one, which is from that uh, essay on astronomy that I referred to earlier, is really, I think, not relevant and not quite relevant and can be put aside. So I, I want to uh, uh, just show you what he actually says and then suggest that uh, what he says is not very credible or interesting and that therefore, if that was all there was to it, the invisible hand would not amount to much. But that in fact, there's a whole other body of unintended consequences arguments which are much more significant than the two instances where he actually uses the, the, the very words. And then, at the end, I've, I've done something that I didn't do at all in the 2020 New Palgrave, which is to say a little bit about positioning Smith's unintended consequences in the larger context of social science more generally, 
by referring to Marx, Keynes and Hyman Minsky to give instances of unintended consequences which come from a very different politico-economic perspective to, to, to po provide that larger context. So to go to uh, the first instance, which is, well, let me give you first my definition of the invisible hand, my formal definition. This is taken directly from that new Palgrave entry. The action of an unseen causal process in which behaviour at the level of individuals generates systemic outcomes or effects at the level of the economy and polity as a whole. Furthermore, those outcomes are conceived of as being not part of the intention of the individual level behaviour that is their ultimate cause and with the causal processes commonly unrecognised by the individuals. <clears throat> and the first instance is in the theory of moral sentiments. In the TMS narrative, a selfish landlord, notwithstanding his selfishness, is led to distribute the harvest of his estates so as to provide the necessaries of life to all the thousands he directly and indirectly employs. The moral of the story is that in this manner, the rich are led by an invisible hand to make nearly the same distribution of the necessaries of life, which would have been made had the earth been divided into equal portions among all of its inhabitants, and thus without intending it, without knowing it, advance the interest of the society and afford means to the multiplication of the species. The advancing of society that Smith refers to here is via the spectacle of the rich and the great being a stimulus to the industry of mankind. This is due to there being a natural human tendency to admire wealth and greatness, a tendency that in Smith's view is foolish but also useful. This is something that Lisa Hill also referred to. And the unintended system level consequence is a sort of equality with respect to basic subsistence consumption. Note also that the state of affairs sketched here does not necessarily belong uniquely to a capitalist social economy, liberal, competitive or otherwise. This has got nothing to do with competition. Yeah? Indeed, the picture painted conveys a, distinct feudal, a distinctly feudal context. In a way, this is unsurprising because uh, there is no capital in Smith's thinking until after his time spent in France, as I sketched in, at some length in my first presentation. Now I turn to the, wealth, the, instance, the second instance, which is in the Wealth of Nations. In the WN instance, capital is central. Against discriminatory mechanicalist policies, Smith argues that individuals' pursuit of individual economic advantage, unrestricted by such policies, will generate superior outcomes. Individuals are continually exerting themselves continually exerting themselves to apply their capital to the most advantageous employment for themselves, but in doing so are led to prefer that employment which is most advantageous to the society. The fundamental societal advantage that Smith focuses upon is the aggregate produce or annual revenue of a society. The key step in the argument is his supposition that the pursuit of maximum profitability of capital leads to capital being employed in support of that industry of which the produce is likely to be of the greatest value. As every individual, therefore, endeavours as much as he can to employ his capital 
so that it, its produce may be of the greatest value, every individual necessarily every, every individual necessarily labours to render the annual revenue of the society as great as he can. He generally, indeed, neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting. He intends only his own gain, and in this way, as in many other cases, as in many other cases, he's led by an invisible hand to promote an end, which was no part of his intention. So there's the two explicit cases of the invisible hand metaphor being used. How much intellectual significance can be given to these two? In the TNS case, the notion of equality in terms of fundamental material subsistence seems rather forced, to say the least. In that narrative, Smith frankly states that the landlord shares prepared in the nicest manner, consumed in his palace, and is the most precious and agreeable share. These are all quotes. When, if or when you get the written text, you will see this with page citations. And the claim of equality stands in sharp contrast to the considerable acknowledgments of profound economic inequality elsewhere in his writings. Smith was surely self-aware that this unintended equality argument is at best rhetorical overstatement. In the WN case, the argument requires two steps. The first is that individuals' maximisation of revenue or value added maximises society's revenue or value added on the basis that the latter is a mere aggregation of the former. Hardly a profound proposition, almost trite, and spurious if there are interdependencies as arise from negative externalities. The second, the above mentioned key step, is the supposition that maximising profits per unit of capital invested maximises product or revenue or value added per unit of capital invested, which is also problematic. Page 71. In relation to this second proposition, on the one hand, it is not precisely clear what revenue concept Smith intends. Gross revenue or some measure of net revenue? At one point, he speaks of maximising revenue and labour employment, implying gross revenue since the quantity of labour employed generated by production aligns with gross revenue more than net revenue. But at the same page, the produce of industry, said to be in proportion to profits, is identified with what it adds to the subject or materials upon which it is employed, which is clearly a value added or net revenue concept. Perhaps he believes that maximising the rate of profit ensures maximisation of both revenue magnitudes. <coughs> On the other hand, it is not in any case in general valid that maximising the rate of profit on capital maximises revenue, whether gross or net. As between two methods of production available to a producer, the method generating a higher rate of profit need not be associated with also a higher ratio of revenue or value of output to capital. <coughs> and so I've used this little uh, identity to make the point. So what, what Smith is telling is the capital, this is the behavioural principle is that the capitalist maximises this, profit per unit of capital invested. And what he wants to tell is that that will be associated with maximising the reciprocal of this. The reciprocal of capital over revenue is, is revenue to, to, per dollar of capital invested. Well, you can see from the identity that there is the intervention in, the, in the, the relationship between the profit rate on the left 
and the second term on the right, there is the intervention of the share of profit in revenue, the profit, sh the profit share. It is possible then for there to be no uh, uh, coincidence of profit maximization with revenue maximization. A production method that exhibits a higher profit rate than an alternative production method, the left-hand side, can be associated with a higher capital output ratio or lower output capital ratio, the second term on the right-hand side, so long as this is associated also with a more than proportionally higher profit share, the first term on the, on the right-hand side. Whether the measure of revenue or value of output is a gross measure or some form of net, net measure. <laughs> now, I don't want to get too technical here because what, what I've gone on to do in the written paper is give an algebraic illustration of this point. But it's actually very simple. Imagine there are two different production methods, one which uses more capital relative to labour compared to the other. It may be that a production method with a higher capital per unit of output at the same time generates a higher profit rate because the quantity of labour per unit of output falls so dramatically that the profit share rises as well. Yeah? So it doesn't require anything very fancy. Yeah? Capital labour substitution with a sufficient fall in labour per unit of output as capital per unit of output rises can enable revenue per dollar of capital to fall as the profit rate per dollar of capital rises. Now, you might think, well, Tony, Adam Smith is, a, is an intellectual giant. He's a lot smarter than you. You really found a mistake in, in Adam Smith? Because you're a little intellectual midget and he's a giant. It's true. It's true. I'm a midget and he's a giant. But there's the old thing associated with Isaac Newton, though it goes back much earlier, about standing on the shoulders of giants. And there's another giant called Ricardo. And I can stand on Ricardo's shoulders and see a little bit further than Adam Smith. Because it would be generally accepted that Ricardo is a superior analytical economist to Adam Smith about a generation later, say 40 years. Yeah? There's this famous thing in Ricardo where in the third edition of Ricardo's Principles, he engages in a recantation. He has a chapter at the very end of the book on machinery and it caused a huge stir because it seemed to provide a vindication of the Luddites. Because what he argued was, it's true that the introduction of new machinery can be detrimental to the interests of the working class. Now, the great analytical economist Ricardo had not noticed something, which he finally noticed for the third edition. And in, if you get my written text, page four, note four, I've, I've written, along with something else, compare also David Ricardo's change of mind on the impact of new and more profitable production methods in the chapter 31 on machinery added in the third edition of the principles. Quote, my mistake arose from the supposition that whenever the net income of a society increased, its gross income would also increase. This is essentially the same distinction that I'm drawing here, although in a different context uh, in relation to the invisible hand. <clears throat> well, I figure I have got until 10 past. So, if these two instances of the invisible, this is my conclusion, if these two instances of the invisible hand metaphor explicitly invoked were the only cases of Smith theorising unintended systemic consequences, the concept could be judged of little significance, both for Smith's thought and for social science in general. 
But the idea has much greater application for Smith. And recall that when applying the metaphor in WN, Smith himself speaks, as I quoted it, of there being many other instances. Many other cases is the phrase he uses. What I've got on to highlight is the two of these further cases that are of particular significance and indeed of greater significance than the two instances in which the metaphor is actually used. Well, <clears throat> the first instance is that uh, thing that I discussed in the, the first session about the famous one that everyone uh, appeals to of how price flexibility in a decentralised competitive economy spontaneously, in inverted commas, brings about a coordination of supply and demand. And I won't uh, labour the point here. The second, of course, is the one that I did emphasise then uh, to, to, uh, to, to prefigure uh, the, its central role here, which is to say that it's actually economic development itself, which is an unintended consequence of fundamental propensities of human nature. And, and this is the central uh, issue and theme for, for Smith in, in The Wealth of Nations. So I go on to tell, see this stuff was the stuff I did this morning. <sighs> this is just astonishing. Astonishing. Not only, <clears throat> not only is the theory of economic development far more important for Smith than the supply-demand coordination theory, economic development and all that is supposed to flow from it in his view, notably rising output per worker and widely distributed rising consumption per capita, is itself a case of unintended systemic consequences of individuals' pursuit of material self-betterment. Quote, the principle from which public and national, as well as private opulence, is originally derived, unquote. Quote, the principle which prompts to save, unquote, and the most important instance for him. An element of this is the technical progress associated with Smith's doctrine concerning the benefits of labour specialisation, this division of labour thing we've been hearing about all day which is also an unintended systemic consequence of individuals' pursuit of material self-betterment, together with a supposed natural human propensity to trade, and is one of the two proximate causes of the economic development, which is Smith's ultimate economic objective. The other cause being capital accumulation. Quote, the vision of labour is not originally the effect of any human wisdom which foresees and intends that general opulence to which it gives occasion, unquote. General opulence here is Smith's term for economic development that delivers widely distributed rising consumption per capita. A theme also pursued by Lisa Hill. The supply-demand coordination theory is really only of derivative importance insofar as that coordination contributes to the advancement of economic development. For example, competition ensuring that falling costs of production from innovation, itself attributed to competition here, flow through to prices. Here's the, the quote. This is from WN. Increase of demand, though in the beginning it may sometimes raise the price of goods, never fails to lower it in the long run. It encourages production and thereby increases the competition of the producers, who in order to undersell one another, have recourse to new divisions of labour and new improvements of art, which might never otherwise have been thought of." Unquote. Well, uh, the remainder of the page or two uh, is devoted to that uh, last thing I mentioned, which is, say, the invisible hand in Smith appears as essentially a economic liberal through rhetorization. He's actually a bit more cautious than that. 
as some people have indicated, like the problems with division of labour for the degeneration of the workers' uh, human qualities and so on. But nevertheless, it's essentially an economic liberal vision that, uh, that Smith's unintended consequences captures. But you, you need to keep in mind that arguments about unintended consequences have a much larger domain in social science than, than that. In my 2020 essay, I connect the invisible hand idea to Smith's characterization of science as well. And I, I don't have time to go into this. But to summarize it, Smith has a conception of science as uncovering hidden chains of causation. This is the sort of language he uses in the, in the uh, essay on astronomy. Hidden change, chains of causation. And from that vantage point, Invisible hand or unintended consequences arguments appear as insights of social science, commonly not evident to the actual participating individuals whose behaviour generates the causal process. Then I turn to Marx, Keynes and Minsky, and, and then I'll, I'll finish on this note to give you an in, some instances of, of uh, wider unintended consequences. Marx famously conjectured a tendency towards capitalism self-destructing. If it were to occur, well and truly, a systemic consequence, to put it mildly. Importantly, this is a theory in which the outcome is a result of forces arising from within the logic of capitalism itself not due to exogenous shocks to the system. One may, in what is a typical retort, disparage Marx's conjecture as having proven to be spectacularly wrong. But I think the underlying core idea that liberal capitalism has forces within it that are endogenously destabilizing of it, that liberal capitalism carries within it the seeds of its own potential destruction is a proposition that remains of enduring relevance. Indeed, this seems to be widely accepted today and not only by those well to the left on the political spectrum. This is so even if the further supposition that this destabilisation either will or should lead to highly centralised socialist states is a much deader idea. Observing some global trends in politics over recent years, rather than socialism, the destabilization of liberal capitalism might lead to illiberal capitalism. Of the many sources Thomas Piketty quotes in his much celebrated 2014 book, my favorite is from Josiah Wedgwood, 1939, quote, Political democracies that do not democratise their economic systems are inherently unstable, unquote. In relation to Keynes, the most striking case of adverse unintended systemic consequences is the paradox of thrift. It can be illustrated with the following scenario. Suppose that the household sector of an economic system undergoes an across-the-board shift in preferences for saving versus current consumption, resulting in increasing rates of saving out of incomes across the board. In the jargon, an increase in the system propensity to save. The resulting decline in aggregate consumption expenditure at initial income levels leads to an amplified contraction in aggregate economic activity and thereby aggregate income via the multiplier. For any given level of aggregate investment, aggregate income will contract until the level of aggregate saving is restored to equality with the level of investment, planned saving and investment to be precise. Furthermore, if aggregate investment actually falls in response to the declining consumption expenditures, which is more than possible, the level of saving must fall as well. The rise in the propensity to save has led to either no change or a lower level of saving. 
Rates of saving have increased, but now out of lower income levels. The lack of an adequate co coordination mechanism in Keynes's view is what leads to his conviction that a social democratic policy regime was required to save capitalism from itself. Finally, there's Minsky's uh, financial instability hypothesis. It's a further distinct form of endogenous destabilisation, although it's considerably inspired by Keynes. Essentially, the argument is that financial stability encourages behaviour that then destabilises the system. Well, now that's it for me. Uh, you'll be relieved to know. Um, I want to emphasise, though, that the, the significance of these Marx, Keynes, Minsky is not uh, that you should believe them, although I look rather favourably on them myself, but just to show that there's a lot more going on about unintended consequences in social science than the economic liberal kind of Adam Smith invisible hand thing. That's, that was really the point I wanted to emphasise. Well, I was going to say, Tony, you can have the rest of the day off, but actually there's the panel as well afterwards, so no, you can't. We do have time for a few questions. I've got one from Doug here, but I'm going to go to the back first, and uh, we'll take one there. Lisa, do you have a microphone? No. Thank you for your presentation. I have a simple question. Could Where, you stand up? Sorry. I have a simple question. Where is God in your system? Because in a previous presentation, we saw a quotation from the theory of moral sentiments that all these beneficial consequences should not be ascribed to human wisdom, but to divine wisdom, the wisdom of God. So my question is, is the invisible hand, is that meant to be the hand of God? In, in, the, uh, in the 2020 um, Palgrave Dictionary entry that I wrote, there's another section at the end um, called Some Other Interpretations. And one of the three that I examine is the idea that uh, God is playing some important role in uh, Adam Smith's Invisible Hand story. <clears throat> it's a bit of a controversial subject but uh, in my view, God uh, plays no role in Adam Smith's social theory. I could say a lot more about this, but I won't. Other questions here? Thanks, If you step back from economic systems to look at complex adaptive systems in general. Um, the way I've always seen Smith and his use of the concept of his invisible hand is, as, a, as a rhetorical metaphor to try to struggling, again to me, struggling with what a complex system is, how it actually operates, how it, how it evolves. Um, so to, to me it's about emergent properties um, so the develop, economic development you referred to is a, an unintended consequence of, of people's propensity to truck and truck. Mm -hmm. um, so to me it's a very positive thing. I mean, your latter use of the terminology unintended consequences, to me at least, seems to tend towards perception that or view that may be negative. Um, they are just consequences. How we react to them uh, we may see that as positive and negative. Um, in terms of an innovation and entrepreneurial perspective, one should always try and look at those unintended consequences of lower level, uh, well, of emerging complexity, let's call it, um, as potential positives um, and ameliorate the negative impacts. But to me, he's, again, he's struggling to comprehend and describe processes which um, you know, humanity was only just starting to try and contemplate. I mean, more I mean, in this century, last century, of course, it's now under the, the guise of complex system theory. Um, and, and to me, economics is just another one of those complex systems. You would know more about these things than I do, uh, so I'm not inclined to 
to uh, joust on that. But uh, I, I do think that Smith thinks that he understands the invisible causal processes, I think. He's, it's not being used by him to say, hey, there's something going on we mightn't fully understand. He thinks he understands the, these things, and I think he does. Uh, so I'm not sure that your track is exact, exactly, I mean, what you would say is very interesting, and it sounds plausible to me, right? but I'm not sure Adam Smith is on track with you on this. But. Thanks very much. How would have been? Uh, thanks, Tony. Just a question on sort of the intellectual history of this idea. Sorry. Just turn off the Okay. Um, I, I, know, I always just assumed that the, you know, the power of this idea was always sort of in contrast to the command economy version of communism that we, we got. And certainly, you know, the United States when I, when I, this phrase pops up all the time, and people are just, I always have understood it as being, you know, this comparison to how disastrous a, a planned economy is like, am I wrong? Is that, is that not where the, 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 the power, the, um, did it have a, an intellectual legacy before communism? I think, uh, I think on this subject, there's a great deal of work which I'm not closely engaged with on the images of Adam Smith. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a second order scholarship. It's like, not what, what, what was Adam Smith about, but what did this generation think <laughs> was the significance of Adam Smith? So you see, I, I think this is not relativism or, or solipsism. I think every generation, um, for a big thinker, fundamental and wide thinker like Smith, every generation, if it wants to, if it has the curiosity, can bring its own questions to the man, right, or to the texts or to the corpus of writings. And so Adam Smith can look to be changing shape from generation to generation. So the invisible hand as decentralised um, um, market equilibrium spontaneously became a kind of motif of general equilibrium theory during the period of its... Uh, its, its dominance in the decades immediately after World War II. So you're gonna, I, I quote a couple of them in the entry. Uh, the first uh, chapter of every GE textbook is Invisible Hand, Adam Smith, you know. Um, you know we're, the, we're the inheritors of that, right? That's also post-communism. Yeah, uh, it's not really post-communism. Uh, mm. The 19th century political economy had little interest in the invisible hand. It was only at the very end of the 19th century when people started thinking about, well, how would a socialist economy work? Could it work? That there was a certain growth in interest. That would be my impression, I have to say. Oh, I, I couldn't agree well, with that. I understand your point, but that's, that's taking the particular... Uh, supply-demand coordinations and saying this is the thing. Well, I'm saying this is not the thing. This is just one little part of, the, of a, even for Smith, a, a larger thing. But I was going to add that I think Emma Rothschild's book uh, called Economic Sentiments, I think she traces the history of the invisible hand, the understanding of the invisible hand through generations. So she's actually done some of that second order kind of, you know, how, how have people read it for their own interests, right? Uh, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an imperfect book, like all books, but uh, it's a very good book as well. Uh, yeah, but I, I was going to say, uh, in relation to William, see, there's this common motif in Marx, appearance and reality. Yeah? There's the appearance of capitalism, and then there's the reality of capitalism hidden behind the surface. This, I'm sure, derives from Smith, the invisible hand, maybe via Hegel, yeah, because we know that the, the Smith-Marx connection all goes directly, but it also goes through Hegel. So, so there are resonances, I think, uh, that, that go deeper. Tony, if I may ask a question very briefly. Uh, in your first talk, you 
raised but then skipped over the question of how original Adam Smith was. And I know that there's a tendency to think, you know, we needed economics and God said, let there be Adam Smith sort of thing. Um, but apropos of the invisible hand in particular, is this an original Smithian notion? What about this stuff about the fable of the bees and all that kind of thing? Uh, well, is there an invisible hand in the fable of the bees? I'm trying to remember, that's why I'm asking you, you're the expert. I'm asking the questions here. <laughs> William knows more about this. The matter of private advice is public virtues. Smith is not saying private, not really saying private advice is public virtues. He's saying, um, in, the, in the interpretation which Tony is not disagreeing with, he's saying there's rationality in the system despite there being no system wide coordination. But look, there's a lot of stories about the, the invisible hand pre Smith. Uh, I don't know much about that, but, uh, but one is that the metaphor comes from the opera. There's some kind of op operatic construct that is about the invisible hand backstage or something. But this is just about the metaphor, not about the content of the idea. So. Okay. Anyway, we might have a quick... It's there for afternoon tea. We're on the, that we kind of... Take a couple more? Okay. We, we've got more questions? One more. Radio, let's fire it. Um, I'll confess I'm not certain how to ask this question, but on the point, on your point of a move to illiberal uh, democracy, if one takes a, a Gaullist view, that's to say that democracy is a means of legitimizing a leader or a party as opposed to where the leader of the party derive their power. Is it is somehow democracy a, a product of liberalism or, or so? Uh, I, As I say, I'm not sure. I think the elements of Smith's liberalism are logically separable from democracy in the sense of majority rule. So I think it can be considered separately from the question of democracy, if you mean it in that crude sense of majority rule. Um, it requires the rule of law and so on and due process and all that. <laughs> but it doesn't really require, I mean, you might say, well, can we really have all that stuff without some kind of democratic uh, lever? Well, maybe, maybe not, but I'm saying logically they're separable, right? <laughs> Logically, they're separable. So uh, this, biz this business about Gaulism, this is, uh, I'm just an economist. I, I can't help you with that. Any more questions? Yes, one down there. Hi, um, thanks for your talk. Um, just a question about the invisible hand and sort of these forces inside capitalism that might bring it to its to its end. You talked about the invisible hand always moving towards sort of the betterment of society, lower prices, etc. But with things like inflation and money printing and these kinds of things, is this kind of a, a chafing conflict between the forces of the invisible hand and sort of the forces of, say, government and, and these things which could bring an end. Is that the kind of internal force that you're talking about or is it different? Oh, no, 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 no. Look, to have a genuine uh, invisible hand argument for the self-destructiveness of capitalism, the behaviours generating the destructiveness have got to come from the capitalists. <laughs> If it's come from the government, when they say, well, there, you see, we told you. We told you not to trust them. Yeah, so it can't be a government action that, just, that is destructive of capitalism. That's not going to compromise economic liberalism. That's going to be a sort of vindication, yeah? I guess my question is that if, say, economic capitalists have access to more money, say, which drives up the price of goods, then it would be the capitalists who are sort of creating that chain in that um, they are incentivised to, to 
to use that extra capital, et cetera, et cetera, not just now, I mean, they would do that, but, but that, that whole force moving forward would move against the innovations that capitalism produces. So you would get innovation price decrease, but then it would come up against inflation pricing. Uh, uh, sorry, innovation price decrease coming up against inflation price increase. I think, I think you're looking for arguments that are not going to work very well. I think they're much more straightforward things to tell. You know, look, we don't have time for it, but hey, people get really rich, they decide they'll buy a political party. And they say, well, if I, if I own a political party, I can own the government. If I can own the government, why do I have to obey the law? And that destroys the system. Hmm? Hey, simple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, friends, let's reconvene, back to work. Sadly, it's the last session of the conference, um, but no doubt the ideas will reverberate and resonate for hours and days to come. So we'll finish up with a relatively informal panel session where there'll be an opportunity led by Rico to, for each of the, uh, the presenters to say a few last words, but also for questions back and forth as well. So let's, let's make it fairly open and relaxed in that way. So I'll hand it over. Okay, thank you. Can you me? Is this working? Not, okay. don't think it is. All right. Maybe Maybe I'll use this as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay, welcome to the panel discussion. No, no. no, no. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. <laughs> um, thanks everyone, and I'm honoured and delighted to be here to celebrate the 300th birthday of Adam Smith, who's been described, for, unfortunately not uh, my words here, but as the Adam and the Smith of economics, and that of course, he's widely regarded as the uh, creator of economics um, in, in terms of birthing the discipline, um, but also the Smith in terms of crafting it um, as a discipline. What we've observed today is a range of different uh, presentations and different topics, and what's emerged is a very complex view of Adam Smith as a very complex character. And we should be very mindful of, or one thing to be mindful of, I think, in representing all of these different perspectives that we have on Smith is, is to be mindful of what Quentin Skinner has referred to as the mythology of coherence, and that is to try to put together a a uh, coherent view of a past thinker when perhaps there may not, this may not necessarily exist. And, and if you think of your own thinking, uh, you may happen to hold different viewpoints on different matters and things may not always be entirely coherent. As we go through our thinking, uh, we change our mind on particular issues. So um, coming to some coherent or definitive view on Smith is, is perhaps uh, never going to be possible as new interpretations emerge about his thinking. And I think that's a good thing. Smith can be used in particular ways and also abused in particular ways. So we need to be mindful of this. Um, I was given the opportunity to say the last few words. That was This was sort of the teaser to get me up here on the panel, I suppose. Um, so let me just do that very briefly. Um, and the thing I would mention is just one particular interpretation of Smith that I've found really interesting and uh, has deeply guided my thinking um, on Smith. Um, and that is a work published by Nathan Rosenberg titled Some Institutional Aspects of the Wealth of Nations. And Rosenberg identifies, quote, a neglected theme running through virtually all of the wealth of nations is Smith's attempt to define, in very specific terms, the details of the institutional structure which will best harmonize the individual's pursuit of his selfish interests with the broader interests of society, unquote. I find this uh, to be very revealing as uh, an interpretive device for dealing with Smith, and it enables us to understand some of these policy prescriptions that he has or some of these um, aspects in which he's willing to jettison liberty, uh, natural liberty, uh, in the greater interests of society or some sort of potential consequence. Um, and we've seen some examples today already uh, with William talking about uh, some of uh, Smith's sort of pet hates, if you like, uh, the, uh, mon the legal monopoly, the um, joint stock company. Uh, one issue that wasn't mentioned today, surprisingly, was that of usury rates or uh, legal interest rate maxima, which Adam Smith 
advocated for and was uh, heavily criticized for by uh, Jeremy Bentham, a, uh, a great uh, classical liberal thinker. And, uh, but I think Smith's advocacy of usury laws uh, or illegal interest rate maxima can be reconciled when we think about um, what Smith is really concerned with here. He's concerned with, as the title of his book suggests, an inquiry into the nature and the causes of the wealth of nations. And he's particularly worried uh, about prodigals and projectors, people who are going to waste the capital of the country. And so this is um, an, an advocacy, or his advocation for um, a maximum interest rate is to ensure that uh, capital is not wasted. And, and remember these quite rudimentary times of Adam Smith in which we, um, there was mention to uh, things like infanticide, you know, there is real poverty um, in Adam Smith's time. Um, so anyway, hopefully that's useful for you as an interpretive device. Um, from there, I wish to uh, pass over to each of the speakers in turn to see if there are any last comments that they wish to have uh, before we engage in more of a question type format. Alan. Relevance, yes, indeed. So with particular focus to the relevance of Adam Smith for today, um, perhaps, Michael, is there anything you'd like to say? Thank you, Rico. Uh, I, I would just make the observation that we celebrate few economists in this way that Smith's been celebrated and that it's good and appropriate that we do because I think um, Smith reminds us of, of things that are important even today. Um, I, I think, you know, that despite the questions of how much is original, how much isn't, I think he's the most profound thinker in economics in the sense of the scope of what he was doing. Not necessarily the greatest theorist, as something Tony had alluded to, but a profound thinker. And for us today, what relevance do we get, or one of the relevance things we get from reading Adam Smith is uh, the scope of complex interrelated issues that just remind us that maybe when we get the answer of 42 or, you know, some deterministic answer from our economic models, that these have abstracted from so much that's important and to get a sense of what those types of things are, Adam Smith provides some useful insights. Thank you, Michael. William? Um, thank you, Rico. Um, well, why do we go to Smith? I mean, possibly the first thought is, well, we'll go to Smith for his theories, for his ideas. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad idea at all. And yet we have to face the fact that um, um, Smith is, in one sense, obsolete in almost every page he wrote. I think he didn't, he could not pass a first year economics exam, <laughs> even an intelligently set one. Um, we go to Smith, I think, really in order to meet not so much as theories, however stimulating they are, but in order to meet a mind, okay? Which is, um, a, it's a privilege to meet a mind like Adam Smith. Now, if I told you that John Stuart Mill was in the next room, you wouldn't say, I'll blow that away, I'm catching the early bus home. You would run in there to, to acquaint yourself with him. In the same way, we can acquaint it, we can't talk to Adam Smith, but we can meet him right, at an intellectual level. We can meet him as an author who is profound, um, as Michael rightly who observed, who is complex, as Rico rightly observed, who is indeed many-sided, indeed um, sometimes coming near to the outright contradictory, and who is finding a very broad thinker. He thought about so many things. And that I put to you, especially the students, but we're all students in one sense here, um, is the motive, is I, I think a, a great reason for going to read Adam Smith. Thank you, William. And Tony? The, the, uh, when I presented the, this, uh, the 10 o'clock one at Sydney University on the 16th of June, the first question I was asked was about this. What would Adam Smith say about today? You know? and, <coughs> and I began to answer it by mentioning something Roy Harrod had said. Roy Harrod, uh, for those of you who don't know, was a, 
He was actually Keynes's first biographer as well, but also a distinguished contributor to trade cycle and growth theory uh, after Keynes. And in the, in the early 70s, uh, as the crisis of post-war Keynesianism uh, was beginning to develop in the course of the 1970s, they had this conference and they got Roy along to say, you know, what would Keynes say about what's going on? And <laughs> Harrod gets up and, and he begins to talk. The first thing he says is, there's no point asking me what Keynes would have thought. God knows he would have thought of something much cleverer than I can think of. And uh, I think I'm a bit in that position as well, vis-a-vis what Adam Smith's relevance today might be. So I'm inclined, it's probably pretty obvious from my comments in the last session, that I think what is interesting about Smith is the depth and the expansiveness, you know, that, that, that sense of a man who, who, who addresses the human condition with a totality which uh, is lost on most of us today uh, because of the intellectual division of labour that we're all subject to, however much we might might rebel against it or try to rebel against it. I, and as I also tried to indicate, rather than specific issues, really on fundamentals, in the first talk I mentioned inequality and, and uh, natural resource constraints as two issues. And uh, in the last session also I uh, tried to indicate that um, Smith's approach to economics, I think, is very attractive. I think the fact that uh, he wouldn't feel at home with the standard economics course today is a great strength and virtue. He's a very lucky man <laughs> not to have to put up with that stuff. So I think that I think the classical approach uh, has much uh, of living relevance to, to how we should do economics. The great failure, I think, of Smith is that, in fact, the theory of growth, and it's a failure to grasp uh, the, the way that demand constraints can condition a growth path. On this, I think, uh, I think Keynes is to be preferred, both to the classical economists and to the marginalists, in fact. Thank you, Tony. I'm very mindful of uh, the number of students that we have in the room, uh, and particularly the bona fide uh, students, um, and that many of the panellists, I believe all of the panellists have in fact uh, taught the history of economic thought and, and no doubt have taught um, on Adam Smith as well. So I thought I might put to them um, what one key takeaway they might like um, for students to take, or if there's one thing that they might, th might like students to know about Adam Smith, uh, what might that be? It's an optional question. So. Michael, do you have any thoughts? I'm going to steal somebody else's thought if that's all right. I'm sure Adam Smith would not approve. But um, the thought comes from John Creedy, who wrote an article called 1776 and all that. Um, his, his joke is essentially that Adam Smith aspired to create an invisible man, but only got as far as creating the invisible hand. <laughs> um, and that all those who followed, who chose to ignore the invisible hand, because they couldn't see the hand signals, <laughs> did so with disastrous results. I suspect John Creedy's light-hearted comment there has some merit in it. Thank you, Michael, indeed. Uh, William? Um, I think what students um, should recognise is that in Smith there are themes and there are theorems uh, or analysis. The analysis and the, th and the theorems are what most interested the 19th century. And they're probably what most interests the professional historian of thought. But they're what least interests, I think, the broader public. What most interests the broader public, and I expect most of this audience, are his themes. And his great themes are the um, benefits of specialisation in labour, the rewards from competition, the power of incentive, the um, pervasiveness of the financial or monetary motive, and above all, the significance of the unintended consequence, and of course, the invisible hand. These are the great themes of Smith which I think uh, speak most to students rather than his actual anal analytical tools. Thanks, William and Tony. So, 
So I think that uh, what I would say to students is, is that uh, they need to approach Smith in a larger frame of reference. And first and foremost, so I think there are, there are, there's the big three. You know, uh, I, I get dragged to Africa occasionally by my wife who's crazy about safari. <coughs> And there they have the big four, you know, the big four animals that everyone wants to see. Well, the big three in economics, the, big, the three big animals are Smith, Marx and Keynes. And in a way it's fitting and not surprising because in a way it reflects the human uh, supermarket for political ideas. Because roughly speaking, these three political economists, uh, in respect of policy and, and the, the, the way economic systems as a whole are organised, reflect the three great alternatives that have been posited since the French Revolution or thereabouts. Liberalism, socialism and social democracy. <coughs> and so I think in, in a discipline, i.e. economics today, which is increasingly small-minded, increasingly narrowly empiricist, to have thinkers of, of intellectual ability, of intellectual ability, who think deeply about the way systems work as a whole is an extremely valuable thing to try to engage with. And it's not something for a three-year degree, it's something for a life of reflection. And, and I think uh, in, in the best possible way of what universities used to be. Uh, the difference between smart people and stupid people is that smart people know what they don't know and stupid people think they know. And so it should encourage a certain modesty too, a certain sense of the limits of our knowledge that uh, great men, great human beings can disagree about even most fundamental things. Thanks, Tony. I'm conscious of time. I have a whole list of questions here, but perhaps there's anyone from the floor who may wish to um, have questions that they have held back. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Richard Morgan. Now, one uh, point that comes back to um, provide um, a negative approach to Adam Smith is a thought that uh, it's based on self-interest, which is quickly associated with being selfish. <clears throat> However, self-interest to be successful for a producer has to correspond his product, product with the self-interest and self-reliance of the customer. So it's a neutral um, point in society as to whether self-interest plays any negative role. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone in particular want to respond to that? I think um, Smith spoke of the natural system of liberty. This was his big value, liberty, right? He never celebrated self-interest as such. It is true, he expressed in the Wealth of Nations, a scepticism about businesses who purport to trade in the public interest for the public benefit. He thought, look, these guys would be better if they just traded in their own interest, right? But his, his big value was freedom, not um, self-interest. I would just add that in you know, the theory of moral sentiments, selfishness is uh, associated with the virtue of prudence and that seems to be the, the theme of what's coming through in his work. And though he does note you don't celebrate it in the same way that you would celebrate um, something emphasising the social passions to assist somebody because you're not, you're not directly benefiting, he's not trying in any way to diminish its importance to the system. So a prudent... Prudent judgment reflects, I think, a fairly positive 
uh, understanding of human beings and their pursuit of self-interest. I, I, uh, I didn't want to say anything, but, you know, you just can't hold a drug addict back. <laughs> 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 I very much agree with the spirit of, um, of those comments of Michael's. I think this might be unfair to Christianity, but I think there's a, there's a tendency to have this dichotomy of selfishness and altruism, and I think it's a false dichotomy. And I think that, uh, that it's true that there's an intersection of self-regard and virtue in Adam Smith, and it's a more humanist, a more humanist, if you like, kind of uh, sensibility or outlook, and I think a lot of economists uh, also who are not who are, who are quite ignorant of these things that we're talking about also use this dichotomy without without any self reflection between altruism and self interest. And it's true that prudence is a point of intersection. So is self command. Uh, uh, self command is part of the economic virtues. And yeah, it's, even Smith talks about you, you see a person who doesn't look after himself or herself properly, and, and this, this is uh, a lack of virtue. You know? I mean, it's not like being an axe murderer, okay? It's not, it's not the end of the world, but it's regarded as a sort of lack of virtue to be so self deficient, so to speak. So, in my Adam Smith book, see, I always use the term self regard because I think, I think that softer term today better captures what he's talking about than selfishness has a very hard edge for us. Even self-interest has a certain ugliness which maybe comes from a Christian hangover, overhang or something. I don't know. Anyway, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. A question from Doug at the front. Thanks. Probably more a comment. I mean, in... Three years' time, it'll be 250 years since Wealth of Nations was published, correct? Yes, it will. Um, so we're talking about language and choice of words that's 250 years old. And, I mean, the famous quote of that's not from the benevolence of you know, the butcher, the baker, but it's from their self-interest. Um, today, and I think you just touched on it, Tony, I mean, what people understand by self-interest today is not necessarily what it meant or the way it was regarded in 1776. Um, if Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations today, it would be a lot smaller book. <laughs> it would be more concise language, less flowery language, and presumably, well, my take on that quote would be, it would be along the lines of explaining in terms of a mutually agreeable transaction where the self-interest of the, the supplier and the customer are are involved and met, or largely met. Um, so I, I just wonder how much of the, you know we're struggling with old language that no, we, we no longer understand those words the way Smith intended them. And that, that overly complicates the, the discussion today. You all want to respond to that? Well, I wouldn't be inclined to agree. I think Smith's language is, is not only one of the pleasures of, <laughs> of the book, uh, he's a very good writer. I mean, ba Balog, 19th century English critic, believed we owe this fact that he didn't grow up speaking English. He grew up speaking Scots, okay? So he learnt English as a sort of literary language, and that, that gives him the, the quality of his, his, his English language. And finally, I'd add, I, 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 I th what he's, he's saying about the butcher and the baker, which is a wonderful little piece of prose, um, is that self-interest is powerful. It's everywhere, right? It makes the world move around, okay? He said that then, and I think it's just as true now. <laughs> but it, I don't disagree with what you just said, but it clearly people misunderstand what... They, they interpret so frequently, it would seem, self-interest as selfishness. Not understanding that self-interest in the context of being a supplier, the gentleman at the back made the exact point, that um, a supplier to be sustainably successful in the marketplace has to be very concerned about the interest and desires and needs, demands and whatever of customers. So self-interest is not selfishness in, in, in the modern interpretation. So again, I, well, my, I mean, the writing's good, but our interpretation of it is, is lacking, often. 
I'll just quickly jump in here. I think the point William makes about the writing is why he's so accessible to us today. That is, he's such a fine writer. I can't think of anyone with a book of that age that I've read so easily. But that can mask the, damage, the, the issue of words that have changed in their meaning. So we can perhaps not pick up on them because it's put together, written so beautifully. So in general, I think there is an issue. We have to be careful with words. Thank you. And Alison has a question. I, I, I do, and I think it's just appreciating how much he was writing um, as a man of the, at the time, 300 years ago, and that um, women, I'm assuming, are quite invisible um, in, in all of this. Um, what do feminist economic scholars, or feminist scholars who don't necessarily need to be economists, have to say about Smith? Uh, Michael, do you have any thoughts on that? Sorry, I, I don't know. I can't recall. I saw you put something earlier on from Mark. I had something on what, sorry? That was Lisa. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, so I can't think of how to res respond to, the, to that. I could respond for Pareto, but not for, not for Smith, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just by the by, there, there was a, a brilliant paper on Pareto and, and, and the woman question, which, which uh, a friend of mine's written. Uh, the key point is he, he evolved from being pro John Stuart Mill on the subjugation of women in his liaising. He also participated in a survey on the role in women back in the 1870s, which were all very pro. Over the course of his life, that changed. And to his later in life, he was emphasising the classical distinction, but perhaps in a wrong way, of between productive and unproductive labour. And rich American women came in the unproductive category. Uh, <laughs> This is Pareto. This is Pareto, <laughs> it's not, yeah. So, so there is a, there are some, some issues, but in case of Adam Smith, it's an area that goes beyond my knowledge. Well, well, Pareto swung from being a classical liberal, I know Michael will consider this far too crude, yeah. to being a sort of fascist, right? I mean, let's, let's yeah. face it. Um, <laughs> people should understand that, right? As for Adam Smith, there was no women's question when he was writing, not explicitly or manifestly in the public debate, so I don't think you'll find him anywhere addressing it. You'll find plenty of references to women in the wealth of nations, um, but no, not to the woman question. I'll just grab a, I've just got i got to have a quick reply to that, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just be quick. Uh, look, Prado died in 1923, fashions and came to power in 1922. His problem was Mussolini was a student in his class, and he did not know Mussolini. But he was, when he died, he was called the Karl Marx of fascism by the, Mus by the fascists. Oh. And it's a label which is stuck, yeah. I think, grossly incorrectly. Okay, and a question from Chelsea, I think. No, not Chelsea, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> nice. Um, I think it was Tony that mentioned, like, slavery. I might be wrong. Um, and you mentioned that he didn't believe in suffrage for all. Coming back to the question of like feminist like economics, do you reckon that that also applies to women in terms of voting? Could you just repeat the last? Do you believe that he would be like pro women voting in terms of like the suffrage? Okay, um, so slavery was not mentioned by me. It was mentioned by Lisa Hill. Um, there we go. Look, uh, uh, but she also discussed the question of democracy. So the idea of universal male suffrage, I think, would have been alien to, to Adam Smith. So I think you can forget about women voting, <laughs> <laughs> unless they had lots of money. Maybe that, that, they could possibly get in that way. So there would, be, there would be some women who could own parliamentary seats, possibly, in the 18th century. Anyway, but it would be very, very marginal. Um, uh, look, so that's that. Um, I must say on this whole question of gender, there's, there's, there's two things that now come up that would never have come up 30 or 40 years ago, I think. That's the question of race and gender in, in these authors like Adam Smith. Uh, 
And I think, you know, uh, old farts like me, uh, it's, uh, the, the women question was never taken seriously until there were more women actually here doing this stuff. And then, and then, it, became, then it started to, to be taken seriously. But I'm not familiar with that literature, so I couldn't help on that question, which is why I didn't try to uh, contribute. Um, but, but I think on the, on the other one, the race, I think, yeah, there's quite a lot going on on that front too. And... Lisa's reference, Lisa Hill's reference to slavery is an allusion to it, yeah. But, but there's more to it than just slavery. She wasn't completely correct in, <laughs> when she said that Smith never referred to abolition. On the contrary, he, he notes that in Pennsylvania, um, by recent resolution, slavery had been abolished. But he makes the rather dry comment that that fact may convince us that there weren't many slaves in Pennsylvania, okay? <laughs> that's yeah. Adam Smith. Yeah, that's perfect Adam Smith. Just very Adam Smith. dry-eyed, okay? Cynical. Yeah. Cynical. Well, dry-eyed about, about uh, such, such, such things. Uh, I'll abuse the chair with a few more questions. Um, Michael, I found your discussion of what I might call intention versus consequence to be quite interesting. I do hazard to quote here John Maynard Keynes and his view that it's better to do good than to be good. Uh, I just wonder if, uh, how that relates to Smith's views and also Pareto's views. Okay, uh, just start with Smith. There's a letter from uh, de Ponte Numenos to, to Smith saying that in the French it's better to do good than to say good and the argument there is that actually Mr Smith you needed to be a bit more uh, acknowledging of our French thinking it's just that our way of saying things is that specialist interests at the time are such that if we say it as you say it which is as we see it we'll put back reform for a long period of time so this this idea predates Keynes and goes back at least to um, you know, the physiocrats and also into their relationship to, to Smith. Um, the, the point I was trying to draw out really is, is the importance, I think, of this distinction that um, Smith makes with his discussion of irregular sentiments where you just, as a part of being human, not, you know, not as part of anything else other than being human, there are things that we can't really know we can do our best and the consequences may not be as we anticipate and an attempt to try and deal with that. And I think uh, in Pareto I raise it, for him that's the dominant characteristic of public policy. You introduce a public policy for just distribution of income. The argument is you'll change it, then people will change their mind because there's not a good understanding of a concept, a big concept like that, and concrete physical action, and there's an interaction. You change the concrete world and you'll change it. Now, that's just saying that there's a complex system, to, to use Doug's language, that the actual framework within which decision-making is made is much more complex than we assume in pure economic theory. And it's a reason why I'm so attracted to Pareto is that he hasn't thrown economic theory out with the bathwater. He wanted to develop it. And then wanted to say, yeah, but we've got to be careful. This is a, has a limited meaning, has constraints, and when you take into account the full nature of these concepts, you can't stay with an economic thinking. And I think with Adam Smith, I have the same sort of impression that you have this person who has these aspirations to really try and understand so much that it's difficult to understand within one context. And when you expand it, you soon come across these questions of people changing their mind and he gives a discussion of it. Um, so, you know, that is something, you know, if that was a lesson of today, I think we need to be conscious that our capacity to understand the implications of what we expect are not always achieved. Thanks, Michael. Um, Tony, I have a question for you. I found your discussion of uh, the sort of the seeds of capital, capitalism potentially creating its own destruction to be an interesting point that comes around with these unintended consequences and, of course, the invisible hand. Um, and, of course, we're celebrating 300 years since the birth of Adam Smith, 200, almost 250 years since the publication of The Wealth of Nations, and Smith had this long-run view, which you alluded to, in which we ultimately economic growth peters out and we reach this steady state, and perhaps it happens, 
I, I forget if he actually provide. He doesn't provide an exact date, but we, the the indication we get is it's about two hundred years or so uh, into the future. At least that's my understanding of it. Um, so we're you know we're two hundred fifty years into the future, and economic growth I guess is potentially a, a lagging problem, um, problems with productivity, etc. Um, I found it interesting you didn't mention Schumpeter though in, in your list of names. You had Marx, you had uh, Keynes, and you had Minsky. Um, Schumpeter seems to be someone who's more associated with uh, the classical liberal view, and indeed he, he builds upon Marx's views and says, you know, unfortunately capitalism is going to create its own demise, not for the reason that Marx indicates, um, but because of the rise of corporatism and managerialism. And of course, uh, Schumpeter has this famous line where he says, um, just because the, the doctor diagnoses the patient is going to die does not mean that he uh, is glad about it. Um, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about Schumpeter with regard to your comments. Not really, no, because uh, I'm not really much of a student of Schumpeter. The, the only aspect of Schumpeter I've really had any interest in is, is the concept of entrepreneurship. So I've been pr pretty narrowly focused on that and the only serious reading of Schumpeter that, that I've ever done. But, but your comments are certainly germane. I mean, you're quite right to raise that uh, case. That's, that's a very important example, I think, that you, that you raise. Can I just add one thing about that environmental crisis and, and Smith's stationary state? You see, in a way, the classical economists, in making good quality land the paradigmatic example of a scarce natural resource gave themselves too easy a task because good quality land is a natural resource that can be scarce depending upon the social demand for the output of that land, but it's also renewable. So a stationary state with zero growth can be conceived of as, as the end state but if you go to strictly non-renewable resources, like the sink capacity of the environment, or non-renewable minerals, then the end state is not zero growth, it's zero. <laughs> More serious. Uh, yep, a question from John. <laughs> Going back to almost the first comment you made on the panel, it seems to, this is not a German Adam Smith problem, but there is a paradox, it seems to me, and I think Tony might have mentioned it in his first um, address this morning, you know, that the author of the division of labour wanted to understand everything. And we, I think the comment you said at the beginning of the panel was we should remember him for that big vision, breadth, depth, um, and you know, isn't it a pity, you know, economics today is also specialised. Isn't it a pity social sciences is also specialised? Um, and so we'll become experts in one little thing. Yeah. PhDs are also specialised. So this is a massive paradox, irony, whatever you call it. Um, what's the, is, was Smith wrong? Um, <laughs> what's the lesson plan? We can't all be Smiths or Marxes or Schumpeters. Um, so, you know, science has progressed through specialisation, even maybe, but maybe has social science progressed through specialisation or is that the wrong track? Maybe in science it works and not in, um, in social sciences. So what's your comment on the, this, I mean, if Smith is the, is the founder of the idea of the vision of labour and showed how much, how productive it could be for society as a whole, is it, should we logically take that to its conclusion and say that's why we've gone down this route and that's a good thing and the cost of it is something, okay, we can't get too many Smiths and Marxes and Schumpeters, but that's just the way it goes. That's a very good question. Uh, Michael, would you like to respond I, I, first? I'd like to have it. It's a good question. I, I, I personally am of the view that uh, specialisation in science has advanced science and that uh, it's a, a good thing. But what is bad is if we specialise in economics and we don't appreciate the context with which it occurs. So for me, the big thing about Smith is it reminds us that there is a big system out there. There is a big concept in depth and breadth, and our specialisation has allowed us to get very fine, detailed answers of a subset of it based on subsets of assumptions with a lot of empirical support. But it is partial. It's a partial explanation. So reading Smith 
tells a modern uh, good empirical and theoretical economist exactly the scope they're dealing with. And if you forget to read Smith, there's a great danger that you don't really realise that your results are quite limited and, and context-driven. So that's for me, uh, for Smith's good, but I certainly wouldn't argue that specialisation, which I think is a natural process by which knowledge develops, disciplines emerge um, in, in a sort of evolutionary process through which different degrees of specialisation occur. I, I think that's a good thing. Anyone else want to respond? Well, I think Sir Karl Popper was once described as not the philosopher's philosopher, and that's very true, and that was his strength. In the same way, Adam Smith is not the economist's economist, and that is his strength, or a strength. Oh, look, there are many dimensions to this, but, but obviously his, his, his specialisation principle is correct. <laughs> I mean, science progresses by breaking the world up into pieces. That's how, that's how it progresses. But there's a price to be paid. There's a price to be paid for it, yeah? Uh, I, I think that in the case of economics, that there's, a, there's a political dimension to it as well. I think this, this small-scale and empirical orientation now is also uh, creates a deeply conservative bent in, in, in economic students and, in, and in, therefore in economics graduates. Yeah? Because the state of the world as a whole is taken as a given, it's just there, you know, it's like the forest. So I think it creates a, 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 a tendency within the discipline that is narrowing and unfortunate, but nature abhors a vacuum. We need to understand how systems work and their dynamics, and if economics cannot provide it, someone else will. Okay, I think we're really pretty much out of time, but I just one final question to each of the, for each of the panelists to answer uh, as by way of summing up it is, will, will we still be talking about Smith 300 years from now? Let me check my crystal ball, Rico. Um, I, I think um, economic thinking is so important that we'll always look to our um, our first great synthesizer, I guess, of in the English-speaking world, at least, of a uh, body of economic thought. So I would like to think so. In my lifetime, I've seen a progressive increase, you know, with various anniversaries, interest in Smith. Um, currently, you know, we've had Nobel Prize winners and others in Glasgow to, to go through. That says the profession at least has some interest in, in him. And I... I you know, my expectation is that will continue, but uh, subject to economics continuing to be a vibrant area of study. I might chalk up yeses and noes. That's one. William? Smith has survived the test of time. That is the significance of three centuries. Mm. Just as Shakespeare has survived the test of time, we can be confident that, like Shakespeare, he will be um, read in three centuries. Great. And Tony? Yeah, well, I think it, it's... I mean, what makes, what makes a, a writer of enduring significance is that he or she can, can go to levels of, human, of the human condition that are enduring. You know, we, we read Aristotle, we think we can understand what he's saying. You know, I'm sure we're missing some stuff, but, but it's intelligible to us because the human condition he speaks to is one that we still share. And I think... I can't see any reason why that wouldn't be true of Adam Smith in, you know, one or two or three centuries. But, you know, who knows for sure. All right, we'll check in in 300 years' time. All right, thank you, everyone, and thanks especially to the speakers. <laughs>
And just before we finish, we have two more things to do. Can we please ask and thank on the way up Ron Manners AO, who would like to say a few words. Ron's the chair of the Mancal Economic Education Foundation. So Ron, who snuck in right at the beginning this, this morning, uh, I didn't think he was here, but here he was, and he's now going to say a few words of thanks. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, I have got a couple of things to say. One is the, uh, the t today's event is part of an international series of Adam Smith 300th birthday parties, uh, initially organised by the University of Glasgow, who of course claim uh, all the uh, responsibility for the early education of Adam Smith. So we're, uh, we're uh, delighted to be part of that. And um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the high standard of our wonderful speakers today and the, uh, the wonderful uh, videography uh, and the photography by uh, Mancow's Jake McCool and his team over there will guarantee that we'll get great exposure internationally on the University of Glasgow's uh, website uh, on their email list as they circulate it to the rest of the world. And it will bring a little bit of attention to Perth, the Perth Australia version, not the, not the Perth Scotland version. So, so uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, and it's, my, it's my delight to uh, say how much we've enjoyed working with, uh, with John and Alan and this great team at Curtin University. It's been our pleasure. And I'm, I'm, I'm only just one of the Mancal team here today because we've got, uh, we've got Nicola Wright, our CEO, and uh, we've got uh, Ambassador uh, 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 Doug, uh, <laughs> who, who's, uh, who's done all the liaison work between Mancal and, uh, and Curtin, and that's the reason it's, all the attention has been handled so precisely on this. So uh, that's what I want to say. And, um, and uh, we look forward to the next opportunity. We want to bring another one like this next year, perhaps a Hayek uh, event or a, a Frederick Bastiat event or something, because we, we've only done one like this before. It was the 100th anniversary of Milton Friedman. We did it with, uh, with UWA some years ago, and Milton wasn't there, of course, but one of his students in, uh, in, in Perth was Ken Clements, who was a student under Milton Friedman at the uh, university in Chicago. So it was, a, it was, again, a great event. So I think we, we like these focused events to, to uh, just to remind us how much we, we rely on the people from the past to put all this initial stuff, these building blocks on which we can stand and look forward to the future. Now, while well, I've well, well, got this opportunity, I'll mention also our Mancal Scholarship Program. There should be one of these on everyone's seat. Now, if, you, if you're either a student and you haven't signed up for a Mancal program, please do so now. And if, you, if you're too old to be a student, I'll bet you know a young person. Give them this brochure and tell them to contact our office now and get on the list for next year's opportunities when we can send these wonderful scholars all around the world to these great opportunities. And uh, if you want to know what our Mancal scholar looks like, just meet some of them here today and you'll say, gosh, we would like to give the next generation the same opportunities and so they will end up just like these wonderful young people we have here today. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then in conclusion, let me, let me do, use this opportunity to do a soft launch for our for Mancal's education paper. No, I didn't write it. Uh, we had two of Perth's leading academics write this paper, which is titled The Education Crisis in Australia. Downloadable for free at our mancal.org website. A wonderful document, contains a lot of comment, there's a lot of concern about the education system and a lot of room for improvement and it's happening all around the world. And really, the, the, this movement to increase, improve our education thing really, strangely enough, came out of California when parents for the first time during COVID were able to see what was being served up to young people through the universities. And that started a movement where, where parents for, 
at last are showing some interest in their young people's education. And it's great to bring the parents into this equation. Now, this, this paper covers it. There's a couple of uh, rare printed copies here that anyone might like to do. So, so that's a thank you for having me up here to join with these great folk. And it's been a wonderful experience. So thank you very much. So now I'd just like to say a few words of thanks to conclude. Um, events like this just don't happen. I mean, there's, um, there's a visible hand as well as an invisible hand making these things work. So firstly, I'd just, of course, like to reiterate thanks again to our speakers, Tony Aspromorgus, uh, William Coleman, Lisa Hill, of course, who, who beamed in from Adelaide, and Michael McClure, and also, of course, thanks to Rico Stevens for facilitating the session this afternoon, and also for agreeing to pause the course he's running at Notre Dame in Fremantle so that he and some of his students could attend today. So thank you guys for agreeing to do that. Thanks, of course, to our facilitator and MC Alan Fenner, uh, who did an excellent job. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Once again, thanks to, a special thanks to the Mancal Economic Education Foundation and Ron Manners AO, its chairman for generous financial support and other support for today's event. And as I said, things don't just happen, um, they, there's behind the scenes going on. There's a bit of a division of labour of all the um, of all the all the um, work that went into today. So at Mancal, we thanks to Doug Hall for his help and advice and liaison, and to Nicola Wright and her Mancal team for especially for advertising the event to the Mancal mailing list. Uh, the WA branch of the Economic Society of Australia. Thank you also to, for helping to advertise the event. Um, uh, we also thank Jasmine Newen and Jessica Villan from Curtin 137 St George's Terrace for their assistance with this great venue. Uh, also of course, to Jake McCool, our videographer, and Darren Saldana, our IT person, for all your technical assistance. But of course, most importantly, a huge thanks to our invisible hand, who actually is visible, she's right there, uh, Lisa Duplock from the JCIPP, who's done so much to work <laughs> and make today happen and ensure it ran so smoothly. So thanks again to Lisa. Um, finally, thanks to all of you for attending and participating in what's been a really stimulating and, and pleasant day, and I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Uh, good afternoon. We will be um, sending to you various materials. Also, the, the um, video will be going up on the our website at some stage, but some of the materials, including PowerPoints of those people who prepared to give us our, their PowerPoints, and I think there's a couple of papers that people have talked about as well. We'll send you a whole package of things uh, in the email in a little while. So you, you, you haven't seen The Last of Us, um, and also you're now on various mailing lists, so you'll get all sorts of events being, um, being advertised to you as well. So hopefully we'll see you at a future event, and uh, have a good afternoon, and thanks for coming. Thank you.